I don't get to drive the latest Lamborghini. I have a Toyota. I was able to figure out some of these things 30 years ago. But the methods of preventing people from finding out have also improved, and it's harder than ever to know exactly what's going on. That's why you need a broad historical view. If you focus just on what's happening now, you're shocked every day by what you see. We need to develop a collective historical consciousness to understand the predicament and to be able to do something about it, to stop being manipulated by the press on a daily basis. The media have us trained like sex-texting teenagers to focus on things that have nothing to do with how our perceptions of events are being controlled. It is important for people to take a broader view and to try to put these things in perspective, not only to understand what is happening now, but to see where things are going in the future and to plot a way to deal with it. Jimenez, I couldn't agree more with what you just said, Doug. I follow these stories as they're breaking, like the news of the IRS targeting certain political groups and AP reporters, or the Edward Snowden NSA scandal, and I find myself falling into this trap. I have to check myself and say, slow down here. Let's process this stuff again with a broader, more historical view, because these are not mistakes. The interventionism overseas, the bungles in Iraq and Afghanistan, this is by design. And if you understand the historical context, you can better understand what is happening. Valentine. The media needs its crise du jour. The news can't last more than 24 hours without being refreshed. You need a new headline to get people's attention so you can sell them something. Of course, partisan political politics is poison and does nothing to help. The endless bickering creates the political gridlock within the government, we see. Meanwhile, the bureaucracies grow more powerful. When I first started studying the DEA, I looked at its predecessor organization, the Bureau of Narcotics, which was created in 1930. It had a $3 million budget and 300 agents up until 1968. Now there are 600 agents in New York City alone, and the industry is so profitable that Congress gives the DEA around $20 billion annually. It has something called the Special Operations Division, which was featured by Reuters a couple of days ago. The DEA's Special Operations Division was created in 1994 to go after Pablo Escobar. It was a unit of about 12 people from the CIA, FBI, and NSA, organized on the Phoenix model. It used the latest surveillance technology to find Escobar. Over the last 20 years, the SOD has become a giant Phoenix-type center in the DEA with hundreds of agents. Through the NSA, they listen in on everyone's conversations on the pretext that someone might have something to do with drug trafficking. This information is used for political and economic purposes by the bureaucrats who have run these operations for 10 years. After they get out of the NSA or DEA or CIA, the bosses go to work for corporations that benefit from the knowledge they've acquired through these secret surveillance operations, because despite what they say publicly, they are not throwing away the extraneous information. They're using it for their personal benefit. It really pays nowadays to get involved in the domestic spy business as a DEA or a CIA agent, because you're set for life. It's another way the CIA has corrupted our society. Jimenez. Absolutely. Regarding the correlation between the DEA, CIA, and NSA, a story broke this week that the NSA is indeed feeding the DEA information that they're collecting through these wiretapping programs to go after a small drug smuggler. That sort of information to someone like you, Doug, who has been following the history of this, probably comes as no surprise at all. Valentine. In my book, I tell how the NSA and DEA were doing that in 1970. It's nothing new. What's so dangerous is that the intelligence that the DEA gets from the CIA and the NSA is inadmissible in court. The CIA can promote a drug trafficker and use him as an agent simply by wiretapping him. If the CIA wiretaps a drug trafficker, the DEA can't take him into court, and the guy has a license to deal. At first, the DEA was upset, but after ten years, the executives saw the writing on the wall and joined in the fun and games. The CIA corrupted the DEA the same way it corrupts foreign governments. The CIA is corrupting the NSA and the military in the same fashion.
It corrupts our bureaucracies the same way it corrupts foreign governments. They say it's for national security, but really it's for the money. It's gotten to the point where the Justice Department allows the DEA to lie. They can't say they acquired the evidence from a CIA wiretap, which they did, so they say they acquired it from a confidential informant whose name they say they can't reveal. They present that fiction as evidence in court. The judges, who've also been corrupted, won't ask where it came from, and the defendant goes to jail for 20 years. The moral to the story is that you don't have to commit a crime anymore to go to prison. The law enforcement agencies can frame you and send you to prison for thinking bad thoughts. The powers that be coordinate all the bureaucracies on the Phoenix model, and they've all been corrupted because it's the most effective way to ensure political control. If the bureaucrats subvert the Bill of Rights, they can own two houses and afford a trophy wife, send their kids to the best colleges. All our democratic institutions are so corrupt, are involved in so many illegal activities, that their main focus now is how to keep it quiet. Jimenez, earlier you called the CIA a criminal conspiracy, and I think that's true. As you just mentioned, this is how the social order is kept through engineered instability, even within our own country. So much of what was once criminal has become standard operating procedure. Just to emphasize your points about information gathering and intelligence, Russell Tice, an NSA whistleblower, did an interview with Peter B. Collins and Sybil Edmonds of Boiling Frog's Post a few weeks back, in which he said all content in all our conversations, telephone, electronic or otherwise, is indeed being collected and stored. Not only that, but they're targeting everyone in the country, including politicians, congressmen, even Barack Obama himself, from the time he was a senator. So to emphasize your point again, this is about corrupting and or compromising the leaders of a country to keep them under control. We can look at the FBI program, COINTELPRO, and how it targeted political groups like the Black Panthers. When they were thoroughly destabilized and discredited and splintered, Members of the Black Panthers went on to form the Bloods, the Crips in South Central and elsewhere around the country. All of this is connected and explains how we ended up in the mess we're in. Earlier I laughed when we were talking about this, but that's just a defense mechanism to keep from screaming at this insanity. Valentine Another defense mechanism is to read the right books, like Sam Greenlee's book, The Spook Who Sat by the Door. Forty years ago, black people were aware of everything that is happening now. Nothing has changed for them, except the bureaucracies that repress them are more powerful. As I've mentioned elsewhere, from the time the Bureau of Narcotics was created in 1930 until 1968, black agents were not allowed to become managers and supervise whites. Drug law enforcement has always been run by supremacists for the purpose of incarcerating blacks and Mexicans and anyone considered inferior. Nothing has changed. The presence of a black president hasn't changed these bureaucracies. They still exist with that purpose in mind, and despite appearances, that's still the policy. Jimenez, I understand. In closing, I'd like to read from the final chapter of the Phoenix program. It's the perfect way to end this conversation. I'd like folks to listen and consider what is happening not just in other parts of the world today, but within our own borders as well. You finish the book with this paragraph. Where can Phoenix be found today? Wherever governments of the left or the right use military and security forces to enforce their ideologies under the aegis of anti-terrorism. Look for Phoenix wherever police checkpoints ring major cities, wherever paramilitary police units patrol in armored cars. This sounds like Boston just a few months ago and wherever military forces are conducting counterinsurgency operations. Look for Phoenix wherever emergency decrees are used to suspend due process, wherever dissidents are interned indefinitely, and wherever dissidents are rounded up and deported. Look for Phoenix wherever security forces use informants to identify dissidents, wherever security forces keep files and computerized blacklists on dissidents, wherever security forces conduct secret investigations and surveillance on dissidents, and wherever security forces, or thugs in their hire, harass and murder dissidents, 
and wherever such activities go unreported by the press. So again, just take that in and consider what is happening not just around the world, but within this country, in this supposed land of the free and home of the brave. So, Doug, your final thoughts on this before we wrap this up. Valentine. I'd say it's all about consciousness. It sounds like a fake term from the 60s, but if you become aware of the problem, you'll see the way out. Chapter 14 Project Gunrunner Ken McCarthy Welcome to Brass Check TV. Our guest today is Doug Valentine. The story we're going to talk about is Project Gunrunner and Operation Fast and Furious. Gunrunner started under the Bush administration and continued under Obama, and here's the story. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms allowed and encouraged people with criminal backgrounds and known connections to Mexican cartels to buy guns from shops in Arizona and send them to Mexico. More than 1,000 military-grade weapons were involved. Not only did the ATF allow it, the gun store owners in Arizona were concerned. They'd tell the ATF, this guy keeps coming by and buying 20 or 30 AK-47s. Can you look into him? He seems to have a criminal background. And the ATF would get back and say, let him buy them. Some of the guns ended up in Mexico. Some were involved in crimes. In one case, a U.S. border agent was killed by one of these guns. That's the official story. Now it's come out that about a dozen drug cartels in Mexico were operating independently of one another for years. They were prosperous and stayed out of each other's hair. Everybody was happy. Then in 2006, a war broke out and they started killing each other and a lot of Mexican civilians as well. About 50,000 people have been killed, often in a very gruesome manner. One of the cartels, Los Zetas, has an interesting pedigree. It is made up of people who were trained by the U.S. Special Forces. They were trained to kill drug cartel leaders and then decided they'd rather run their own cartel. A member of the Sinaloa cartel, Vicente Zambada Niebla, is currently in prison in the U.S. on charges of trafficking more than a billion dollars in cocaine and heroin. Zambada's attorney is saying that since the late 1990s, the Sinaloa cartel has provided various U.S. law enforcement agencies with information about the other cartels. They help the U.S. eliminate their rivals, and in exchange they're allowed to import limitless quantities of drugs into the U.S., Chicago is one of their main drop-off points. So, Doug, has there ever been a case when the U.S. government, through its various law enforcement agencies, gave a pass to drug dealers in exchange for something else? How often does it happen, and how far back does this go? Valentine. An old FBN agent, Lenny Schreier, once told me, the only way you can make cases is if your informant sells dope. So, yes, not only has it happened... And not only does it still happen, but giving dealers a free pass to deal drugs is the foundation stone upon which federal drug law enforcement is based. Once you realize that, you have to look beyond at the political and economic context that makes such an extra-legal practice possible. Allow me to explain. In the 1920s, the U.S. threw its weight behind Chiang Kai-shek, whose Kuomintang Party was fighting the communists and several other warlords for control of China. The U.S. was competing with the other colonial nations for control of China, which had a cheap labor force and represented billions in profits for U.S. corporations and investors. The problem was the Kuomintang supported itself through the opium trade. It's well documented in the diplomatic cables between the U.S. government and its representatives in China. Historians Kinder and Walker said the commissioner of the Bureau of Narcotics, Harry Anslinger, clearly knew about the ties between Chang and opium dealers. Anslinger knew that Shanghai was the prime producer and exporter to the illicit world drug markets through a syndicate controlled by Du Yue Sheng, a crime lord who facilitated Chang's bloody ascent to power in 1927. As early as 1932, Anslinger knew that Chang's finance minister was Du's protector, He'd had evidence since 1929 that American Tongs were receiving Kuomintang narcotics and distributing it to the mafia. Middlemen worked with opium merchants, gangsters like Du, Japanese occupation forces in Manchuria, and Dr. Lansing Ling, who supplied narcotics to Chinese officials traveling abroad. 
In 1938, Chiang Kai-shek appointed Dr. Ling head of his narcotic control department. In October 1934, the Treasury Attaché in Shanghai submitted reports implicating Chiang Kai-shek in the heroin trade to North America. In 1935, the attaché reported that the superintendent of maritime customs in Shanghai was acting as agent for Chiang Kai-shek in arranging for the preparation and shipment of the stuff to the United States. These reports reached Anslinger's desk, so he knew which KMT officials and trade missions were delivering dope to American tongs and which American mafia drug rings were buying it. He knew the tongs were kicking back a percentage of the profits to finance Chiang's regime. After Japanese forces seized Shanghai in August 1937, Anslinger was even less willing to deal honestly with the situation. By then, Du was sitting on Shanghai's municipal board with William J. Keswick, a director of the Jardine Matheson Shipping Company. Through Keswick, Du found sanctuary in Hong Kong, where he was welcomed by a cabal of free-trading British colonialists whose shipping and banking companies earned huge revenues by allowing Du to push his drugs on the hapless Chinese. The revenues were truly immense, according to Colonel Joseph Stilwell, the U.S. military attaché in China. In 1935, there were 8 million Chinese heroin and morphine addicts and another 72 million Chinese opium addicts. Anslinger tried to minimize the problem by lying and saying that Americans were not affected. But the final decisions were made by his bosses in Washington, and from their national security perspective, the profits enabled the Kuomintang to purchase $31 million worth of fighter planes from arms dealer William Pauley to fight the communists, and that trumped any moral dilemmas about trading with the Japanese or getting Americans addicted. It's all documented. Check the sources I cite in my books. Plus, U.S. congressmen and senators in the China lobby were profiting from the guns-for-drugs business, too. They got kickbacks in the form of campaign funds, and in exchange, they looked away as long as Anslinger told them the dope stayed overseas. After 1949, the China lobby manipulated public hearings, and Anslinger cooked the books to make sure that the People's Republic was blamed for all narcotics coming out of the Far East. Everyone made money, and after 1947, the operation was run out of Taiwan with CIA assistance. The U.S. government's involvement in the illicit drug business was institutionalized during World War II. While serving on General Joseph Stilwell's staff in 1944, Foreign Service Officer John Service reported from Kunming, the city where the Flying Tigers and OSS were headquartered, that the nationalists were totally dependent on opium and incapable of solving China's problems. Service's reports contributed to the Truman administration's decision not to come to Chiang Kai-shek's rescue at the end of the war. In retaliation, Chiang's intelligence chief, General Tai Li, had his agents in America accuse Service of leaking the Kuomintang's battle plans to a leftist newsletter. Service was arrested. After Service was cleared of any wrongdoing, the China lobby persisted in attacking his character for the next six years. He was subjected to eight loyalty hearings and dismissed from the State Department in 1951. Service's persecution was fair warning that anyone linking the nationalist Chinese to drug smuggling would at a minimum be branded a communist sympathizer and his reputation ruined. That is how the U.S. drug operation is still protected today, although security for the operation has improved and whistleblowers are smeared in other ways. After World War II, the business of managing the government's involvement in the illicit narcotics trade was given to the CIA because it could covertly conduct support operations for, among others, the nationalist Chinese in Taiwan. The CIA also relocated and supplied one of Chiang's armies in Burma. This KMT army supported itself through the opium trade and the CIA flew the opium to places where it was converted to heroin and sold to the mafia. The other bureaucracies, the military and the departments of state, justice, and treasury, provided protection, along with the China lobby congressmen and senators who controlled the little information that was made public. Mexico fits into this equation. The history of U.S. relations with Mexico is the determinant factor in why the drugs-for-guns business is booming in Mexico right now. 
It has a lot to do with the United States treating Mexico not as the kind of ally nationalist China was against the communists, but as an ongoing threat that needs to be perpetually destabilized. The U.S. has been destabilizing Mexico since Mexico made slavery illegal. American slaves were escaping into Mexico, and the southern states saw this as an act of war. Militias from the southern states would launch raids into Mexico to get their slaves back, and Mexico would give the slaves sanctuary. There is a big dose of traditional U.S. racism involved. Mexicans are considered inferior. They are said to be uneducated, and all immigrants are criminals and poor. So that's a big element, too. The animosity grew in World War I when Mexico entered into relations with Germany. Check out the famous Zimmermann telegram. Since then, the U.S. has been wary that Mexico, with its impoverished population, harbors communist sympathies. It does everything it can to prop up the elite and help it brutalize the lower classes and keep them down so they can't organize themselves politically and economically. With help from the government, U.S. corporations bribe the elite who run the civic and political institutions so that Mexico can never support progressive nations in Latin America. The 1968 Tlatelolco massacre in Mexico City is an example of the CIA's efforts to stifle political reform in Mexico. CIA heretic Phil Agee witnessed the event and wrote about it. It was Mexico's version of Tiananmen Square, but the 300 demonstrators who were gunned down were said to be communists, so the bloodbath was, in the American press, said to be justifiable. As Ronald Reagan was fond of saying, Mexico is our backyard. People were made to fear that Mexican labor leaders, farmers and sociologists, were about to invade and conquer us, so we had to slaughter them in self-defense. That's the context you have to see these things in. It's communism versus capitalism, white versus black. Donald Trump plays on the same fears today. McCarthy. So Fast and Furious was not just a gun sting operation that went awry. Supposedly, the U.S. goal, according to Vicente Zambada Niebla's attorney, was to create a mega-cartel. Does that make sense in some way, based on your experience of watching how these things unfold? Valentine. I think the CIA is the mega-cartel. It might serve the CIA's purposes to have one central cartel in Mexico, but certainly no other organization in the world knows as much about drug trafficking. The CIA has computer systems that contain every bit of information about every trafficker and trafficking group. It knows where they bank and where they invest. It can predict their moves, whether in Afghanistan or Mexico. It uses all this information to manipulate events. Since 1973, the CIA has been in control of U.S. narcotics intelligence worldwide. The function was taken away from the DEA and given to the CIA, which is the unseen hand in this fast and furious melodrama. The ATF and DEA are straw men in this drama. As law enforcement agencies, they're shoved out in front of the CIA. But it's the CIA and State Department that arrange what's happening in Mexico, because quite simply... U.S. law enforcement agencies have no authority in Mexico. The State Department's concerns about political relationships in the region trump any law enforcement concerns. Any time a law enforcement operation is conducted in a foreign nation, it has to be approved by the State Department and the CIA. The CIA has the final say on anybody being recruited by any U.S. law enforcement agency in Mexico. If I'm in the DEA or ATF and I want to recruit the Sinaloa cartel or anyone in a cartel, I have to check with the CIA. The CIA runs a background check to find out whether the guy is working for the Russians or the North Koreans. The CIA is always worried that Mexicans are working for our enemies. You always hear about Hezbollah in Mexico. So the CIA has control over all informants recruited by the DEA and the ATF in Mexico. And the media knows this. Every reporter who works the Mexican beat knows this. But if they were to tell you, they'd be accused, like John Service or Chelsea Manning, of aiding the enemy. If they tell, they're revealing national security secrets. So the media is prevented from mentioning that the CIA plans the little melodramas you see. The script is written by politicians in the White House and Congress. The CIA carries out their illegal operations... And if one goes bust, 
it's pinned on some hapless law enforcement agency. So the view the public has of these operations is totally skewed. The CIA's purpose in having an informant in some Mexican cartel or running a mega cartel has nothing to do with law enforcement. The CIA is not a law enforcement agency. It's our mafia operating in foreign nations. I don't know which politicians and business people the CIA is backing in Mexico through these guns for drugs activities, but that's what it's about. It's about promoting politicians and business people who will enact policies helpful to America while suppressing the Mexican people. Those are the motivations behind who the CIA selects as an informant in a particular cartel. McCarthy. So the ATF, the FBI, these are the fall guys. Valentine. The others, yes, but the FBI is never a fall guy. The FBI also has an internal security mandate. Sometimes there's conflict, but the CIA will work with the FBI to pin it on someone else. The CIA's object is to make foreign nations abide by American policy. The FBI is protecting the U.S. from any leftist threats. Its counterintelligence operations spill into Mexico but they're classified, and you'll never hear about them in the news. They don't talk about the FBI in this kind of context in the news, either. The FBI is the premier law enforcement branch of the U.S. government, but it has no authority over the CIA. It resisted the creation of the CIA for that reason. Under J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI also denied the existence of organized crime and the mafia until 1963. It took decades to get to that point, because the crooks were anti-communist and enforced racial repression. In 1951, Senator Estes Kefauver formed a committee to investigate organized crime in an attempt to delineate lines of authority. It tracked back to drug smuggling in Mexico. That's in my books. According to a 14 July 1947 State Department report, Chinese nationalist forces were at that moment selling opium in a desperate attempt to pay troops still fighting the communists. The commissioner of the Bureau of Narcotics, Harry Anslinger, knew that Kuomintang narcotics were reaching Mexico. In a November 1946 report to Anslinger, the FBN's supervisor in New Orleans reported that many Chinese of authority and substance gained their means from this illicit trade, and that in a recent Kuomintang convention in Mexico City, a wide solicitation of funds for the future operation of the opium trade was noted. The agent listed the major Chinese traffickers by name. In February 1947, Treasury Attaché Dolor de la Grave, a former OSS officer, reported from Mexico City that three major drug rings existed, but he made no mention of Virginia Hill's connections, Albert Spitzer and Alfred C. Blumenthal. Bugsy Siegel was killed in Virginia Hill's house on 15 June 1947. In 1939, Meyer Lansky had sent Hill to Mexico, where she seduced a number of top politicians, army officers, diplomats, and police officials. Hill soon came to own a nightclub in Nuevo Laredo, and started making frequent trips to Mexico City with Dr. Margaret Chung. Mom Chung was an honorary member of the Hip Sing Tong and had served as the attending physician to the Flying Tigers, the private airline formed under China lobby luminary General Claire Chenault to fly supplies to the nationalists in Kunming, a city infused with OSS agents and opium, as investigative journalist Ed Reed reported in The Mistress and the Mafia, the FBN knew that Dr. Chung was in the narcotic traffic in San Francisco. Chung took large cash payments from Siegel and Hill and delivered Kuomintang narcotics to Hill in New Orleans, Las Vegas, New York, and Chicago. And yet, despite the fact that the FBN agents kept her under constant surveillance for years, they were never able to make a case against her. Why not? Because she was protected by her many influential friends in Washington, including Admiral Chester A. Nimitz. Agent Joe Bell, the FBN's district supervisor in Chicago, theorized that Siegel's murder paved the way to complete control of illegal narcotics distribution in California by the Mafia. Bell was referring to a related drug smuggling operation Lansky initiated in Mexico in 1944 under Harold Happy Meltzer. 
Described as the man who most feared Bugsy's grab at Mexico, Meltzer based his operation in Laredo, as fate would have it, directly across the border from Hill's nightclub. He worked with the Mexican consul in Washington, who located suppliers and bribed border guards, and moved drugs to the mafia in California. Bankrolled by Lansky, Meltzer traveled between Mexico City, Cuba, Hong Kong, and Japan. Meltzer was an occasional CIA asset, and in December 1960, the CIA asked him to join an assassination team. His proximity to Virginia Hill in Laredo suggests that he was a recipient of Dr. Chung's Kuomintang narcotics. If that was the case, Siegel may not have been murdered by the mafia, but by agents of the U.S. government, because Bugsy's grab for control of the CIA's Mexican connection threatened to expose Dr. Chung's protected Kuomintang operation. Even the way Siegel was murdered, by two rifle shots to the head, was characterized as very ungangster like Anslinger knew that Spitzer and Blumenthal were Lansky's associates, and that large opium shipments were coming out of Mexico under police escort, but the FBN did nothing. In 1948, the FBN declared that Mexico was the source of half the illicit drugs in America, but did nothing about it because the drug trade enabled the CIA which had been created in 1947, to destabilize the Mexican government. The CIA apparently connected Captain Rafael Chavari, founder of Mexico's version of the CIA, the Federal Security Directorate, DFS, with Mexico's top drug smuggler, Jorge Moreno Chavet. According to Peter Dale Scott, at this point the CIA became enmeshed in the drug intrigues and protection of the DFS, its sister agency. By 1950, Chavette was receiving narcotics from the new Lansky-Luciano French connection, and the mob-connected former mayor of New York, William O'Dwyer, was now the U.S. ambassador to Mexico. All of this was known to Senator Kefauver. He and other top government officials were also aware that the government's Faustian pact with the mafia during World War II allowed the hoods to insinuate themselves into mainstream America. In return for services rendered during the war, Mafia bosses were protected from prosecution for dozens of unsolved murders, including the 11 January 1943 assassination of Il Martello publisher Carlo Tresca in New York. The Mafia was a huge problem in 1951, equivalent to terrorism today, but it was also a protected branch of the CIA, which was co-opting criminal organizations around the world and using them in its secret war against the Soviets and Red Chinese. The Mafia had collaborated with Uncle Sam and had emerged from World War II energized and empowered. They controlled cities across the country. Congress looked into this mess through the Kefauver Committee. Estes Kefauver was a Democratic senator from Tennessee whose goal was to run for president in 1952. His plan was to achieve favorable national attention by exposing the Mafia's role in political corruption and labor racketeering. In order to embark on such a perilous mission, the ambitious senator needed only the approval of President Truman and Judiciary Committee Chairman Pat McCarran, a rabid segregationist, anti-communist, and linchpin in the China lobby. A conservative with no love for big-city Democrats, McCarran recognized the self-promotional merit in Kefauver's idea. But Nevada was dominated by organized crime figures. To the extent that McCarran was facetiously referred to as the gambler's senator, so he decided to run the investigation himself. Then Senator Joe McCarthy claimed to have a list of 205 people in the State Department who were known members of the American Communist Party. McCarran at that point became preoccupied with setting up the Internal Security Subcommittee and joining the politically more promising communist witch hunt. Unable to manage both projects simultaneously, he came to terms with Kefauver. Kefauver formed the Special Committee to Investigate Organized Crime in Interstate Commerce in 1951 and immediately hit a roadblock. By investigating the so-called gambling syndicate, he was destined to expose the Mafia's ties to J. Edgar Hoover's establishment patrons, so Hoover refused to let FBI agents serve as investigators for the committee. Hoover claimed he was too busy saving the country from communists 
and that it would be counterproductive to devote FBI resources toward investigating what he deemed to be consensual crimes, gambling, and drugs. So Kefauver turned to Commissioner Anslinger for help, and Anslinger assigned his top agents as expert witnesses and investigators. Kefauver and his team of FBN agents visited the major cities and conducted their investigation, and at the end determined that the vice squad pattern gave control of vice payments to a few officials and demoralized law enforcement in general. The committee concluded that local law enforcement managed local crime and that federal agencies were powerless to stop it. Street cops were taking payoffs from pimps, gamblers, and drug dealers and kicking a percentage up to their bosses, who kicked another percentage back to the politicians who appointed them. The industrialists who put the politicians in power were happy, as long as the cops made sure the mafia sold dope to blacks and Puerto Ricans. Nothing has changed. The CIA, FBI, ATF, and DEA are performing the same function for their political bosses. They manage crime to maintain social divisions, and so capitalism can thrive. The Kefauver Committee said there's nothing we can do about it. As Guy Debord famously said, the Mafia is not an outsider in this world. It is perfectly at home. Indeed, in the integrated spectacle, it stands as the model of all advanced commercial enterprises. People have been aware of it for 65 years, but can't do anything about it because the national security state is an impregnable fortress and average citizens can't get inside. Even if you understand what's going on, Five seconds later, you're chasing it out of your mind because there's not a thing you can do about it. We can't vote to end the secrecy that enables these rackets to exist. Clinton and Trump are rubbing it in our faces. They're saying, you can't do a damn thing about it. Cops killing blacks is unfortunate, but cops are hardly ever punished. The CIA controls the world's rackets the same way, and the federal government and its media allies keep it secret and there's nothing you can do about it except get riled up personally. McCarthy. It's amazing how skillful they are at keeping the focus on a tiny part of the story and not even getting into the real story. It is interesting how they muddy issues. Valentine. Right now, America has 5% of the world's population and 25% of its prisoners. Most of them are in prison for drug-related offenses. Talk about human rights abuses. After they joined forces with the Mafia, the capitalists got their congressmen to keep increasing sentencing for drug offenses. They created a vast, privatized, profitable prison industry, which in turn props up a huge law enforcement industry. Taken together, this is not freedom and democracy. Instead, the government media propaganda machine has succeeded in demonizing the people who pack the prisons just as it demonizes Muslims in order to keep the homeland security industry growing. The disenfranchised minorities who are arrested for drug offenses get court-appointed lawyers who never seriously contest their cases. They cop pleas and go to prison. Human beings are the grist for this crime mill that churns out money for investors. It's systemic corruption, just like NAFTA, which has led to increased poverty and suffering in Mexico. And this provides the pretext for a surveillance state that's equipped by companies staffed by former FBI, DEA, ATF, and CIA agents. It's creating terrorism to subvert the justice system and assure them political control of Americans. That's the domestic end of this drugs-for-guns boondoggle. McCarthy so, overseas, we use it as a tool of policy, supporting the people we like and eliminating the people we don't like. At home, we use it to keep people under political control. Valentine. Yep. All the evidence is there. If you look at what the CIA has done, the coups de tat of leftist governments and alliances with crooks and fascists, and what they're doing now and what they say behind the scenes, it becomes evident that what I'm saying is fact. But the media bosses are partners in this enterprise, and they won't allow their networks to report on anything of substance. If rogues among them do, they're expelled. McCarthy. And there's the horrible example of Gary Webb. I mean, if that's not a warning to journalists, what can happen to them? Valentine. Lots of journalists have been harassed for even having hinted at the truth. 
Lots of other people have suffered the same way, starting with the Foreign Service officer I mentioned earlier, John Service. McCarthy. If drugs were to be decriminalized, then that whole thing goes up in smoke. You can't have all these cops on the payroll doing nothing except taking bribes. You can't have the CIA running drug cartels. They always say it would be a humanitarian disaster if we let drugs be legal. There'd be people dying in the streets from overdoses. And that's why we're keeping all this going for you. Valentine. If you look at every other country where they don't have these, to use the cliché, draconian drug laws, people are not dead in the streets with needles sticking out of their arms and coke pipes shoved up their nose. People want to live healthy lives, but political and economic factors keep them down. Discrimination and lack of economic opportunity turns segments of society to the underground drug business, both as sellers and users. Among the protected rich and famous, it's a kick and something they can get away with because they have lawyers and access to the Betty Ford Clinic. The government is creating conditions across the board that are conducive to taking drugs. The pharmaceutical industry is part of the problem, along with its co-conspirators in the advertising industry. Every time you turn on the TV, there's a commercial telling you to take a pill. The next commercial says, don't take that pill, take this pill. This is the free market at work, sucking the life out of people. It would help if the airwaves were publicly and not privately owned, and if we could get rid of all this advertising. It would help if we could nationalize the pharmaceutical industry and take the profit out of health care and law enforcement. Then maybe we could experience something like democracy. But as long as the vulture capitalists control the national security state and the media, that isn't going to happen. McCarthy we started out with a limited discussion about Mexico, but once you start unraveling one thread, it really does lead to this discussion we're having, because it's not about the gun and drug running into Mexico. It's not even about the history of the U.S. supporting drug operations all over the world. It's about domination and control. It's about a few people conspiring, literally, to keep the majority of people in a controlled and controllable state. Valentine. Yep. While you're looking at this one particular shell game, 40 other shell games are going on. If they can keep you focused on the sensational operations like Gunrunner, you're not going to be looking at what's important, the big picture. McCarthy. It's all about misdirection, the greatest magician's trick. Even in warfare, the ultimate skill is to misdirect the attention of your enemy. So, Doug, thank you so much. You're the guy doing all the digging. You're the one looking at this every day, and I can understand the cynicism. But since you brought that up, if one more person understands what's going on, it's a victory. Not a massive victory, but it's a victory. Big victories have to start with small victories. Part 3. The Phoenix Foundation of Homeland Security such a perfect democracy constructs its own inconceivable foe, terrorism. Its wish is to be judged by its enemies rather than by its results. The story of terrorism is written by the state, and it is therefore highly instructive. The spectators must certainly never know everything about terrorism, but they must always know enough to convince them that, compared with terrorism, everything else must be acceptable, or in any case more rational and democratic. Guide aboard, Comments on the Society of the Spectacle. Chapter 15. The Spook Who Became a Congressman. Why CIA Officers Cannot Be Allowed to Hold Public Office. While running for Congress as a Republican candidate in 2000, Robert R. Rob Simmons posted on his website and in TV ads a picture of himself standing in front of an American flag in an Army uniform. The symbolic meaning was obvious. Simmons was glorifying himself as a soldier patriot above all else. But in the final week of the campaign, his identification with militancy took an unexpected turn when he was scandalized by allegations that he had committed war crimes while serving not as a soldier, but as a CIA officer in Vietnam. Simmons called the accusation a smear tactic. Any veteran, anybody who served his country in war, should be offended, Simmons said, appealing directly to the patriotism of undecided voters in a last-ditch effort to win the election, 
while inadvertently castigating the CIA. Adding to his indignation was the undisputed fact that the charges had emanated from the staff of his opponent, Congressman Sam Gadenson, who had represented Connecticut's 2nd District since 1981. Rocked by the outpouring of sympathy for Simmons, Gadenson fired a campaign worker for inciting two, yes, two college students to plan, yes, plan, a rally against Simmons. The students were intimidated, politically suppressed in CIA terms, into canceling their protest. The local newspaper, the New London Day, headlined the Gadenson aspect of the story, calling it a dirty trick, but refusing to delve into the substance of the charges. So I wrote to the editor and said that I'd interviewed Simmons twelve years earlier. I offered to write an article about him, but the newspaper decided to wait until after the election. It seemed like the newspaper was trying to help Simmons win the election, and when he did. Though trailing in the week before the election, he won by less than 3,000 votes. It was the allegation that he was a torturer that propelled him to victory. God Bless America When The Day finally featured a story on Simmons's sordid CIA past, it admitted that the war crimes charge wasn't a dirty trick, but stemmed from a profile of Simmons The Day itself had published in 1994. In a rare moment of candor, Simmons in 1994 had confessed that while managing the Fu Yen Province Interrogation Center, PIC, he would threaten to withhold medicine from injured prisoners in order to obtain information. But, he added piously, he never made good on the threat. According to Simmons, a coercive tactic like threatening to withhold medical treatment did not reach the threshold of a war crime. On the contrary, if I hadn't involved myself, many people would have lost their limbs or their lives, Simmons said with a straight face. Simmons's denial was enough for the day. It didn't ask if he'd withheld medicine for hours or days, or if his victims included children and the elderly. It wasn't concerned with the guilt or innocence of the people Simmons abused, or if they were forced to sign false confessions to stop the bleeding. Steeped in the same racist stereotypes that military propagandists spewed during the war, the newspaper assumed that every Vietnamese in the PIC was a terrorist deserving of whatever atrocities were committed against him or her. They were all trying to kill heroic Americans like Rob Simmons, weren't they? I wasn't surprised by the newspaper's shenanigans. From the time the Phoenix program was published in 1990, I'd witnessed a gradual escalation of belligerent nationalistic rhetoric, accompanied by an outpouring of revisionist Vietnam War history. The reactionary Reagan, Bush, and Clinton regimes had waged a series of increasingly militant and covert action initiatives, from El Salvador to Iraq to Serbia, in a calculated and well-publicized attempt to purge the Vietnam syndrome from the fragile American psyche. The floodgates opened in the wake of 9-11. Suddenly, the practice of withholding medicine became CIA's standard operating procedure as part of the Bush-Cheney-Rumsfeld repertoire of torturous, enhanced interrogation techniques. Torture became so popular that in 2003, the U.S. Supreme Court approved the practice of withholding medical treatment for domestic law enforcement purposes. In a 6-3 decision, the court exonerated several California cops who'd withheld medical treatment from a Hispanic suspect they'd shot five times. The cops, like Simmons, claimed they were merely trying to get him to talk. Withholding medical treatment, however, was not always applauded by American militarists as a cool way of coercing bad guys. When John McCain ran for president in 2008, Withholding medical treatment was characterized as the dastardly sort of thing only subhuman commies would do. McCain, who spent five and a half years in captivity in North Vietnam, was shot down while dropping bombs on civilians in the heart of Hanoi. Taken prisoner with fractures in his right leg and both arms, he received minimal care and was kept in wretched conditions. As he tearfully recalled, they kept saying... You will not receive any medical treatment until you talk. McCain suffered. I thought that if I just held out, that they'd take me to the hospital. I was fed small amounts of food by the guard and also allowed to drink some water. 
I was able to hold the water down, but I kept vomiting the food. I looked at my knee. It was about the size, shape, and color of a football. I remembered that when I was a flying instructor, a fellow had ejected from his plane and broken his thigh. He had gone into shock. The blood had pooled in his leg, and he died, which came as quite a surprise to us, a man dying of a broken leg. Then I realized that a very similar thing was happening to me. McCain cracked. Thereafter known as Songbird, McCain told the guards, I'll give you military information if you will take me to the hospital. I've repeated McCain's sorrowful story to show how easy it was for the day to manipulate information to minimize the charge against Simmons. We didn't hear the screams of pain and fear in the background like we did in McCain's account. Simmons's victims were given no voice at all. This magical ability to portray the same thing as good in one case and bad in another is the essence of the political and psychological warfare campaign being waged against Americans by rehabilitated war criminals like Simmons and McCain and their supporting cast in the old boy network that has manipulated public opinion for 70 years. But the differences between McCain and the Vietnamese Simmons tortured are that McCain was wounded while terror-bombing innocent civilians in a major city in a foreign country, while Simmons remained unscathed, and the people he terrorized were snatched from their homes at midnight or in Phoenix roundups. As his well-rehearsed story illustrates, Simmons is an expert at dissembling, which, as I explained to the day, is why he shouldn't have been allowed to hold public office. He can't be trusted to tell the truth about anything. But the sad fact is that many Americans are soothed by the double standard, which absolves them of complicity in the crimes their country commits. What's worse is that he has legions of allies in the media to censor his critics, fellow CIA officers to back his alibi, and corrupted historians to lend an air of authenticity to his propaganda. Stated Policy versus Operational Reality Early in my research into the Phoenix program, I filed an FOIA with the CIA asking it to release all its records about the PICs. That request was denied. Forty years after they were abandoned, the PICs are still as big a secret as what happened inside the Gulag archipelago of black sites the CIA built after 9-11 in eight countries, including Thailand, where al-Qaeda commander Abu Zubaydah was waterboarded, Afghanistan, and several democracies in Eastern Europe. The CIA will never release to the public its secret files about the PICs, which certainly served as models for its black sites. And even if it did release them, they should not be believed. CIA officers are trained never to incriminate themselves in written reports or spoken words. Not to do so, after all, is key to achieving plausible deniability. The way to understand the operational realities of running a PIC, as opposed to the stated policies Simmons and his co-conspirators cite chapter and verse, is by studying the political, psychological, and bureaucratic contexts in which they occur. By doing so, one realizes that war crimes like those committed in the PICs are unstated but carefully crafted U.S. policy. The mindset of CIA officers and their media co-conspirators is the unifying factor in this conspiracy. McCain, the tortured, and Simmons, by the same standards, the torturer, truly believe the heroic myth they have created about themselves. Indeed, the myth of the hero has informed Western literature and philosophy since the Greek elite paid Homer to pen the Iliad and Odyssey forever endowing the warrior class with the highest social virtues while justifying the tragic consequences of their imperial marauding as fate. Since then, the theme of the warrior hero has determined Western social development. The Old Testament would be a short story without it. How many times have Hollywood's leading men quoted the rousing speech Shakespeare had Henry V deliver to his soldiers on St. Crispin's Eve? For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. Being initiated into a secret society, 
a band of warrior brothers that exists apart from and is superior to civil society, can be intoxicating. Even Confederate soldiers are venerated as heroes, for however vile they were as individuals, they obeyed their officers and killed and died on command. Much of America's rhetorical identity as exceptional is based on this Marlboro macho man myth. What distinguishes CIA officers is their transcendent ability through their bureaucratic association with the national security establishment and its Homeric scribes in Hollywood to promulgate their myths as fact while guaranteeing that the truth is concealed. McCain's exalted status as a U.S. senator enabled him to enact legislation that sealed thousands of documents pertaining to Vietnam War POW briefings. He claimed he did it to protect the privacy of POWs. But his real motive, according to Sidney H. Schonberg, was to keep the lid on the details of his collaboration with his captors. Simmons pulled a similar stunt. While serving as a legislative aide in the U.S. Congress, he helped author and enact the Intelligence Identities Protection Act, which makes it a crime to name CIA agents. It was already a crime to report CIA sources and methods, but this act added another layer of legal chainmail to the protective shield already separating CIA officers from the consequences of their crimes. Once they are safely ensconced in this legally gated community, they have only to sculpt their Boy Scout persona. Every crime boss knows how to act in front of the press. In 1958, reporter Dom Frasca managed to get an interview with Vito Genovese, just before he went to prison for drug trafficking. Don Vito liked golf, wore yellow-tinted glasses, and lived alone in a five-bedroom cottage. He did his own cooking, mostly traditional Italian dishes. Eight grandkids often visited. When Frasca asked him about the rackets, Vito blamed all his troubles on his ex-wife going through menopause. Most significantly, Vito's wry humor kept Frasca at an impeccable distance without offending. It's easy to put on an act. The best politicians, criminals, and CIA officers do it naturally. The problem for the rest of us is that over time, the actors come to believe it. The myths they internalize are the fatal lie in the soul Plato warned about. Fate isn't what makes someone murder and torture for profit. It is deceiving oneself into believing one has no choice. Not everyone is a victim of this mass delusion. Warren Milberg, a CIA officer I interviewed for the Phoenix program, told me how, in 1967, the Pentagon invited him and two other Air Force officers to join a secret CIA counterinsurgency program in Vietnam. Volunteers were given extensive training and sent to Vietnam to serve at the discretion of senior CIA officers in Saigon and the regions. Most were assigned to the provinces as paramilitary officers. Several became Phoenix coordinators. Milberg, who identified himself as one of the protected few, joined the program. But the other two officers withdrew, one as a matter of conscience. Jacques Klein withdrew because he felt the means and methods that he thought were going to be used in Phoenix were similar to the means and methods used by the Nazis in World War II. Klein took individual responsibility. Simmons sacrificed his and is forever corrupted. It's that simple. What did you do in the war, Daddy? Simmons enlisted in the Army in July 1965. He went to the Army's intelligence school that fall, and upon graduating was commissioned as a first lieutenant. He arrived in Vietnam in April 1967 and served a year with the 219th Military Intelligence Detachment in Bien Ho, a major city in Three Corps near Saigon. Simmons liked the war and volunteered for another tour, serving until December 1968 with MACV Team 96 in Kanto City, where the CIA was headquartered in Four Corps. His job was to work with South Vietnamese military and police forces to interdict the Viet Cong's secret supply system. Secret agents and smugglers were moving weapons, drugs, and other contraband through marketplaces along the Cambodian border. Simmons was successful, 
and as a reward was sent to brief Ambassador Ellsworth Bunker on his findings, which led to the initiation of the Cambodian Border Watch Program. While in Kanto, Simmons worked with CIA officers. I liked the agency guys, he said to me. They listened, and they asked the smartest questions. The CIA guys liked Simmons, too, and arranged a job interview for him at CIA headquarters. He was hired and entered the junior officer trainee program, which involved paramilitary training, handling weapons and making bombs, and intelligence training, surveillance, spycraft, running agent nets, setting up proprietary companies, etc. This was the same program Milberg joined and Klein quit. Similar programs have proliferated since 9-11. Simmons returned to Vietnam in November 1970 as a CIA officer posing as a civilian employee of the Defense Department within MACV's Pacification Security Coordination Group. He was slated to return to Canto, but a CIA officer in Fuyen province had flipped out and locked himself in a room with a gun. That sorry soul was sent home, as was his predecessor. According to Simmons, the officer he replaced was fired for hitting a priest, a Don Luce type who ironically was at the very time investigating abuses at the Fuyen PIC. Other ironies awaited Simmons. Located in Tu Cor, Fu Yen was a heavy VC province. CIA officers were confined to the compound, wore flak jackets, carried machine guns, periodically came under mortar attack, and had a personal force of Nung Chinese bodyguards. Simmons was assigned to the CIA compound in Tui Ho, the province's capital city. He did not name his boss, the province officer in charge, POIC, but described his counterpart, Special Police Chief Nguyen Tam, as a former French foreign legionnaire and paratrooper in the South Vietnamese Army. Tam was a tough veteran who didn't trust Simmons and could not control his freewheeling subordinates. Simmons initially reported on police corruption, but, he said, Morales never passed the reports to Saigon. In 1970, CIA Station Chief Ted Shackley distanced the CIA from the pacification programs it had initiated earlier in the war, including Phoenix. Negotiations for a ceasefire were underway by 1971, and the CIA receded into the shadows. Simmons was not allowed to meet the Cord's province senior advisor. Relations with military intelligence and with the special police were strained as well. Shackley told me that the CIA still oversaw Phoenix in 1972, but only to iron out problems. Was there a province chief not willing to cooperate with the PIC? Maybe there was overcrowding in a PIC that the province or region couldn't resolve. What to do? Well, the Phoenix director would go to the secretary general of the national police and cite specific cases. There might be a knowledgeable source in a PIC who needed to be brought to Saigon, were the line managers looking at the dossiers. Phoenix, Shackley insisted, had nothing to do with intelligence operations. It was completely separate from special branch trying to penetrate the Viet Cong. Any guy who could be used as a penetration agent was spun out of Phoenix. Under Shackley, Phoenix evolved into a massive screening operation under military control, while the special branch had the mission of keying on important VCI political leaders and activists so as not to clog up the system with volumes of low-level VCI cadre or front members. A typical special branch operation began when an agent submitted a report on a VCI suspect. The special branch would assign people to watch him or her. Special police officers worked in two-man teams around the clock. They'd find where the suspect lived and worked and where his contact points were. Other agents were set up in business, perhaps a soup shop close to the suspect's house, or a bicycle repair shop near his favorite café. Places the suspect visited were kept under surveillance. The special police wanted to know, for example, if the suspect and his comrades were printing leaflets in a safe house for the Women's Revolutionary Association. If the suspect was involved in revolutionary activity, he was secretly arrested and interrogated, and ideally made to inform on his bosses. More arrests would follow, and the best candidate among them would be coerced into working for the special police as a penetration agent, 
secretly channeling information to his case officer, which would lead to more arrests. For security purposes, photos of the penetration agent were taken in the company of special police personnel. He, she, would also be forced to sign a sworn statement indicating that he, she, was working for the GVN. The photos and documents would find their way to the VCI if the agent did not cooperate in the future. Such was the nature of the spy business Simmons was in. When he arrived in Tui Ho, his boss had three other CIA officers on his staff. One advised Korean Army forces in the province, another oversaw unilateral operations and was isolated from every South Vietnamese agency, all of which were penetrated by the VCI. The POIC spent most of his time with the unilateral operations officer, a veteran who had over 20 years of spy experience. Simmons was low man on the totem pole, and his boss gave him little supervision. He was, after all, working with counterparts who were not trusted. We met and we talked, Simmons explained, but the POIC focused on the unilateral operations guy, on political reporting on dissident groups, who was running in elections, who was going to win. The third officer advised the PIC chief and vacated Vietnam soon after Simmons arrived. He was not replaced due to the reduction in forces policy in place, and Simmons inherited the thankless job. But all was not doom and gloom. In late 1970, Simmons said, there was a feeling that we were winning the war, not conquering Hanoi, not pacifying the countryside, but reducing the VCI threat and driving the NVA main forces back. Simmons's job involved intelligence and paramilitary operations. In regard to intelligence, he directed Special Police Chief Tam in operations designed to identify members of the VCI with the goal of controlling the political environment by penetrating the VCI. This was not an easy thing to do. Those in GVN-controlled areas had cover jobs, doctor, teacher, farmer, while filling positions within the insurgency, such as messenger to VCI in the hamlets and villages. Those in the countryside were armed and hiding in secret lairs. Knowing how the CIA worked with the special police in Vietnam is helpful in understanding how the CIA operates in Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere. As recently as May 2016, the Pentagon announced that dozens of American advisors had been deployed to Yemen over the past two weeks. They are working with Saudi and Arab coalition troops seeking to assert control over southern portions of the country, including the areas controlled by al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, AQAP. As noted, CIA advisors like Simmons often work under military cover. Today, in Yemen and elsewhere, they are doing exactly what he did. More to the point, the CIA funds, equips, and manages the special police forces it has created worldwide. But you won't hear about it on the news. In Vietnam, the CIA organized the special police into sections. At the top was the chief, and under him were, among others, an interrogation section, a studies and plans section, and the all-important Secret Services Section, SSS. The SSS was split into two subsections. The first would watch, track, arrest, and recruit low-level VCI sympathizers. The more important Special Operations subsection ran infiltration and penetration operations. Because Special Operations involved strategic intelligence, the special police chief jointly supervised SSS cases with his CIA advisor, who met directly with and helped the SSS case officers running agents in the field. Agent recruitment was compartmentalized. When the special police spotted an insider who could be recruited to infiltrate the VCI, or an outsider in a position to approach members of the VCI, the first step was to determine if he, she could be turned into an agent. What did he do? Did she live in the area where the VCI were operating? Did the person have contact with someone inside the VCI? Such a person was known as a PIRL, a Potential Intelligence Recruitment Lead. If he or she were found to be suitable, they were recruited. Next, the special police drafted a preliminary plan to train the recruit in tradecraft, how to collect information, what matters to focus on, 
how to maintain a cover story, and how to make contact with and secretly report to a case officer. All of this was discussed with a CIA advisor. If a CIA advisor like Simmons approved the plan, he dipped into his black bag and supplied the cash to pay the agent. He also provided the necessary equipment, cameras, tape recorders, safe houses, and items like antibiotics to purchase the target's cooperation. The special police chief, SSS chief, and SSS case officer would periodically meet with the CIA advisor to evaluate the agent's information report. When things were running smoothly, an operational plan was made. If the agent succeeded in transforming himself into a VC activist, the plan was upgraded to an infiltration plan. If the agent succeeded in turning a VCI cadre into a defector, a spy inside the VCI, the plan reached its highest level and became a penetration plan. At that point, and this is the crucial part, the running of the operation was turned over to the CIA, and the special police were ordered to protect, maintain, and not interfere in the plan. In every case, the special police had to follow the CIA advisor's directions and satisfy his every need. This involved a significant degree of humiliation, for CIA advisors like Simmons rarely spoke Vietnamese, and even with a translator, they could not comprehend the subtleties of Vietnamese culture, let alone the intricacies of a penetration operation, which is why neither party trusted the other. Within this perverse environment, a CIA officer like Simmons was constantly asserting his dominance, and misunderstandings and resentments proliferated. Inevitably, CIA officers like Simmons internalized yet another integral part of the hero myth, the Lord Jim Warlord mentality. Megalomaniacal warlords intriguing against one another to control the political environment is the dynamic that defines America's hidden corridors of power. Phoenix in Fuyen The special police sent a representative to the Fuyen Province Phoenix slash Fung Hong Committee, along with information and documents from its Studies and Plans section. But they did not direct the committee or its field operations. Consequently, Simmons considered Phoenix a duplication of special police operations. The special police might send reports to the Phoenix Center, he observed, which was out on point, not downtown, and consisted of a bunch of people keeping files. Just as the CIA knew that the VCI had penetrated the special police, so too the special police knew that Phoenix had been penetrated. Phoenix was more exposed and an easier target of enemy collection efforts. In Fuyen province, the Phoenix DOICCs were often attacked and files stolen. We would go to Phoenix and they'd show us a file, Simmons said, and we'd use the file to help build a case. Every report we generated we sent to the PIOCC, but Special Branch had its own files, and if at the PIC we got someone who cooperated, we would withhold his file if he was going to be doubled, because we knew the PIOCC was penetrated. Simmons and the PRU By 1971, the CIA was distancing itself from its PRU counter-terror teams, as well as from Phoenix and the Special Branch. Simmons was never responsible for the PRU. He knew the South Vietnamese PRU chief, whom he described as a smart, upstanding, responsible guy, and he allowed the PRU to use his radio, but that was the extent of his involvement. According to Simmons, the Phoenix coordinator in Fuyen province worked more closely with the PRU than he did. The PRU, when developing information on VCI cadre in a village or hamlet, would acquire targeting information from the DIOCCs. The PRU would ask, who do you have in that village? And then the PRU chief would check out the DIOCC's files on likely candidates. The region's PRU advisor, Jack Harrell, had attended the same CIA training class as Simmons. Harrell paid the PRU once a month out of the CIA's bottomless black bag. Thirty years later, Simmons would call upon Harold to support the story he told to the New London Day that no one was ever tortured at the Fu Yen PIC. Harold went along with the fiction. Simmons and the PIC Under Simmons's supervision, 
The special police placed suspected members of the VCI, including children, on a blacklist. If they appeared to act suspiciously or were accused by an informer, they were snatched and placed in the PIC. Simmons was involved at every stage of every operation. The PIC was a one-story building with a tin roof in downtown Tuiho. Simmons's office was around the corner in a Quonset hut on the grounds of the National Police Station. His translator had good relations with the PIC chief, an interrogation section officer who reported to the special police chief and to Tran Quang Nam, the ranking national police chief in the province. Simmons described the PIC chief as smart, educated, from Saigon, a progressive. The PIC chief's staff provided reports for Simmons to peruse. After reading the translated reports, Simmons would interrogate prisoners who, in his estimation, could become penetration agents. He conducted the interrogations himself, but he emphasized he never let himself get in untenable situations. The PIC chief did not manage penetration operations. He helped the SSS case officer interrogate and single out leads for the special police chief to exploit. But Simmons was a control freak and considered the PIC the key place for recruiting double agents. The PICs, like almost every CIA operation, were kept secret from the American public, but were a grim reality, like U.S. military bases to the people living around them. The PICs were notorious, and South Vietnamese citizens were constantly complaining about them. Theoretically, a PIC advisor played a mediating role with the local population. While staying in the shadows, he helped improve conditions in response to citizen complaints for more light, more windows, more water, more space, more food and medicine. This public relations consideration was the reason why Simmons had access to Vietnamese medics and, in rare instances, American doctors. PICs were also a way station. Prisoners were supposed to be rotated out within a few days and their cases sent to province security committees, PSC, for disposal. If enough evidence was presented to convict someone as a national security offender, he or she was placed in administrative detention without access to a lawyer or due process. There were detention centers in every province apart from the PICs and prisons. This same system exists in every nation America currently occupies. Private U.S. companies make out like bandits building the facilities. High-level VCI were sent to the National Interrogation Center in Saigon. People convicted of national security offenses were sent to various prisons or the infamous facility at Konsan Island, where they were stuck and often shackled in tiger cages. Rows of submerged concrete cells shaped like coffins, built by French colonialists with iron gates for roofs so that guards could look down on the prisoners from above, whose existence was revealed to the public by Don Luce in 1970. The Special Intelligence Force Unit The PRU teams were controversial and known for war crimes. Called the CIA's Hired Killers by journalist Georgie Ann Geyer in a 1970 article for True magazine, the PRU were recruited by CIA talent scouts from Vietnam's minority, ethnic, and social groups. PRU teams were composed of Chinese Nungs, Montagnards, Muslim Chams, Cambodians, convicts, and former VC. The one thing they had in common was the ability to kill without remorse. By 1971, the CIA was distancing itself from the PRU, and Simmons was instructed to develop his own paramilitary unit for capturing and killing individual VCI. As a trained paramilitary officer, he was fully prepared and willing to mount operations designed to kill targeted members of the VCI. During our interview in 1988, Simmons produced reports of his paramilitary operations in Fuyen province. One report told how a special police team killed three VCI in November 1970. Based on a tip provided by an informer, the VCI were ambushed at night while digging a spider hole outside Vin Phu Hamlet. One of the people killed, Nguyen Van Tone, was described in the report as the secretary of the Communist Party Chapter Committee and chairman of the Village People's Revolutionary Committee. Tone was 20 years old and a native of Vinfu Hamlet. He was killed in his neighborhood. 
As a result of this successful operation, Simmons was ordered to develop the province's paramilitary capability. To that end, he created one of several prototypes for special action teams in Military Region 2. Called the Special Intelligence Force Unit, SIFU, it was formed in late 1971. Recruits came from nearby districts. All were volunteers from the Special Police and the National Police Field Forces. Eventually, there were six teams, each consisting of four men from the Special Police and four from the Field Forces. The Fuyan Province, SIFU, had its own facility and was commanded by Special Force Officer Nguyen Van Ki. It was advised and funded by Rob Simmons. Simmons did not say if he accompanied the SIFU team on its missions, but in order to command respect, CIA paramilitary officers routinely went on missions. In a report dated December 1971, the National Police Commander in Fuyen Province discussed several SIFU operations. Simmons objected to the word assassinate, so Colonel Nam used the word exterminate to describe a mission in which two VCI were killed in an ambush. As an example of SIFU effectiveness, Simmons produced a copy of a 29 January 1972 letter he sent to his CIA superiors. The letter was a request for medals for SIFU members who had participated in the recent Lien Tree operation. The Lien Tree operation began when an informer reported that elements of the Tui Ho City Party Committee Action Team were planning to enter Lien Tree Hamlet to build hiding places in preparation for an attack against Tui Ho and its northern suburbs. The North Vietnamese were, at the time, laying the groundwork for the Spring Offensive of 1972. The SIFU moved into the area the following day to intercept the VC action team. At 9 p.m., four confirmed VC, along with three women and seven youths, were seen digging a hole and were taken under fire. Killed were Trinh Tan Luc, a Tui Ho Party Committee member, and Nguyen Dung of the Tui Ho Current Affairs Committee. Under laws written by Americans, it was legal for Simmons to target for death South Vietnamese civilians, such as the three women and seven youths, digging the hole. Given the two of the VCI had organized a recent attack on Tui Ho, Simmons was pleased to exterminate them. The operation was over by 11 p.m. This operation epitomizes the type of operation we encourage the police to run against the VC-slash-VCI in Fuyen province, Simmons boasted to his boss. The special police prepared detailed information on the individual VC, tasked their local sources for information on the individuals targeted, which was of immediate value, and then were able to mount a strike force which was sufficiently well-equipped to effectively react to the information in a timely manner. The results speak for themselves. Prior to leaving Vietnam in June 1972, Simmons conducted one last operation. That spring, the NVA and VCI had attacked the Fuyen PIC and CIA compound. Binh Din province, bordering Fuyen on the north, was overrun by enemy forces, which were advancing on Tui Ho, when Simmons leaped into action. Everyone was in a panic. For several harrowing days, they were cut off from the rest of Region 2. Simmons spent a night alone in the compound monitoring the radio, and the next day, after crawling out from under his desk, he helped move reinforcements and supplies across the beachhead. It was touch and go, and after the main attack was repulsed, Simmons and his homeboys were confronted with a dicey situation. Thousands of refugees were fleeing Bin Din, and the VCI were using them as cover to sneak in their own assassins. CIA officers had been targeted for assassination, a word Simmons uses when people target Americans, in Bin Din, and reports indicated that the CIA officers in Fu Yen were next on the list. The fear and apprehension were palpable. But Simmons saved the day. Documents captured in March revealed that the VCI were planning to infiltrate Tui Ho in minivans called Lambros. So, Simmons explained, we rolled the Lambro drivers up and we put them all in the PIC. Uh, that's 15 to 20 people. We interrogated the Lambro drivers and learned they had all been conscripted. They were bringing VC cadres posing as farmers into Tui Ho. The Lambros were driven by VCI, including a few women. They had weapons hidden under seats to attack government offices. 
As Simmons is fond of saying, the results speak for themselves. But is there another side of the story of his CIA activities in Vietnam? What did the South Vietnamese and their government, which the U.S. was ostensibly there to support, think of his operations? Mythological Transformations I'm a poor farm girl, Simmons said in a shrill falsetto voice, mocking a woman he'd snatched and confined without due process in the PIC. So we released her and watched her for three months. Then we put her name in the paper. Arresting and watching her suppressed her and the organization, too. What Simmons described is the application of terror to suppress people. He traveled 12,000 miles to terrorize and kill Vietnamese citizens like 20-year-old Nguyen Van Thon in their backyards because they believed in agrarian reform and resisted foreign domination. As an exceptional American, he did so unflinchingly under the pretext of bringing self-determination to the Vietnamese. Meanwhile, some of the communist sympathizers he terrorized were, despite his best efforts, being freely elected into public office as part of the ceasefire agreements. Although Simmons would insist that PICs and PRUs were synonymous with democratic institutions, many South Vietnamese disagreed. As early as June 1969, South Vietnam's National Assembly had questioned the ministers of defense, justice, and interior about abuses by Phoenix officials, including illegal arrest, torture, and corruption. Eighty-six deputies signed a petition asking for an explanation. Justice Minister Le Van Tu noted that the extra-legal facet of the system, the province security committees, had the power to sentence VCI cadre for up to two years in detention without convicting them of any crime. Tu said the practical difficulties of amassing solid evidence made it necessary to arrest everyone suspected of complicity. That explanation was not well received. One legislator charged the Vinh Binh province police chief with knowingly arresting innocent people for the purpose of extortion. Another said VCI suspects were detained for six to eight months before their cases were heard, and that suspects were frequently tortured to extract confessions. She said the people hated the GVN for starting Phoenix. Other deputies were incensed that American troops forcefully and illegally detained suspects during military operations, a charge Colby would deny at congressional hearings in 1971. Congressman Reed asked Colby, do Phoenix advisors perform any actual arrests or killings, or do they merely select the individuals who are to be placed on the list who are subject to killing or capturing and subsequent sentencing? Colby replied, They certainly do not arrest because they have no right to arrest. But he added speciously, Occasionally a police advisor may go out with a police unit to capture somebody, but he would not be the man who reached out and grabbed the fellow. At the same hearings, Army Intelligence Officer Michael Yule testified that all civilian detainees were listed as VCI and that despite Colby's denials, Americans exercised power of arrest over Vietnamese citizens. In Duke Pho, Yule said, where the 11th Brigade base camp was located, we could arrest and detain at will any Vietnamese civilian we desired without so much as a whisper of coordination with ARVN or GVN authorities. As for the accuracy of information from paid sources who could easily have been either provocateurs or opportunists with a score to settle, Yule said, the unverified and, in fact, unverifiable information nevertheless was used regularly as input to artillery strikes, harassment and interdiction fire, B-52s and other airstrikes, often on populated areas. No Vietnamese citizen was fooled by Colby's double talk. Grassroots opposition to American occupation and systematic repression existed and was not confined to communists. At Senate hearings held in 1970, Foreign Relations Committee Chairman William Fulbright asked Colby, Where is Mr. Trong Din Zhu, the man who ran second in the last election? Mr. Zhu is in Chi Ho Jail in Saigon. Colby said, adding that Zhu was not arrested under Phoenix, but under Article 4, which made it a crime to propose the formation of a coalition government with the communists. Apart from Colby and his co-conspirators, no one made a distinction between Vietnamese officials the Americans corrupted, or the Americans advising Phoenix, 
or the ubiquitous American-created and jury-rigged judicial system that enabled all the atrocities that occurred. For its part, the CIA lumped together peaceniks, neutralists, and political opponents as VCI, but again, the Vietnamese people weren't fooled. They knew the CIA didn't want to end the war if it meant sharing power with communists. As it is in Afghanistan today, the CIA's goal in Vietnam was to prevent rapprochement, which it tried to do by making advocating peace with the communists punishable by death or imprisonment without trial under the Antri laws. Despite the Vietnamese people's efforts at political accommodation, the CIA in 1972 still considered neutralists and anyone advocating peace as legitimate targets for extermination. And Congressman Rob Simmons was an agent of this genocidal endeavor to suppress the will of the Vietnamese people to live in peace. The same can be said of the American militants who lead America into war after war in Islamic states, pushing young Muslim men into fundamentalism and provoking within them the lust for revenge that our leaders then insidiously use as a pretext to restrict civil liberties and institute a police state in the U.S. Being in Simmons's presence was disturbing, the way being around CIA officers always is. One senses that the abuse they have heaped on their victims has forever warped their souls. They no longer need to psych themselves up to dehumanize their imaginary enemies. It's second nature to them. My argument to the New London Day was that it is necessary to ask how Simmons's prolonged abuse of people affected him and those like him, and how their sick sensibilities might determine their actions if they moved from clandestine operations into public office. The newspaper dismissed my argument as irrelevant, but the detrimental effects of engaging in torture are known. In December 2014, the Washington Post cited from the Senate report on CIA torture. The report said that numerous CIA agents engaged in torture in Iraq and around the world had serious documented personal and professional problems that should have called into question their employment by the CIA and access to classified information. The author of the article asked, what can we expect for the future of those who carried out the rectal feedings, waterboardings, and other harsh treatment of detainees that the report described? I was muzzled in 2000 when Simmons was running for Congress, but time has justified my fears that the public embrace of Simmons and those like him represented a dangerous drift toward fascism in America. Indeed, he and his CIA co-conspirators have applied the same tactics they used in South Vietnam against their liberal enemies in America, as I shall demonstrate later in this book. When I asked Simmons about the morality of interrogation centers and hit teams, he said, Most of what we did was benign. He assumed no responsibility. He admitted only to negligent cruelties, and thanks to CIA secrecy, there is no official evidence to contradict him. But there is circumstantial evidence. Residual Responsibility When the day ran its feature article on Simmons, it avoided the overarching issue of American responsibility for systematic repression in Vietnam and focused solely on Simmons's good intentions. In support of Simmons's claim, it cited Gary Maddox, who managed the CIA's PRU teams in four corps in 1971. Maddox, whose CIA escapades are chronicled in a prior chapter, said he visited Simmons and never observed any torture at the PIC. He qualified that statement, however, by adding, Our orders were to vacate the premises if anybody was being mistreated. But we couldn't tell them what to do. They ran the show. Maddox's statement, They ran the show, is patently untrue. And while the day let it stand, there is plenty of evidence to prove it is false. The special police were well aware of who ran the show. One of the top special police officers told me that his organization, along with the entire South Vietnam government, was like a needy person, and any gift given to her or him was precious and heartily welcomed. Every year the gifts were newer and better than before, and so the government willingly followed whatever directions and instructions accompanied the gifts. The special police officer quoted a proverb used in South Vietnamese financial circles, a proverb that applied when CIA promises were accompanied by action, meaning money. 
who pays, governs. Simmons admitted as much. When I interviewed him in 1988, I asked about his relationship with his counterparts. He replied that the PIC chief reported administratively up through the police structure, but he also knows that the building was built by the CIA and then turned over. Okay. But he also knows that, hey, you know this building came from the guy in the Quonset hut. I asked if the CIA paid special branch salaries. That's right, he replied. And also the agents. If you've got a hot agent that you want to recruit, the money comes from the CIA. I was very interested in some of the quality of interrogation that was going on, Simmons added, and I had access to resources so that I could manage phone rings, so that I could get what I wanted. Simmons could get anything he wanted, and as we know, he who pays governs. In a letter to the editor, I suggested that if the day really wanted to confirm, as the editor had said, that Simmons was a good public figure with clean hands, it should send a reporter to Vietnam to interview any surviving civilians who had been held in the Phu Yen PIC while it was under Simmons' supervision. Get the other side of the story, I suggested. Let the victims be the judges. But the newspaper preferred the Homeric myths about Simmons, whom it endorsed. It never sent anyone to Vietnam. It didn't even try to contact knowledgeable Vietnamese officials and historians. There are, however, contemporaneous reports regarding conditions in the PICs. One of them is a 9 September 1973 letter from David and Jane Barton to Congressman Robert N. C. Nix at the Asian and Pacific Affairs Subcommittee. From May 1971 until May 1973, the Bartons were field directors with the American Friends Service Committee's Rehabilitation Center in Quang Nai Province. Quang Nai is close to Phu Yen, and what the Bartons said about the Quang Nai PIC mirrored events in the PIC supervised by Simmons. I'll cite portions of their letter to give a sense of what went on. The Bartons addressed the withholding of medicine as a torture technique. They noted that medical care for prisoners was almost non-existent. During their two years in Quang Nai, they said, no Vietnamese doctor nor medical person visited any of the prisoners, and there were few medicines stronger than aspirin. Prisoners were seriously ill with, among other things, pneumonia, unset broken bones, infected wounds, and malnutrition. Some were chained to their beds, and prison officials rarely isolated prisoners with communicable diseases such as tuberculosis. A second problem, they said, was that many prisoners in the hospital were returned to the PIC for further interrogation, even though they were diagnosed as seriously ill and under treatment. One such example is that of a 19-year-old woman whom our doctor discovered had a cardiovascular problem of potentially serious consequences. In addition, the patient had a three-month-old fractured femur due to a bullet wound and was unable to walk. The AFSO doctor asked both the American and Vietnamese officials to allow him to remove the bullet and evaluate this prisoner's heart condition. The American and Vietnamese officials were fully aware of the danger to this prisoner's life if she did not receive medical treatment, and yet she was returned to the interrogation center and denied medical care. On the subject of torture in PICs, they wrote, The majority of the prisoners to whom we gave medical treatment have been tortured, we were able to gather evidence of torturing through the physical examination, through interviews and personal accounts, and from X-rays and photographs. During interrogation at the province interrogation center, prisoners explained that they are forced to drink large amounts of water mixed with lime, soap, or salty fish sauce. After their stomachs are bloated, the interrogator jumps on their stomachs. One APSO doctor examined several patients who had petit mal seizures and memory lapses. He felt that this was due to brain damage caused by drinking such toxins. Prisoners also told an AFSO doctor that they were forced to lie on a table, and if they didn't respond to questioning properly, the investigator would reach underneath their rib cage and crack or break the prisoner's rib. The same doctor examined and had X-ray evidence of several prisoners with cracked or broken ribs. Frequently, prisoners suffered from internal bleeding and internal injuries. These prisoners described how they were placed upright in water-filled oil drums, which were then beaten on the sides, giving the prisoners internal injuries without leaving external marks of torture on their bodies. Many prisoners showed very visible signs of being beaten, 
and in several cases skull fractures, brain hemorrhages, and various forms of paralysis resulted. Prisoners were also tortured with electricity. Electrical wires were attached to their toes, fingers, or genitals. When the electrical shocks were administered, they would become unconscious. Upon regaining consciousness, the prisoners would again be interrogated, and if their interrogators were not satisfied with their answers, the electrical shocks would be repeated. The electrical torturing seemed to cause strange physiological phenomenon, fits and seizures, especially among the female prisoners. We knew as many as twenty-five women who routinely had eight to ten such seizures a day. During our routine medical visits with prisoners, we were able to witness and document the permanent mental and physical damage which prisoners sustained as a result of the tortures mentioned above. Ultimately, the Bartons were trying to convince Congress to stop funding the systematic political repression it imposed on the Vietnamese. To that end, they said, We were distressed to hear stories of torture going on in the American-built interrogation center, and to see men and women rice farmers from the Quang Nai countryside continually being arrested and transported there in American-purchased vehicles. Similarly, it was upsetting to speak with a Vietnamese national police commander who had been trained at the U.S. International Police Academy and to discover that this official expected a large bribe from us for the release of the brother of one of our Vietnamese staff. Incidents such as these were just a few of the constant superficial reminders of how American money and supplies were being used to mistreat and imprison Vietnamese civilians. Based on reports of torture in PICs, Congressman Paul McCloskey visited Vietnam in early 1971. While there, he asked CIA officer John Mason, the director of the Phoenix program, to arrange a visit to a PIC. It wasn't easy getting in. McCloskey was met at the gate by a red-headed CIA officer with a revolver on each hip, cowboy style. A combat veteran of Korea, McCloskey brushed him aside and pushed his way in. To its credit, the day cited McCloskey as saying, There were instruments of torture in the interrogation room, whips and manacles, things of that nature. The day did not add that upon returning to the U.S., McCloskey and several colleagues stated their belief that torture is a regularly accepted part of interrogation, and that U.S. civilian and military personnel have participated for over three years in the deliberate denial of due process of law to thousands of people held in secret interrogation centers built with U.S. dollars. Despite the censorship, Taken together, the statements of the Bartons, McCloskey, and the anonymous special police chief I cited earlier are irrefutable. The CIA and its individual officers were responsible for any crimes the special police engaged in, including torture in PICs. As Jacques Klein observed, the CIA was an occupation force that functioned systematically like the Gestapo and SS Einsatzgruppen in France. Residual Responsibility and Systematic War Crimes Phoenix, the PRU, the PICs, and the Special Police were part of a system of repression the CIA designed and implemented in Vietnam for the political control of people. But was everything, from assassination to extortion, massacre, tiger cages, terror and torture, legitimate and justifiable? By 1971, the system's legality was questioned not just by anti-war activists, but by the House Subcommittee on Foreign Operations and Government Information. As usual, a whistleblower provided Congress with its ammunition. In late 1970, Army Intelligence Officer Barton Osborne gave an aide on the subcommittee's staff a copy of the training manual he had been issued at Fort Holabird. According to the aide, William Phillips, it showed that Phoenix policy was not something manufactured out in the field, but was sanctioned by the U.S. government. This was the issue, that it is policy. So we requested, through the Army's Congressional Liaison Officer, a copy of the Holabird training manual, and they sent us a sanitized copy. They had renumbered the pages. This stab at disguising policy and avoiding responsibility is what had prompted McCloskey to visit the Phoenix Directorate in April 1971, in preparation for hearings to be held that summer. Phoenix Training Officer Colonel James Hunt was there with CORD's Director Jake Jacobson and Phoenix Director Mason. And just as I was getting up to go to the platform to give my briefing, Hunt said, Mason whispered into my ear, 
We gotta talk to them, but the less we say, the better. Well, the first question McCloskey asked was if anyone in the program worked for the CIA, and Mason denied it. He denied any CIA involvement. Jake, too. It bothered Hunt that Mason and Jacobson blatantly lied. It also bothered McCloskey, who returned to Washington and charged that Phoenix violated several treaties and laws. The legal basis for this charge was Article Three of the Geneva Conventions, which prohibits the passing of sentences and the carrying out of executions without previous judgment pronounced by a regularly constituted court, affording all the judicial guarantees which are recognized as indispensable by civilized peoples. Article Three also prohibits mutilation, cruel treatment, withholding medicine, for example, and torture. Having agreed to the conventions, Congress was aware of Article Three, but chose to ignore it. But a problem arose when the American ambassador to the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC, wrote a letter to Congress. In his 7 December 1970 letter, Imer Reimstead said, With respect to South Vietnamese civilians captured by U.S. forces and transferred by them to the authorities of the RVN, Republic of South Vietnam, the U.S. government recognizes that it has a residual responsibility to work with the government of Vietnam, GVN, to see that all such civilians are treated in accordance with the requirements of Article Three of the Conventions. To the consternation of America's war managers, Reimstead's letter meant they could no longer dismiss the thousands of civilian detainees corralled in the Phoenix dragnet as an internal matter of the GVN. Reimstead reasoned that by funding Phoenix, the Special Police, and the Directorate of Corrections, America automatically assumed residual responsibility for detainees, for as we know, without U.S. aid, there never would have been an RVN or puppet governments in Iraq and Afghanistan. Reimstead's letter implied that American war managers were war criminals, prompting CIA, State Department, and Pentagon lawyers to review Phoenix procedures and contest their illegality at the House Subcommittee on Foreign Operations and Government Information hearings in the summer of 1971. Luckily for them, on June 13th, the New York Times began printing excerpts from the Pentagon Papers, which by name deflected attention away from the CIA. Consequently, the public paid little attention when, in July, Congressman Reed asked Colby, Are you certain that we know a member of the VCI from a loyal member of the South Vietnamese citizenry? Colby said no, but that didn't stop Rob Simmons from throwing people in the PIC. On the contrary, the CIA, as part of the Interagency Vietnam Task Force, insisted the conventions afforded no protection to civilian detainees because nationals of a co-belligerent state are not protected persons while the state of which they are nationals has diplomatic representation in the state in whose hands they are. The CIA said that Article Three applies only to sentencing for crimes and does not prohibit a state from interning civilians or subjecting them to emergency detention when such measures are necessary for the security or safety of the state. Skirting the issue of executions carried out without previous judgment pronounced by a regularly constituted court, it asserted that administrative detention procedures did not violate Article Three precisely because they involved no criminal sentence. After the Bush regime began detaining suspects in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Guantanamo, legal scholar Jennifer Van Bergen and I examined its assertion that administrative detention was legal. Our conclusion was that where you find administrative detentions, you are likely to find torture. The connection exists even where it is clear that investigations and screenings leading to such detentions are, as Bush's White House counsel Alberto Gonzalez put it, not haphazard but elaborate and careful, reasoned and deliberate. This conclusion derives from the faulty elements of administrative detention, the absence of human rights safeguards and normal legal guarantees such as due process, habeas corpus, fair trial, confidential legal counsel, and judicial review vague and confusing definitions, standards, and procedures, inadequate adversarial procedural oversight, excessive executive branch power stemming from prolonged emergencies, the war on terror being the ultimate example, and the involvement of the CIA and other secret, thus unaccountable, executive branch agencies. 
When butchered in such a fashion, the judicial system is a charade and human rights are jeopardized. As William F. Schultz, executive director of Amnesty International, said, This year we are witnessing not just a series of brutal but fundamentally independent human rights violations committed by disparate governments around the globe. This year we are witnessing something far more fundamental and far more dangerous. This year we are witnessing the orchestrated destruction by the United States of the very basis, the fragile scaffolding upon which international human rights have been built painstakingly, bit by bit by bit, since the end of World War II. The scaffolding upon which international human rights have been built has been destroyed forever by the Bush and Obama regimes by a carryover of practices first applied in Vietnam. The similarities between systematic repression in Vietnam and what's happening in the war on terror and its domestic flip side, homeland security, are not limited to policies and procedures, but include the psychological warfare campaigns that create the fear and thus the public support for the policies and procedures. The linkage between administrative detention, torture, and repressive police states is evident for all to see, but remains unrecognized due to the systematic censorship of information. The U.S. and Israel are at the forefront of this ominous development, manufacturing crisis after crisis to maintain a perceived national emergency with its corresponding emergency decrees that target the unprotected classes and specifically U.S. citizens such as blacks and Muslims. Intelligence laws that permit spying on suspects without probable cause of criminal activity are secretly revised and expanded. Secret torture centers ensure confessions, and Star Chamber security courts are convened specifically to operate outside international law. And that's to say nothing of all the secrecy that surrounds Guantanamo. When backed into a corner, the government's public relations experts insist that torture is necessary to defend freedom. Cheney stood by it. Trump promised to bring back waterboarding and worse. That was a factor in his appeal. Behind this twisted logic are beastly impulses rooted in the dark side of the human psyche the kind of impulses the CIA and the Mafia harness and use to achieve dominance. What differentiates the CIA and the Mafia, inter alia, is that the CIA more perfectly controls public institutions and information. The CIA, for example, owned and operated three newspapers in Saigon. One wonders how many it owns in America. Determined not to repeat the mistakes made in Vietnam, the Bush and Obama regimes prevented the media from publishing photos of dead U.S. soldiers returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. Like Bush, Obama uses censorship, disinformation, and propaganda to conceal the brutality of his policies and practices. We don't see the mutilated bodies after drone strikes. The purpose is to disguise criminal intent and practice. But any public official who engages in such a criminal conspiracy, including Rob Simmons, should be held responsible for the predictable result, which is why the nation needs a war crimes tribunal. At a bare minimum, Simmons could be tried for the human rights violation of denying due process. Due process is a human right recognized in international law to be enjoyed by all persons. But when Congressman Reed asked if civilian detainees had a right to counsel, Colby replied, no. Flabbergasted, McCloskey asked Colby, the administrative detention applies to those against whom there is insufficient evidence to convict. Isn't that right? Colby agreed. But, McCloskey blurted, the defendant informed against or identified has no right to appear in his own defense, no right to counsel, no right to confront his accusers, no right to see his dossier. Is that correct? That is correct, Colby said. That brings me to the real problem with the Phoenix program that I saw while I was there, McCloskey said. If the evidence is insufficient to convict a man, and also insufficient to show a reasonable probability that he may be a threat to security, then he may still be sent to the PIC. Congressman Reed added in utter exasperation, 
at least as shocking as the assassinations, torture, and drumhead incarcerations of civilians under the Phoenix program is the fact that in many cases the intelligence is so bad that innocent people are made victims. Reed produced a list, signed by the CIA's special branch advisor in Bindin province, of VC cadre rounded up in February 1967. Reed said, It is of some interest that on this list 33 of the 61 names were women and some persons were as young as 11 and 12. Did the people of Vietnam feel the CIA was protecting them from terrorism? Cord's official Ted Jackane testified before Congress in 1971 that arrest without warrant or reason was a major complaint of the people of Da Nang. I have personally witnessed poor urban people literally quaking with fear when I questioned them about the activity of the secret police in the past election campaign. Uh, one fisherman in Da Nang, animated and talkative in complaining about economic conditions, clammed up in near terror when queried about the police, responding that he must think about his family. After many personal interviews in Vietnam on this subject, I came to the conclusion that no single entity, including the feared and hated Viet Cong, is more feared and hated than the South Vietnamese secret police. Jackanay added, In every province in Vietnam there is a province interrogation center, a PIC, with a reputation for using torture to interrogate people accused of Viet Cong affiliations. Last year, the senior AID police advisor of Da Nang City Advisory Group told me he refused, after one visit, to ever set foot in a PIC again, because war crimes are going on in there. Another friend, himself a Phoenix advisor, was ultimately removed from his position when he refused to compile information on individuals who would, he felt, inevitably be targeted, however weak the evidence might be. Army Intelligence Officer Bart Osborne agreed. I had no way of establishing the basis on which my agents reported to me suspected VCI. There was no cross-check. There was no investigation. There was no second opinion. Osborne added, I never knew of an individual to be detained as a VC suspect who ever lived through an interrogation in a year and a half, and that included quite a number of individuals. They all died? Congressman Reed asked incredulously. They all died, Osborne replied. There was never any reasonable establishment of the fact that any one of those individuals was in fact cooperating with the VC, but they all died, and the majority were either tortured to death or things like thrown out of helicopters. At the end of the hearings, Representative McCloskey, John Conyers, Ben Rosenthal, and Bella Abzug stated their belief that the people of the United States have deliberately imposed on the Vietnamese people a system of justice which admittedly denies due process of law. In so doing, we appear to have violated the 1949 Geneva Convention for the Protection of Civilian Peoples at the same time we are exerting every effort available to us to solicit the North Vietnamese to provide Geneva Convention protections to our own prisoners of war. Some of us who have visited Vietnam, they added, share a real fear that the Phoenix program is an instrument of terror, that torture is a regularly accepted part of interrogation, and that the top U.S. officials responsible for the program, at best, have a lack of understanding of its abuses. They concluded that U.S. civilian and military personnel have participated for over three years in the deliberate denial of due process of law to thousands of people held in secret interrogation centers built with U.S. dollars. And they suggested that Congress owes a duty to act swiftly and decisively to see that the practices involved are terminated forthwith. It is as a participant in that genocidal endeavor that Rob Simmons should be tried as a war criminal. The Making of a Psychological Warrior Rob Simmons was trained and is highly skilled in the art of duplicity, of tricking people, and of torturing them into telling things that they didn't want to tell. He was also involved in setting up a hit team that went out and assassinated people in their own backyards. How did doing those things affect him? One would have to be inside a PIC and see the squalid conditions that the prisoners endured and hear their screams to understand the traumatic impact being in one of them for 18 months straight would have had on a 28-year-old CIA officer like Rob Simmons. When I met Simmons in September 1988... He not only exhibited signs of post-traumatic stress syndrome, he admitted having it. 
People never resolve war experiences, he said with a lugubrious sigh. He seemed ready to explode and unleash the hatred he harbored against the anti-war left that sabotaged the patriots. He raged at how the VC manipulated media in U.S., people like Walter Cronkite, who created the notion that Phoenix was an assassination program. A super patriot and the Barry bomb them into the Stone Age Goldwater mold, Simmons believes the First Amendment was never intended to be a free ride for individuals to say and do whatever they want. He reserves to himself, as one of the protected few, the right to determine when it is not okay for Black Lives Matter protesters to speak freely. He seamlessly structures his moral universe on a double standard in which the flag is a sacred symbol of liberty and burning it should be outlawed. In 2001, in one of his first votes as a congressman, he supported an anti-flag desecration amendment, and in June 2003 he voted yes on a constitutional amendment prohibiting flag desecration. When I wrote about him in 2000, I said his ideology, his activities at the PIC, and his actions on behalf of the CIA while staff director of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence raised doubts about his fitness to govern in an open society within the framework of a constitution that guarantees due process to all Americans, including flag burners, anti-war protesters, and leftists. Based on what he did after Vietnam, I still feel that way. In the short term, he stayed in the CIA as an operations officer. Between 1975 and 1978, he ran a major operation that prevented the Taiwanese from obtaining material for a nuclear weapon. Sensitive files the Taiwanese needed were stolen, and attempts to buy materials were choked off. It was a feather in his coonskin cap. But as Simmons told author Joseph Persico, he got mad at Jimmy Carter's CIA director, Stansfield Turner, in what was called the Halloween Massacre of 1977, Turner fired an estimated 600 employees in the CIA's covert operations branch. I'd served overseas, risking myself and my family in some rough spots, and was damn poorly rewarded for it, Simmons whined, then expressed resentment at CIA critics on the left. People outside treated us like scum, like pariahs. His rant had the ring of a prepared script delivered by a practiced actor, and his ostensible exit in 1979 did not translate into severed relations with the CIA. On the contrary, Simmons kept his top-secret security clearance and went to work as a legislative assistant to neocon Senator John H. Chaffee at the Select Committee on Intelligence, while simultaneously obtaining a degree in public administration from Harvard. This period in his curriculum vitae has all the earmarks of a covert action. It looked to me like Simmons was being double-hatted, an arrangement through which an officer works under administrative cover for an organization while secretly taking orders from the CIA. Many junior military officers enter this relationship with the CIA while advancing to field officer grade and studying at the Command and General Staff College. It appeared to me that Simmons had a specific CIA assignment. While serving on Chaffee's staff, he helped draft and facilitate passage of the Intelligence Identities Protection Act. This legislation was ostensibly a result of the magazine's counter-spy and covert action quarterly naming CIA officers. CIA dropout Philip A.G. and the aforementioned Bart Osborne were associated with the magazines. The CIA hated them with a purple passion, and largely through its unofficial public relations firm, the Association of Former Intelligence Officers, publicly but falsely blamed them for the murder of CIA officer Richard Welch in Athens in December 1975. The Intelligence Identities Protection Act makes it a crime to name CIA agents. John Kiriakou, who blew the whistle on CIA torture in 2007, is one of only two people convicted under it. Having proven his value as a moneymaker, Simmons in 1981 became staff director of the Republican-controlled Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. Reagan had been elected president, and Democrats were pushing for an investigation of William Casey, whom Reagan had nominated as director of the CIA. According to Persico, the committee's conservative chairman, Barry Goldwater, hired Simmons precisely to button up the investigation of Casey. 
And lo and behold, Simmons dutifully produced a truncated five-page report describing Casey as not unfit to hold the job. There was no mention of Casey's associations with underworld character Robert Vesco, his connection with an ITT bribery scandal, and various other criminal escapades in self-aggrandizement. Simmons told Persico, Casey wasn't screwing widows or orphans. He was taking advantage of the law. Taking advantage is par for the course for the rich and powerful people Simmons serves, like Donald Rumsfeld. One day they're routing nerve gas to Saddam Hussein, the next day they're killing him, his family and followers, and stealing everything they own. The Democrats' fears about Casey were realized once he was confirmed as DCI. He reversed the Turner policies that Simmons hated and jumped in the stirrups of the counterterrorism network established by CIA careerists behind Carter's back. Casey used the network to bypass Congress and launch the Enterprise, the network of companies established by Major General Richard Secord to secretly sell arms to Iran through Israeli agents as a way of financing the illegal Contra war in Nicaragua. At Casey's direction, the CIA formed death squads, demolished an oil facility, and mined a harbor in Nicaragua, all violations of international law that had as their intent the terrorizing of civilians, the sort of thing former CIA dropout John Stockwell described as destabilization. Destabilization, said Stockwell, means hiring agents to tear apart the social and economic fabric of the country. It's a technique for putting pressure on the government, hoping they can make the government come to the U.S.'s terms, or that the government will collapse altogether and they can engineer a coup d'etat and have the thing wind up with their own choice of people in power. What we're talking about is going in and deliberately creating conditions where the farmer can't get his produce to market, where children can't go to school, where women are terrified inside their homes as well as outside, where government-administered programs grind to a complete halt, where the hospitals are treating wounded people instead of sick people, where international capital is scared away and the country goes bankrupt. Of course, Stockwell added, they're attacking a lot more. And, of course, the CIA is doing this everywhere around the world, every day. You just don't hear about it on NPR. But Simmons knows how it works— that's why the CIA appears to have placed him on Senator Goldwater's staff. While in the prominent position of staff director of the Select Committee on Intelligence, Simmons was chaperoning fact-finding delegations to secret CIA installations for discussions not about the virtue of subverting U.S. laws and foreign nations, but on how best to go about it. Surrounded by old boys, he had his hands on the controls, but somehow failed to uncover Casey's self-sustaining off-the-shelf drugs-for-guns apparatus that provided $1 million a month to the Contras. When the Iran-Contra scandal erupted, Simmons claimed that another CIA officer had deceived him, despite the fact that he'd talked to every major player and had read every secret document. But it was merely his administrative job to find out the truth and tell it to the American people— his prevailing operational job was to protect the secret old boy cabal that runs the CIA. Simmons rationalized Casey's deception of Congress as inconsequential. For people who served in war, author Bob Woodward said, Simmons thought that was the primary experience, real danger. Everything else paled by comparison. They had sent people to certain death, so to hustle some bucks was nothing. It was easy. To be criticized was nothing. So some judge or senator or reporter or a cartoonist was beating on you. So what? You have served in war and survived. For such militants, steeped in the Homeric myth of the warrior hero, the ultimate test is murdering another man. You can't understand what life's about unless you've done it. Fifty thousand American soldiers were sacrificed on that pagan altar in Vietnam, so the crime bosses could build an empire on their bones. To lie, cheat, and steal. Simmons left Congress in 1985 after receiving awards from Casey and the Senate to become a visiting lecturer at Yale, where he taught classes titled Congress and the U.S. Intelligence Community and the Politics of Intelligence. In 1991, he was elected to Connecticut General Assembly, where he remained for eight years. 
While campaigning for the Senate in 2009, Simmons said, I am honored to have served in the U.S. Army and the CIA, putting my life on the line on difficult and dangerous missions abroad to protect our people and our interests. Some things never change, including Simmons's jingoism and self-glorification. But was he really honored to have participated in the genocide of two million people who never threatened the U.S.? Apparently he was. Such is the power of self-delusion, of constructing a persona and coming to believe in it so thoroughly it replaces the actual human being, like a bite from the walking dead. But do we want self-deluded ideologues, whose loyalty is to the CIA and the military, not to the American public or democracy as public officials? In 2000, in my article for Counterpunch, I asked if voters could be certain Simmons would tell them everything they needed to know in order to govern themselves. How could anyone know for sure he wasn't playing a double game or hiding secrets, consistently promoting militarism and war, no matter its necessity or cost? As Simmons once said, In intelligence you have to lie, cheat, and steal to get the truth. The reason for it is for your national security. Unfortunately, as FBN agent Martin Para explained, you can't check your morality at the door, go out and lie, cheat, and steal, and then come back and retrieve it. In fact, if you're successful because you can lie, cheat, and steal, those things become tools you use in the bureaucracy. That's exactly what Simmons did while serving as a legislative aide and staff director for the Senate Intelligence Committee. I'm guessing that he was intentionally placed in that position to effectuate the secret policies of the CIA. His career illustrates how the Old Boy Network coordinates the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government on behalf of the arms industry, to which the military and CIA are joined at the hip, while simultaneously imposing increasingly systematic repression on the American people. It is rule by organized crime under the rubric of patriotism and national security. Just figure... The CIA runs the arms for drugs trade through its covert paramilitary army, while its logistics experts handle off-the-shelf shipping companies, and its financial experts create offshore banks to recycle the cash into new operations. All of it is highly compartmented, with intelligence officers suborning foreign customs agents and special policemen, some of whom arrange without their own government's knowledge the construction and operation of black sites. Simmons is naturally endowed with the persona needed for a PR position in this enterprise. He was a lector at his Episcopalian church in Tony Stonington, Connecticut, when I interviewed him. He knew I'd spoken with Colby and was glad to discuss aspects of his CIA activities that advanced the myths he was creating about himself as he prepared to re-enter the national political arena as a U.S. congressman, a career move that seemed preordained. In 2000, I also asked the overwhelming question, where in a nation sharply divided along ideological lines would a hardline political and psychological warrior like Simmons stand if the Bush administration embarked on another genocidal campaign against another manufactured enemy, like Johnson and Nixon did in Vietnam and Reagan and Bush did during Iran-Contra? Would he betray the will of the American people to live in peace as a way to reward his patrons in the CIA? Where would Simmons stand if America entered an age of dissent? His voting record speaks for itself, as Simmons is fond of saying. Claiming that intelligence is the first line of defense in the war on terrorism, he voted to allow the Bush regime to authorize electronic surveillance without a court order to acquire foreign intelligence information. He voted to allow the security services to spy on Americans without a warrant and without going to the FISA court. He voted for intelligence gathering without civil oversight, which erodes our basic constitutional rights. He voted to declare that Iraq was part of the war on terror and to invade and occupy it forever. He voted to steal up to $78.9 billion in public funds and give it to arms manufacturers as emergency funds for the terror wars on Afghanistan and Iraq. That's $62.5 billion for military operations in Iraq and the war on terror, $4.2 billion for homeland security, $8 billion in aid to allies and for Iraqi relief and rebuilding, 
$3.2 billion for U.S. airlines to cover additional security costs, and $1 billion in aid to Turkey, which in turn dutifully allows CIA agents to infiltrate Syria. He voted to give more and more public money to the war machine, while more and more Americans slipped out of the middle class into poverty. He voted yes on making the Bush tax cuts permanent and was warned by the AARP not to use its name in his campaign ads. He received a grade A from the NRA and voted to continue military recruitment on college campuses. He voted yes on building a fence along the Mexican border and yes for comprehensive immigration reform without amnesty. While chairman of the Homeland Subcommittee on Intelligence, Information Sharing, and Terrorism Risk Assessment, he advocated improved intelligence coordination between federal, state, and local authorities on the Phoenix program model. He voted to create a Phoenix-style National Intelligence Director and National Counterterrorism Center. He voted yes on making the Patriot Act permanent, yes on protecting the Pledge of Allegiance, Yes on disallowing R-rated movies and coffee pots in prison cells. Yes on military border patrols to battle drugs and terrorism. On allowing school prayer during the war on terror. Yes on the Bush regime's national energy policy. And yes on keeping the Cuba travel ban until its political prisoners were released. Finding himself a congressperson at the most critical point in America's legislative history in the past 50 years... He was a consistent and prominent advocate for the Bush regime's extra-legal policies and practices regarding the administrative detention and torture of suspects in the War on Terror. In 2006, the host of Talk Nation Radio in Connecticut, Dory Smith, interviewed Wells Dixon, an attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights. Dixon worked on Guantanamo-related issues. Simmons had argued that suspects in the War on Terror are exceptions to the Geneva Conventions and that rules that have been used in the past do not apply to them. Smith asked Dixon if Simmons was correct. Dixon replied that Simmons was wrong. He emphasized that the Geneva Conventions and Common Article Three are part of U.S. military law and training. They are part of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, and they are also part of Army Regulation 190.8, which governs the treatment of prisoners. The Geneva Conventions, of course, have also protected our soldiers for more than 50 years and will continue to do so as long as we adhere to them fully ourselves. Simmons had also insisted that because the war on terror is not fought against sovereign nations or organized liberation movements, the rules of prisoners' engagement are non-existent. He insisted that the laws were vague and soldiers posted at Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib couldn't figure out how to treat prisoners. Simmons again was dissembling. As Dixon noted, the Supreme Court held in the Hamdan case that there was no basis for concluding that compliance with the Uniform Code of Military Justice was impractical in the war on terror. In a particularly outrageous assertion, Simmons said that conditions at Gitmo were more open than at the Osborne Correctional Facility in Connecticut. Dixon again corrected Simmons, the conditions at Guantanamo are not more open than at Osborne Correctional Facility. For one thing, there is no question that the detainees at Guantanamo have been tortured and abused by U.S. military personnel and CIA agents. The Center for Constitutional Rights has documented this in a report issued in July that provides first-hand accounts from current detainees and their lawyers of many of the abuses they have suffered while they have been detained in Guantanamo. Dixon reminded the audience that Rumsfeld approved a list of techniques, including the exploitation of phobias. One detainee was deprived of sleep for 49 out of 50 days, subject to an induced hypothermia, and led to believe that he was in Egypt and he would be tortured unless provided information to the government. Dixon said that Rumsfeld's enhanced interrogation methods rose to the level of torture. The general counsel of the Navy, Alberto Mora, said in 2004 in a memorandum that it was his opinion that these sorts of activities would be not only unlawful, but unworthy of military service, and that in his view they would rise to the level of torture. He raised a number of rhetorical questions, such as, What does deprivation of light and auditory stimuli mean? Can a detainee be locked in a completely dark cell, and if so, for how long? A month? 
a year? Another question he asked was, can phobias be applied until madness sets in? If you consider the conclusions of people like Mr. Mora, I don't think that there is any credible dispute at this point that the detainees in Guantanamo have been subject to torture and abuse. Smith noted that Simmons backed legislation that would send detainees to military courts that could withhold classified evidence from suspects, which is exactly the system the U.S. imposed on South Vietnam, as Simmons knew from having sent suspects to the Stalinist security courts there. Dixon again cited the Hamdan case, saying the Supreme Court ruled there is no basis to argue that the Uniform Code of Military Justice is inadequate to try terrorism suspects. He noted that after four years, suspects could not possibly have any intelligence value or pose a threat to the United States. They were pawns in a public relations game. Even the CIA had concluded in a 2002 report that most of the people at Gitmo were there because they were captured at the wrong place at the wrong time. They had nothing to do with terrorism. This is a statement that's been echoed by many former military officials, including the former Guantanamo commander, Jay Hood, who said, Look, sometimes we just didn't get the right folks. So I think it's important to remember that. Dixon raised another troubling issue. A provision in the Military Commissions Act suspends habeas corpus for any alien detained by the United States, he said. This would include lawful immigrants picked up on the streets of New Haven or Hartford, and it therefore deprives them of any meaningful opportunity to challenge their detention. So as a result of this provision, we expect that the United States will move to dismiss a number of the pending habeas cases, and we will then challenge the law on the ground that it's an unconstitutional suspension of habeas corpus. Next, Smith raised the issue of withholding medical care from wounded prisoners, as Simmons did when he was the PIC in Vietnam. That was a violation of the Geneva Conventions, wasn't it? she asked. Absolutely, Dixon replied. The denial of medical care to someone in the custody of the United States certainly would be illegal and unconscionable, and it would violate the Geneva Conventions, no question about it. Last but not least, Smith asked, do you think that he should have been more open about this when he argued for changes to U.S. law and the way we interpret the Geneva Conventions? Dixon noted that military regulations do not apply to the CIA. He then stressed that torture has proved to be extremely unreliable and in fact extremely dangerous. He noted that the CIA had rendered Mahar Arar to Syria, where he was tortured and then confessed. Arar, however, was innocent and eventually cleared by the Canadian government. And so I think that you can see from that example that coercion and torture really is not useful for interrogation practices, Dixon said. The other instance that I would point to, Dixon added, is the case of Ibn al-Sheikh al-Libi, a suspected bin Laden associate who was captured a few months after September 11th in Afghanistan. He was rendered by the CIA to Libya, where he was tortured, and under torture provided information concerning the connection between Iraq and al-Qaeda. This information formed the basis for Colin Powell's presentation to the United Nations in February of 2003, in which he said essentially that there was a connection between Iraq and al-Qaeda. We now know that that's not the case, that the information al provided was false, and we now know what the unfortunate results are of that information, i.e. the invasion of Iraq. So to the extent that Congressman Simmons or any other interrogator would employ coercive or other means to obtain information, I would be very suspicious. Suspicious indeed. Simmons always finds a way to clear the CIA of any wrongdoing. He is, after all, clearing himself when he clears the CIA. That's what happens when a nation is ruled by a protected few, regulated only by one another. Chapter 16 Major General Bruce Lawler From CIA Officer in Vietnam to Homeland Security Honcho In August 2002, I wrote an open letter to Major General Bruce Lawler at the Office of Homeland Security. Lawler had recently been named as Homeland Security's Senior Director for Protection and Prevention. By coincidence, he was a former CIA officer whom I had interviewed at length for the Phoenix program. Given that Lawler had been involved in Phoenix operations in Vietnam, it seemed fitting that he would get a job at Homeland Security, which is modeled on Phoenix. But I was still surprised 
When I met him in 1988, Lawler was a small-town lawyer in Vermont, feeling unappreciated and resentful of his former bosses at the CIA. He was still mad at the left, too. He'd run for attorney general in Vermont's 1984 Democratic primary, and in the spirit of full disclosure, he had listed his CIA service in the Phoenix program on the resume his campaign staff handed out to the press. Then the unexpected happened. A small radical magazine published a scathing article about Lawler and Phoenix. Soon thereafter, the state's anti-imperialist and pacifist groups produced briefs for delegates at the Democratic convention that said, no assassins for attorney general. Lawler lost the primary, even though William Colby, a native of Vermont, visited the state during the campaign to speak on Lawler's behalf. How times have changed. A decade after the Vietnam War ended, it was still possible to persuade voters that a former member of a covert torture and assassination program wasn't suitable to be a state's chief law enforcement officer. Since 9-11, it has become a badge of honor. In any event, Four years after he lost in the primary, Lawler still held the grudge against the peaceniks who, in his opinion, had smeared him. When I wrote my open letter in 2002, I wondered exactly what he had in store for people like me, now that he was in charge of the homeland's protection and prevention. Here we go again. Having former CIA officers in important government positions is nothing new. I refer you to the previous chapter about former Congressman Rob Simmons, who ran a torture chamber in Vietnam. Another example, Yale graduate and Bush family insider Porter Goss served in the CIA's operations division for over ten years, attacking Cuba, handling agents in Mexico, and eventually serving in London. None of what Goss actually did is known, but he had tons of campaign money and was elected to Congress in 1988. He served the neocon cause until 2006, when Bush named him director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Goss was in Pakistan in early 2001, just prior to the 9-11 attacks, having lunch with the head of Pakistan's version of the CIA, General Mahmoud Ahmed, whose agent network had ties to Osama bin Laden and directly funded, supported, and trained the Taliban. Other slimy CIA spooks walk the halls of Congress, like William Hurd, who slithered around Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. Like Simmons and Goss, the CIA apparently greased his slide into Congress so it could more effectively repress American society the way it does foreign nations. The question needs to be asked, is having people who are in actuality war criminals in positions of legislative and executive authority in America an expression of a free society? Or is the CIA antithetical to democratic institutions, given that it is a secretive organization whose modus operandi is similar to that of an organized crime outfit and corrupts everyone it comes in contact with? Should CIA officers be disqualified from holding public office? What is to prevent them from treating their domestic enemies the same way they treat their foreign enemies? I admit it was frightening to learn that Bruce was now a major general and a top-ranking official in the ominous Office of Homeland Security. Suddenly he had access to whatever political blacklists the Bush regime had assembled, as well as control over any covert action teams that might be used to neutralize dissidents. As a replica of the Phoenix Coordination Program, the Homeland Security apparatus is a perfect cover for all manner of clandestine blackmail and extortion operations. My fear was that Lawler was still working for the CIA, and even if not, still had that mentality, and thus posed a threat to democracy in America. One reason for that concern was that nowhere in Lawler's online biographies was there any mention of his CIA service. That omission indicated intent to deceive. The Executive Session on Domestic Preparedness a standing task force of leading practitioners and academic specialists concerned with terrorism and emergency management, sponsored by Harvard and the Departments of Defense and Justice, posted a biography of Lawler. It mentioned that he'd been the first commanding general of the Joint Task Force, Civil Support, JTS-CS, at Fort Monroe. The JTS-CS, it explained, had been formed to provide command and control over Department of Defense consequence management forces 
in support of a civilian lead federal agency following a weapon of mass destruction incident in the United States, its territories, or possessions. Could that civilian lead federal agency be the CIA, I wondered? The JTF-CS's mission sounded like a self-fulfilling prophecy, in view of the fact that it was founded a mere two years before the 9-11 terror attacks. In its 2000 policy paper, Rebuilding America's Defenses, the neocon project for a new American century worried that the transformation of American armed forces through new technologies and operational concepts was likely to take too long, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor. Many people felt this, too, was a self-fulfilling prophecy. And, of course, Lawler commanded the JTF-CS through 9-11 until October 2001, when it was merged with NORTHCOM. Nowhere in the executive session's biography did Lawler's patrons at Harvard, he's a graduate of its National Security Fellows Program, say that he had once been a CIA officer. Why not? In another biography that at one time was posted on the Internet but has since been removed, the Wikipedia link goes nowhere, Lawler was said to have been assigned as the Deputy Director Operations Readiness and Mobilization within the Office of the Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations and Plans in May 1998. As Deputy Director, he monitors Army operations worldwide and oversees National Guard and Reserve Forces integration efforts. This is significant, too, insofar as National Guard and Reserve Forces are, like JTF-CS, integral parts of NORTHCOM, the military component of the Homeland Security apparatus. NORTHCOM was formed after 9-11 specifically to enhance the military's ability to coordinate with civilian law enforcement agencies. Since then, the military has steadily expanded its influence over domestic law enforcement with eerily predictable results. The most drastic effect has been the militarization of police forces across the nation, and the intimidating presence of soldiers in airports and train stations. Over time, the American people have accepted their subordination to this systematic expression of state omnipotence and violence. They've been pacified. Police departments nationwide are given gee whiz gadgets developed by the military, like the Stingray Cell Sight Simulator and the IMSI Catcher. Such surveillance technologies chip away at our Fourth Amendment right to privacy. They're often deployed in secret, and cops who use them are compelled to sign non-disclosure agreements with the FBI. Such gadgets are used to identify every person at a Black Lives Matter demonstration or meetings to boycott Israel. Many cops have military experience. They return from overseas duty and still consider themselves heroes protecting the empire. Then the FBI or CIA comes along and recruits them into the secret boys' club, and they think they're above the law. They're perfectly willing to use the same extra-legal tactics they learned in the colonies on dissidents at home. Their sensibilities are informed by the crimes they participated in overseas. In the colonies, they got to bust into the homes of Iraqi and Afghan civilians, guns blazing. When they return and become cops... They automatically know who to target. The poor, blacks, leftists, environmentalists, and anti-war activists who disrespect their sacrifices on behalf of the nation. Political cadres own and control cops in America like they own and control special policemen in occupied countries. A favorite gee whiz gadget they dispense is PredPol software for predictive policing. PredPol was designed for tracking insurgents and forecasting casualties in Iraq and was financed by the Pentagon. One of the company's advisors, Harsh Patel, used to work for InQtel, the CIA's venture capital firm. If, for instance, the software depends on historical crime data from a racially biased police force, then it's just going to send a flood of officers into the very same neighborhoods they've always over-policed. And if that happens, of course, more personnel will find more crime. And presto, you have the potential for a perfect feedback loop of prejudice, arrests, and high-tech success. To understand what that means, keep in mind that without a computer in sight, nearly four times as many blacks as whites are arrested for marijuana possession 
even though usage among the two groups is about the same. I'll expand on the CIA, FBI, Pentagon infiltration of law enforcement in the next chapter. Meanwhile, let's address one more problem with Lawler's official biography, which states that the general's military service began in 1967. After service in Vietnam from 1971 to 1973, he received a direct commission in 1974 as an intelligence officer. Again, the information is intentionally misleading, with no mention that Lawler was a CIA officer. In fact, the unsuspecting reader is led to believe he was in the military. Might Lawler have consented to this subterfuge because he was still serving the CIA undercover as a military officer when he took the job at Homeland Security? Bruce Lawler in Vietnam I first read about Lawler in Everything We Had by Al Santoli. The interview was provocative, to say the least. In a section of his book titled The Phoenix, Santoli identified Lawler as having been a CIA case officer in one corps from November 1971 through December 1973. He quoted Lawler as saying that in order to win the war, what we had to do was get in and eliminate the ability of the VC to control or influence the people. That's what pacification was all about. The buzzword was root out. We tried to go in and neutralize their political structure. For anyone unfamiliar with Phoenix jargon, neutralize meant to assassinate, imprison, or turn someone into a defector or double agent. Political control, of course, is the name of the game. Lawler made some other provocative statements, including this zinger, which echoes my own conclusions about the CIA. We permitted the Vietnamese to corrupt the system, and we did it because we basically were corrupt ourselves. In an effort to find out how Lawler came to the conclusion that the CIA was corrupt, I wrote to him and requested an interview. He agreed, and what he told me confirmed everything Santoli had attributed to him, along with some additional startling details. Lawler told me that he joined the CIA, not the military, in 1967, while he was getting his B.A. at George Washington University. After he graduated, the CIA sent him to its training school. He took the paramilitary course in weapons and military tactics and was trained as an intelligence officer, the kind who manages interrogation centers and secret agents. After that, he was assigned to the Vietnam desk at Langley headquarters, where he received specialized training in agent operations in Vietnam. He also took a language course in Vietnamese. While at CIA headquarters, Lawler formed a rapport with the Vietnam desk officer, Al Seal, and when Seal was assigned as the base chief in Da Nang, he invited Lawler to go along. Lawler arrived in Saigon in November 1971 and joined the embassy's translation section. He transferred to Da Nang a few weeks later and was assigned to the CIA's counterintelligence office. He worked at that job through the Easter Offensive of 1972, during which time he developed a friendship with Patry Loomis, who would later achieve notoriety as an associate of Ed Wilson. In the summer of 1972, Loomis was made the region's PRU advisor. Just as a reminder, the CIA's PRU program was staffed by bloodthirsty mercenaries. Their job was to go into VC areas, in CIA jargon, to do unto them what they were doing to us. This is a reference to selective terrorism, the Viet Minh guerrilla tactic of murdering low-ranking colonial officials and collaborators who worked closely with the people policemen, mailmen, teachers, etc. The murders were gruesome, a bullet in the belly or a grenade lobbed into a cafe, and were designed to achieve maximum publicity and demonstrate to the people the power of the nationalists to strike crippling blows against their oppressors. For the CIA, this tactic meant kidnapping, killing and mutilating political, i.e. civilian cadres, along with their families and neighbors. When Loomis was promoted to head the PRU in Region 1, Lawler replaced him as the Quan Nam province officer in charge and liaison to the special police. In that capacity, Lawler did what Simmons had done in Fu Yen province. With his special branch counterpart, Captain Lam Min Son, he organized the most aggressive special branch officers into a special intelligence force unit that hunted members of the Viet Cong infrastructure in the hamlets and villages. Lam recognized that his own people could not run paramilitary operations in rural villages. 
Lawler explained. So we trained a unit of special branch guys, taught them infantry formations. They did this in anticipation of the pending ceasefire, at which point the PRU were to be placed under the control of special branch and integrated within Lamb's special police paramilitary unit. Bored with filing reports, Lawler started going out on PRU operations with Loomis. He dressed in tiger fatigues and went on ambushes and traditional snuff-and-snatch operations. By then, the PRU had become, Lawler recalled, an adjunct duty of the special branch advisor in each province. The CIA funneled PRU salaries in one corps through the special branch to the region PRU commander, Major Vin, who then doled it out to the province PRU chiefs. In his congressional testimony in 1971, Colby described the PRU as special groups which were not included in the normal government structure. Since that time, this has been more and more integrated into the normal government structure and correspondingly conducted under the government's rules of behavior. In her article, The CIA's Hired Killers, Georgianne Geyer told how, in the absence of an American or South Vietnamese ideology, it was said in the early days, why not borrow the most workable tenets of the enemies? After all, she quoted Dan Ellsberg's friend Frank Scotton as saying, they stole the atomic bomb secrets and all from us. As a result, Geyer wrote, Scotton and a few other Americans started a counter-guerrilla movement in northern Quang Nai province. Terror and assassination were included in their bag of tricks. At one point, Scotton's parent agency, the U.S. Information Service, printed 50,000 leaflets showing sinister black eyes. These were left on bodies after assassination, or even, our terrorists are playful, nailed to doors to make people think they were marked for future efforts. But, Geyer said, whereas Scotton's original counter-guerrillas were both assassins in the night and goodwill organizers of the people, the PRUs are exclusively assassins in the night. Furthermore, she said, the PRUs are excellent torturers. Torture has now come to be so indiscriminately used that the VC warned their men to beware of any released prisoner if he has not been tortured. Sometimes we have to kill one suspect to get another to talk, Geyer quoted a CIA PRU advisor as saying. Another PRU advisor told her that he ate supper with his PRUs on the hearts and livers of their slain enemies. Another one said, I've been doing this for 22 years all over the world. He cited Egypt when Nasser was coming to power, and the Congo when we were trying to get rid of Tshambe. Geyer said about the PRU advisor, his job, like that of many Americans in South Vietnam, was terror. Geyer called American PRU advisors really the leaders, a view that contradicted Colby's claim that Americans were limited to advice and assistance. Things changed dramatically for Lawler after the ceasefire in January 1973. Prior to that, his easy striped pants job as special branch advisor amounted to coordinating with Captain Lamb and getting reports from the Hoi An PIC. He had no dealings with the U.S. military or the province senior advisor and rarely acted on Phoenix information, just PRU and unilateral sources. There was little special branch input because no one talked to anyone. One big problem concerned the PRU. Although the PRU were placed under the jurisdiction of the special branch after the ceasefire, the CIA still controlled the purse strings. But it wasn't providing as much money as before and had lost control over the PRU leadership. According to Lawler, top-ranking PRU officers turned to graft, drug dealing, and shakedowns to make up the differential. Bad things started happening. Region 1 PRU Chief Vin began putting the arm on the Quang Nam PRU Chief Fan Van Liem, who in turn began changing money for the VC. Eventually, one member of the Quang Nam PRU team went to Lawler and said, It's getting out of hand. Ever the idealist? Lawler investigated. The investigation ended when he walked into the Hoi An PIC and saw that a woman who knew about the region PRU chief's dirty dealings, had been raped and murdered. Her body was stretched over a table. All of a sudden, Lawler told me, Mr. Liem wants me to go on a one-way mission with him, and the other PRU guys are telling me, don't go. After the Easter offensive of 1972, according to Lawler, 
The North Vietnamese Army concentrated on repairing its infiltration routes in preparation for the next offensive. Then came the ceasefire, at which point each village identified itself as controlled by the GVN or by the VC. As Lawler recalled, all of a sudden there was a lot of business because as soon as someone put a VC flag on their roof, they're gone. Not in the sense that they were killed, but we could pick them up and interrogate them. And we basically were flooded. It was also after the ceasefire that the country club set took over. Tom Flores, a veteran of the CIA's Western Hemisphere Division, replaced Al Seal as the region officer in charge. Flores brought his own deputy and chief of operations, and the entire CIA contingent moved into the Da Nang Consulate under State Department cover. Their involvement in PIC and PRU operations was now thoroughly illegal. Lawler described Flores as a very senior officer on his last tour, whose objective was to live well, not rock the boat, and take advantage of the amenities that were readily available. That attitude was prevalent. Lawler, as an example, cited the public safety advisor to the field forces as one of the guys who used to set up the shakedowns of merchants. He came out of that war wealthier than you or I will ever be, but you can't prove it. When Lawler brought the matter to the attention of his bosses, he was told, don't bother me, or asked, what do you want me to do? As with the Homeland Security boondoggle, many Americans went along for the profitable ride. The special branch liaison in Wei became the Tua Tien province observer, Lawler recalled. He had been a retired cop, and he liked the good life. But he had no enthusiasm. He thought it was a joke. He wanted to stay over there when his contract was up, so he became the province observer. He liaised. Contributing to the decline in morale after the ceasefire was the fact that the Special Intelligence Force units were disbanded and the PRU were placed under the National Police Command within the Special Branch. This caused many problems, Lawler explained. We started seeing more ghost soldiers, more extortion, and more protection money. We couldn't pay them at all, so we lost control. The PRU had the same mission as before and maintained their agents in field. But because the CIA advisor was no longer a participant, there were fewer operations and more excuses for not going. Lawler tried to maintain control by providing gee whiz gadgets like Nighthawk helicopters with mini guns and spotlights, and by being able to get wounded PRU into the hospital in Da Nang. Phoenix coordination, according to Lawler, was dead. There was nothing left. The Vietnamese gave it lip service, but there was no coordination with the special police. When the MSS and Special Branch got together, they tried to take away rather than share information. As soon as the Special Branch began paying PRU teams at province level, Major Vin got concerned. Now he has to answer to Saigon. He has to give them a cut. That resulted in Vin cheating somebody out of his cut, and that fractured what had been a unified unit. So it was that the PRU program devolved into a criminal enterprise like Frankenstein's monster, beyond the control of its criminally insane creator. The last straw for Lawler occurred just before the end of his tour in November 1973. Having worked in Da Nang's counterintelligence office, he knew that an NVA spy ring existed in the area and that the special branch had sacrificed a number of low-level cadres instead of flushing out the most important spies. It was a great deception operation, Lawler said. The high-level people continued to operate. One of the NVA agents was the girlfriend of Tom Flores's operations chief. But when Lawler reported this to Flores, he did nothing but accuse Lawler of having gone native. Lawler then committed the cardinal sin. He defiled the sacred chain of command by slipping a copy of his report to the CIA station security chief in Saigon. The operations officer was sent home, but Lawler was finished. Security teams visited his office, confiscated his furniture, and presented him with a ticket back home. After that, I became disillusioned, Lawler confessed. He returned to Langley headquarters, where Ted Shackley, then chief of the Far East Division, accepted his resignation. Lawler was embittered. The agency betrayed us, he said. To go after the VCI, we had to believe it was okay. But we were too young to understand what happens when idealism cracks up against reality. We risked our lives to get information on the VCI, information we were told the president was going to read. Then guys who didn't care gave it to superiors more interested in booze and broads. 
Reprisal is the name of the Homeland Security game. But there's something weird about Lawler that keeps him coming back for more, despite whatever scruples he may have manifested above. After his bid to be the Democratic Party's nominee for Attorney General failed in 1984, Colby intervened and got him a job interview at Langley. He was interviewed by Rudy Enders, the chief of the CIA's paramilitary special operations division. However, despite his willingness to return to the fold and help do the CIA's dirty work in Central America, details of the Da Nang incident surfaced during the interview, and Lawler was not rehired, at least not officially. People look for vindication in different ways. Take, for example, the reaction of the militant right wing to America's humiliating defeat at the hands of the Vietnamese. Phoenix creator Nelson Brickham compared it to the frustration and bitterness of the German nation after the First World War. As we all know, that frustration and bitterness, plus the financial support of fascist sympathizers like Henry Ford, enabled Hitler to rise from the ashes of the Weimar Republic. The same thing happened in America after the preordained terror attacks of 9-11. Symbolically, 9-11 wiped the slate clean. All the moral prohibitions on the rabid right were lifted, and all the rage they had cultivated during the degenerate Clinton regime was unleashed under the aegis of counterterrorism on nations sitting on vast oil reserves, as well as suspected terrorists, domestic dissidents, and the flag-waving American public as well. Lawler, like Simmons, resembled a bitter man looking for revenge. They probably subscribed to the fascist theories of Michael Ledeen, who blamed the 9-11 terror attacks on Clinton for failing to properly organize our nation's security apparatus. Others blamed 9-11 on a conspiracy between the Mossad, Saudi Arabia, and those members of the Project for the New American Century who landed in the Bush regime's Office of Special Plans. But according to Ledeen, the problem was Clinton's sneering lack of respect for security. New times require new people with new standards, Ledeen asserted. The entire political world will understand it and applaud it, and it will give Office of Homeland Security Chief Tom Ridge a chance to succeed and us to prevail. A lot of people with an axe to grind were jumping on the Homeland Security bandwagon, hoping to help Ridge succeed in crushing the left and paving the way for neocons to prevail. Knowing this, and fearing that Lawler was of the Ledeen reprisal persuasion, I tried to get an interview with him. I called his office and spoke with his secretary. She said he would call me back, but he never did. Knowing from personal experience that the macho men of the CIA never forget an insult, I was concerned for everyone who had fought to end the Vietnam War, as well as those who in 2002 were lining up to oppose the Bush regime's police state policies at home and imperialism abroad. So in 2002, I wrote my open letter in Counterpunch to Bruce Lawler. Here it is. As far as I know, General Lawler, we still live in a democracy, although the Bush regime seems hell-bent on using the uninvestigated terror attacks of 11 September as a pretext to turn America into a military dictatorship. We are not yet, as far as I know, under martial law. Public officials like you still have a responsibility to respond to our concerns. Speaking on behalf of people concerned by the opportunity for the abuse of human rights and civil liberties presented by the corrupt Bush regime through its homeland security apparatus, here are the questions that need to be answered. 1. What happened in July 1995 to make you leave your law practice and go to the Army War College? Did the CIA have a role in that decision? 2. How did your education at the War College pave the way for your assignment as Special Assistant to the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe from June to October 1996? CIA officers often go by the term Special Assistant. Were you serving as the CIA's liaison to the Supreme Commander? 3. In May 1998, you became Deputy Director of Readiness and Mobilization within the office of the Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations and Plans. Your job was managing National Guard and Army Reserve units around the world. The job had international functions and fell under the CIA's cognizance. Did the CIA help you get this job? How were you involved with the CIA in this position? 4. 
You were the first commander of the Joint Task Force Civil Support. Your job was to work with civilians. Was this a CIA assignment? Did you liaise with the CIA? Was this assignment based in any way on your experience as a CIA officer in Vietnam, and was your main qualification the Phoenix sensibility that you brought to the job? What are your other qualifications? 5. In a 24 March 2000 statement to Congress, you seem to be preparing for the homeland security job you have now. In a way, you even predicted the calamitous events of 9-11. Did you, in fact, have any foreknowledge of those attacks? 6. In your statement, you said that as commander of the JTF-CS, you created civil support teams, CSTs, to assist in case of a weapon of mass destruction incident. The CSTs, you said, were National Guard assets and thus can function under state or federal authority. They are equipped with sophisticated communications systems that will enable local first responders to talk with neighboring jurisdictions or link up with federal centers of expertise. CSTs are also being equipped with state-of-the-art detection equipment that will enable them to help local first responders quickly identify potential WMD agents. That's what you told Congress. Would you now please tell us what role the CIA plays in CST operations? It sounds like a great CIA cover to me. Is there a civil support team near me? Will you allow me to observe how it functions? 7. What is your relationship with the CIA in your role as Senior Director for Protection and Prevention at the Office of Homeland Security? What do you do? Is it true that the Office of Homeland Security will be the strategy-making part of the apparatus and that the forthcoming Department of Homeland Security will be the tactical and operational part? What is the function of the Homeland Security Council, and what is your relationship with it? Can we have organization charts of these entities, including ones that show where the CIA is hiding its covert assets? 8. Last but not least, please explain the conspicuous absence of any reference to your CIA background in your official biographies. This seems to suggest that you are still CIA. Are you? And tell us, please, if you and others like you intend to use your power to seek revenge against your ideological opponents. Bruce Lawler never responded, but then I hadn't expected him to. The point of the admittedly rhetorical open letter was not just to expose the CIA connection and its ramifications, but to broadcast this possibility of revenge and hopefully thereby forestall it. Red Squads and Red Herrings Where the CIA is involved, there are always trap doors and deadly deceptions. Recall Operation Twofold and how the CIA hid a hit squad within the DEA's internal security unit. The CIA does nothing unless it can be assured of plausible deniability, and the Homeland Security apparatus is an infinitely large space in which the CIA can hide operations aimed at manipulating society and managing the political control of the American people. Twofold isn't the only example of the hidden dangers of such a setup. In its 1970 end-of-year report, the Phoenix Directorate quoted from a captured VC circular titled On the Establishment of the Enemy's Fung Hong Intelligence Organization in Villages. The VC circular was referring to the fact that the CIA had instructed each special branch case officer to organize and maintain 10 People's Intelligence Organization PIO cells. Each cell consisted of three agents in a hamlet. Apart from fingering VCI, the PIO agents engaged in psi war to jeopardize the prestige of the revolutionary families, create dissension between them and the people, and destroy the people's confidence in the revolution. PIO agents also made lists of the VCI cadres to be murdered when the ceasefire took place. Their prescribed criteria are to kill five cadres in each village in order to change the balance between enemy and friendly forces in the village, the circular said. In doing so, the primary task of GVN village chiefs was to assign Phoenix Intelligence Organization and security assistance to develop and take charge of the People's Self-Defense Force 
and select a number of tyrants in this force to activate invisible armed teams which are composed of three to six well-trained members each. These teams are to assassinate our Viet Cong civilian infrastructure, key cadre, as in Vinh Long province. Throughout this book, I've given examples of how the CIA uses civic actions as a cover for invisible armed teams aimed at political enemies. Ensuring deniability is the first step, and to that end, Phoenix employed the motto, protecting the people from terrorism, to present itself as goodness and light. And yet the CIA was inserting secret hit teams inside the self-defense force that were ostensibly protecting the people from terrorism in order to kill, without trial and based on all the flawed sources we have discussed, those whom they presumed might be aiding the Viet Cong in some way, people who were civilians and had rights as such. It is exactly this type of duplicity that informs the homeland security apparatus. The DHS has even adopted the Phoenix motto, protecting the people from terrorism, and for the same exculpatory purposes. The big question is, will these security forces conduct Phoenix-style paramilitary and war operations against dissident Americans in a crisis? Consider Bruce Lawler. He reported the rape and murder of a woman at the PIC, and when nothing happened, went about his business. Rob Simmons spent 18 months inside a PIC and never saw anything inappropriate. Bob Carey, as will be discussed in a forthcoming chapter, led a team of Navy SEALs into a Vietnamese village and murdered its men, women, and children. They did these things, came home, uttered the magic words, God and country, and all was forgiven. What have they proven but their intense commitment to kill? And, as a result, they have again been inducted into the gang of the protected few and can get away with murder, like cops killing blacks. They crossed the line and lost perspective. Lawler was aware that CIA officers systematically corrupt entire societies and in the process become corrupt. He even admitted it. Yet he still desired to take his place among the protected few. Why? Was it the chance to get revenge? But paradoxically, on whom? The brother of Frank Scotton's mentor, Dick Noon, manipulated the dreams of a peaceful tribe of people in Malaysia for the purpose of turning them into a police unit noted for its ruthless slaughter of captured communist guerrillas. Scotton did the same thing to mountain tribes in Vietnam. Americans' dreams are being shaped, too. Hollywood producers make billions extolling the violent virtues of the ruling warrior class, Video games make killing and mutilating Muslims a consummation every young American man desires. It makes them feel powerful and provides an antidote to their social alienation. The CIA shapes our dreams of democracy by controlling the information we receive. The Senate's 6,000-page report on CIA torture was whittled down to a 525-page summary with redactions. The summary, nonetheless, told how CIA officials tortured more suspects than acknowledged and in more gruesome fashion than imagined, misled Congress and the media, and jerry-rigged the program for deniability. It said that torture served no purpose other than making CIA officers feel good. We aren't allowed to know the details and the names of the victims. The evidence is concealed, and no CIA officers were indicted but at least we know why CIA officers commit crimes. They do it because they like it, and it is how they become rich and powerful and protected. John Kiriakou, the CIA officer who revealed waterboarding in 2007, was one of two CIA officers sent to prison for the Empire's post-9-11 crime spree. His crime was telling the truth. His conviction and imprisonment was a blunt warning to other CIA officers. In the underworld of organized CIA crime, omerta is the only law that matters. Epilogue Why be concerned with button men like Lawler and Simmons when mafia generals like George H. W. Bush are giving the orders? As DCI, Bush laid the groundwork for the off-the-shelf counter-terror network that facilitated the enterprise and the illegal selling of arms to Iran to finance the illegal Contra war in Nicaragua. 
he laid the basis for the global Phoenix program. As lame duck president in December 1992, Bush invaded Panama and killed hundreds of innocent people in order to kidnap former CIA asset Manuel Noriega. And he pardoned six loyal Republican officials involved in the Iran-Contra scandal in one of the greatest criminal cover-ups in history. As David Johnston said in the New York Times, Bush swept away one conviction, three guilty pleas, and two pending cases, virtually decapitating what was left of Iran-Contra prosecutor Walsh's effort, which began in 1986. He added that there was evidence of a conspiracy among the highest-ranking Reagan administration officials to lie to Congress and the American public. Bush's idiot son W. honored the family tradition of mass murder by launching the illegal war on Iraq and the global war on terror with all its horrors. Like his father, he is venerated among the ultras who profited as a result of his militancy and disdain for international law. Bruce Lawler wasn't quite that powerful, but he was influential at a decisive moment. According to the Washington Post, his boss at Homeland Security, Tom Ridge, delegated most tasks to him. The Post described Lawler as having alienated many people in the White House and in the department with a brusque and secretive manner. Perhaps Lawler was secretive because he was a CIA agent. When he left in 2003, the Post described the six-month-old Department of Homeland Security as hobbled by money woes, disorganization, turf battles, and unsteady support from the White House, and has made only halting progress toward its goals, according to administration officials and independent experts. The Post blamed Lawler for the problems, saying he at times helped lead Ridge in the wrong direction and was involved in perhaps the most bitter dispute in the department's short history. Lawler had reviewed and approved an agreement that Ridge signed with Attorney General John Ashcroft that made the Justice Department, not the DHS, the lead agency investigating the financing of terrorism. The memo enraged the Secret Service, which was required to halt hundreds of probes and forego its tradition of financial investigations. Ridge apologized, but the rift took months to heal. As a result of Lawler's actions, real power remains centered in Bush's 50-member Homeland Security Council, which is ruled by the CIA. Jerry-rigged like Phoenix, DHS lacked a political infrastructure at the top of the department. The department's roles and missions are still being defined, one official said. Lawler won't say if he accomplished his mission, stated and unstated, or even what it was. My guess is that his job was to keep the organization off balance so the CIA could step into the vacuum and assert control in its formative stage. In any event, Lawler stayed in Washington and became a Beltway bandit, capitalizing on his contacts to serve on various security-related boards and academic posts, including the Homeland Security Advisory Council. He achieved his personal ambitions, but at what price? How the DHS advanced secret CIA missions is the subject of the next chapter. Chapter 17 Homeland Security. The Phoenix comes home to roost. In the articles I wrote about Homeland Security between 2001 and 2003, I said that America has been in an ideological state of siege since 9-11, when the Twin Towers came crashing down, and all the moral and psychological prohibitions on the ultra-conservatives were lifted forever. All the anger and frustration they had nurtured during the Vietnam War and the Carter and Clinton administrations was unleashed in a torrent of warmongering. The anthrax-challenged Democrats climbed on the war wagon. On 15 September 2001, Congress, save for one glorious dissenter, gave Bush $40 billion and the authority to use all necessary and appropriate force against those who could be said to have been involved in what would remain largely uninvestigated terrorist attacks. Bush embarked on his holy crusade against Islam, but directed at Afghanistan and Iraq, not at Saudi Arabia, where his family's business partners and the majority of those officially blamed for the 9-11 attacks came from. To protect this misadventure into neocolonialism in the Middle East, Bush, on 8 October 2001, 
signed into law the Office of Homeland Security to detect, prevent, and recover from terrorist attacks and or weapons of mass destruction attacks on American soil. The Homeland Security juggernaut was born. Less than three weeks later, again with overwhelming congressional support, Bush signed the Patriot Act, vastly expanding the government's domestic intelligence gathering and law enforcement powers while rolling back individual rights and protections from government intrusions. The stigma of public accusations of his having stolen the 2000 election was replaced with a popular war of revenge against Afghanistan. Bush's approval ratings doubled in polls. In the absence of political opposition, the Bush regime's rationale for neocolonial aggression was set in stone in September 2002 with the promulgation of the National Security Strategy of the United States. Through this manifesto, the national security establishment effectively conferred upon itself the divine right to launch murderous, preemptive attacks on any Muslim nation with valuable natural resources. Russia and China were long-range strategic targets. A first-degree murder strategy may make many Americans feel safer because U.S. terror is directed at the Islamic other, but there are hidden clauses in the manifesto's fine print. As an exercise in neocolonialism disguised as protecting the American people, the eternal war on terror constantly recreates the urgent need for its existence, and by destroying the lives and livelihoods of millions of innocent people, it automatically fuels more terrorism, though within the United States itself, terror attacks are few and far between, and most of what passes for terrorism derives from FBI incitement and entrapment. Of 508 defendants prosecuted in federal terrorism-related cases in the decade after 9-11, 243 were involved with an FBI informant, while 158 were the targets of sting operations. This is to say nothing of what many people regard as false flag operations. Moreover, neocolonialism constantly fuels political dissent within the United States. There are, after all, enlightened Americans who recoil in horror at their government's aggression. But increased dissent is what the national security establishment wants. You can call it a vicious cycle or a self-fulfilled prophecy, but dissent provides the ruling elite with the pretext it needs to impose the repressive measures required to maintain and expand its political dominance. It's a win-win for the capitalists, insofar as a police state delivers a wide range of economic benefits to those who invest in its requirements. And make no mistake, homeland security is a euphemism for internal security, a term that cannot be used, along with separate but equal, because it has the nasty ring of McCarthyism and the anti-communist witch hunts of the 1950s. In this overarching sense, the war on terror and homeland security are flip sides of the same class warfare coin. It is the same voracious capitalist ideology applied to foreign and domestic policy, especially as the upper class in class warfare itself becomes a smaller and proportionately more powerful ruling elite, the omnipotent 1%, forever pitting the middle classes against the lower classes. Psychologically, the Homeland security phenomena is the culmination of the right wing's obsession to overcome the Vietnam syndrome and reassert white America's dominance not just abroad but at home. Since America's ignoble defeat in 1975, each successive act of U.S. aggression abroad and repression at home has brought the architects and participants of the Vietnam War closer to redemption. For those who participated in war crimes in Vietnam, 9-11 was a cathartic event. For their leaders, it was an apotheosis. All the crimes they were despised for committing were suddenly the magic tricks that would make them, and ambiguous America, as Trump promised, great again. The psychological warfare campaign blossomed on 9-11. The warmongers saturated the airwaves and editorial columns with propaganda calling anti-war protesters un-American, and equating them with terrorist sympathizers. The propaganda has never stopped. As it was during the Vietnam War, peace protesters and civil rights activists have become enemies of the state, and hence targets of the homeland security infrastructure. 
the bureaucratic method in their madness. High-level bureaucrats like Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld understand that political, economic, and military power is harnessed through complex organizational structures. Their staffs are packed with people like Phoenix program creator Nelson Brigham, who know exactly how to do it. After 9-11, the Ultras began implementing their long-range plans to consolidate power. Bush signed the Homeland Security Act on 25 November 2002, creating the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, to coordinate the anti-terror elements of dozens of federal agencies. The act created the Policymaking Homeland Security Council with four standing members, the President as Chairman, along with the Vice President, Secretary of Defense, and Attorney General. The Homeland Security Council is the National Security Council applied domestically. The Homeland Security Council can be understood as a grander version of the Phoenix Committee in Vietnam, which consisted of the Deputy for Cords, William Colby, as Chairman, plus the CIA's Station Chief, MACV's Assistant Chiefs of Staff for Intelligence and Operations, and the CIA Chief of Revolutionary Development. The Homeland Security apparatus further evolved in May 2003 when, as part of the White House coordinating mechanism, Bush created the Terrorist Threat Integration Center, TTIC, under future DCI John O'Brennan. Based at CIA headquarters, the TTIC was staffed by counterterrorism experts from the CIA, FBI, DOD, and DHS. It reported directly to the White House political staff beyond public and congressional scrutiny. The apparatus congealed in late 2004 when the TTIC was renamed the National Counterterrorism Center, NCTC, and placed under the newly created position of Director of National Intelligence, DNI. Operating like a global Phoenix directorate with a computerized blacklist of suspects, the NCTC has access to all military and law enforcement databases, foreign as well as domestic, which it skims for high-value targets. High-value targets are captured and incarcerated, and if possible, recruited as penetration agents at home and abroad. Failing that, they are placed on Obama's kill list and neutralized by the all-seeing Predator drone or some CIA Special Forces hit team packed with psycho killers. Instruments like the NCTC facilitate the merging of foreign and domestic counterterror operations. The NCTC collects, stores, and analyzes data on U.S. citizens from every available surveillance database as a pre-crime pacification effort. The CIA manages the NCTC Operations Center, and if a suspected threat emerges, it is able to direct every homeland component, the same way it used Phoenix to coordinate every cooperating agency in Vietnam. The network extends from the White House into America's tiniest villages and includes everyone from congresspersons and corporate executives to cops shooting black teenagers or chasing homeless veterans off the streets. Parallel Mechanisms Within the federal bureaucracy, the Department of Justice, DOJ, CIA, and military have their own separate chains of command jealously guarded parallel mechanisms that exist apart from their coordinated homeland security functions. With 800 military bases around the world, its own legal system, and a budget that devours the highest percentage of federal taxpayer dollars, the military is the elephant in the room. Apart from a mutiny by the lower ranks as happened in Vietnam, the military and its arms industry sidekicks will continue to be the driving force behind U.S. aggression abroad and mass surveillance at home. The military's NORTHCOM component is the backbone of the homeland security apparatus, alternately intimidating, assisting, and spying on its civilian counterparts. The National Security Agency, NSA, is the apparatus' eyes and ears. Instituted by Bush after 9-11, the NSA's terrorist surveillance program was ruled unconstitutional in 2006, but the lawsuit was dismissed on appeal, and a similar program called PRISM now exists in its place. 
as revealed by whistleblower Edward Snowden, PRISM collects communications from major U.S. Internet companies. The DOJ operates its back channel through the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Forces, JTTF, based in over a 100 cities and at 56 FBI field offices, these Phoenix-style coordination centers focus on upper-tier targets that cross state lines. The FBI defines the task forces on its website as small cells of highly trained, locally-based, passionately committed investigators, analysts, linguists, SWAT experts, and other specialists from dozens of U.S. law enforcement and intelligence agencies. The FBI has had internal security as its mandate since its inception, and in 1996 it launched its InfraGuard program in Cleveland. InfraGuard is a nonprofit organization serving as a public-private partnership between businesses and the FBI. It's a private sector phoenix in which business people, college presidents, state and local law enforcement agencies and other civil guardians funnel tips to the FBI to prevent hostile acts against America's critical infrastructure. It operates in secret and has over 50,000 members. The ACLU described InfraGuard as a corporate tips program and surrogate eyes and ears for the FBI. Since 2003, the DHS, under FBI supervision, has shared responsibility for InfraGuard assets. It is important to note that the FBI has no jurisdiction over the CIA, which, like the military, exists above and beyond the laws the rest of us must obey. But while the military is an elephant trampling on everyone, the CIA is the serpent in the garden. The CIA's back channel is its counterterrorism center, CTC Network. Formed in 1986, it is a direct descendant of Operation Chaos, as outlined in Chapter 11, New Games, Same Aims. The CTC network operates globally through Phoenix-style counterterrorist intelligence centers, in collaboration with the suborned military, police, and intelligence services of infected nations. The unilateral CTC network has its own communications system and is used to bypass the DOJ, State Department, and Pentagon, as well as the regular CIA bureaucracy. It has its own paramilitary special operations unit that functions like a global PRU team. The CTC works with the CIA's Crime and Narcotics Center, CNC, to manage strategic aspects of the international arms and drug trade out of drug-producing nations like Bolivia and Afghanistan. Supposedly, there is a legal firewall between the CIA and domestic law enforcement organizations, just as posse comitatus laws once banned the military. The CIA, however, infiltrates officers within the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Forces and within the DHS. I've described elsewhere how the CIA infiltrated the DEA. CIA officers are not listed on anyone's organizational charts in accordance with their status as the protected few, but they're there. For example, four months after 9-11, DCI George Tenet personally arranged with New York City's Muslim-hating Mayor Michael Bloomberg to slip senior CIA officer David Cohen inside the NYPD as its deputy commissioner for intelligence. The New York Times and Daily News dutifully buried the story. As Matt Apuzzo noted, nobody questioned the wisdom of taking someone trained to break the laws of foreign nations and putting him in a department responsible for upholding the rule of law. Nobody even checked out Cohen's hand-prepared resume, which said he had a master's degree in international relations from Boston University. The misstatement itself was inconsequential. That it went entirely unquestioned was indicative of the lack of media scrutiny Cohen could expect in his new job. An expert on Israeli methods of repressing Palestinians, Cohen launched a private Bloomberg-approved jihad against Muslims in New York City. As he explained, in the case of terrorism, to wait for an indication of crime before investigating is to wait far too long. Concepts and Programs Phoenix is the conceptual model for the DHS. 
Both are based on the principle that governments can manage societies through implicit and explicit terror. The strategic goal is to widen the gap between the elites and the mass of the citizenry while expunging anyone who cannot be ideologically assimilated. Phoenix, like the DHS, was an organization that evolved. At the top was the Phoenix Committee. Under the committee was a directorate in Saigon, managed by a senior CIA officer with a staff of CIA, military, and State Department personnel. The directorate coordinated intelligence gathering agencies and anti-terror operations in Vietnam's provinces, equivalent to states in America, and districts, counties. The DHS executive management team operates like the Phoenix Directorate, overseeing a jerry-rigged labyrinth of overlapping offices and directorates most congresspersons can't unravel. Put another way, central power is held by the senior bureaucrats who run federal agencies. The bureaucrats in Washington are held in check by the states, which as part of a republic traditionally resist federal intrusion. As a result, the bureaucrats running the DHS and their White House and congressional sponsors are constantly suborning acquisitive state legislators, governors, and business leaders with federal pork. Briefly, the DHS has a Deputy Undersecretary for Intelligence and Analysis. This deputy reports to the DHS Secretary and manages the Office of Intelligence and Analysis, I&A, which consists of about a thousand analysts, many from contributing agencies. INA coordinates intelligence with appropriate officials in state, local, tribal, and territorial governments. More importantly, it runs vast agent networks like InfraGuard with the private sector through what is called, without irony, the Homeland Security Enterprise. Complementing the Office of Intelligence is an Office of Operations Coordination and Planning, which oversees the DHS National Operations Center, NOC. The NOC collects and fuses information from the same federal, state, territorial, tribal, local, social media, and private sector agencies as I&A. The DHS Intelligence and Operations Offices work together to issue advisories and bulletins relating to perceived or provoked threats. They also organize specific but classified protective measures you have no right to know about. DHS has an Emergency Operations Center, EOC. The EOC is the culmination of decades of devolution, originally manifested as civil defense, famous for building bomb shelters and teaching grade school kids how to duck under their chairs in case the Russians nuked America, and later as the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. Absorbed within the DHS in 2003, FEMA and its predecessor outfits created continuity of government plans for press censorship and internment of suspected radicals in times of national crisis. The EOC's tentacles can be found in gentrified bomb shelters and corporate offices everywhere, secretly ingesting rumors about security risks by word of mouth and encrypted emails. The DHS has over 250,000 employees including detectives it deploys within its own departments, every agency it coordinates, and every branch of the military. These DHS employees have vast discretionary powers, including the authority to open mail coming to U.S. citizens from foreign nations whenever it's deemed necessary, another internal security measure once considered illegal. The DHS has another investigations unit that oversees international operations and intelligence functions. This unit has about 7,000 special agents operating in 200 U.S. cities and 60 countries around the world. It works with the CIA and assigns agents to the FBI's field intelligence groups through which they jointly run vast informant networks. Several DHS investigation units maintain paramilitary special response teams, which are very likely trained and managed by CIA paramilitary officers. The DHS has its very own counterterrorism unit and a war crimes unit that assiduously avoids the CIA. When an Italian court indicted a group of CIA officers for kidnapping an innocent man in Milan and sending him to Egypt to be tortured, 
DHS agents looked away. Like FBI agents, DHS agents have no authority over the CIA, which is free to terrorize anyone, anywhere. Last but not least, the DHS has fusion centers which operate in every state and major city, just like Phoenix Intelligence and Operations Coordinating Centers were set up in Vietnam. Every law enforcement entity in a state or city sends a representative to the local fusion center, which tries to anticipate threats through analysis of shared intelligence. State and local police provide space and resources, including snitches, for the majority of the fusion centers. There is even a fusion center in Mexico City. The ACLU compared fusion centers with the corporate TIPS program because of the involvement of private terrorism liaison officers, TLO. A TLO is a citizen trained to detect and report suspicious activities. TLOs function like the People's Intelligence Organization cadres mentioned in Chapter 16, paying close attention to what customers, passers-by, and neighbors say, and then reporting suspicious utterances, or when bored or nervous, inventing them for entry into the proper database. By 2014, California had more than 14,000 TLOs. Some are cops, others are wannabe cops, paramedics, utility workers, railroad employees, etc. TLOs have been used to monitor Occupy Wall Street and Black Lives Matter protests and activists. Fusion Center employees occupy themselves by playing video war games and fantasizing about being armor-clad superheroes. When bored, they target political activists and despised minorities. The Missouri Fusion Center targeted supporters of Ron Paul, pro-life activists, and so-called conspiracy theorists. Anti-war activists and Islamic lobby groups were targeted in Texas. A DHS analyst in Wisconsin targeted anti-abortion activists. A Pennsylvania DHS contractor spied on environmental activists and a Second Amendment rally. The Maryland State Police put anti-death penalty and anti-war activists in the FBI's database, and in 2009, the Virginia Fusion Center published a terrorism threat assessment identifying historically black colleges as potential hubs for terror-related activity. It also identified hacktivism as a form of terrorism. Along with the FBI's task forces, fusion centers serve as cover for domestic CIA operations. This is nothing new, as the CIA has always placed officers inside state police forces and the special services, a.k.a. Red Squad units of police forces in major cities. CIA chaos-style officers specialize in the recruitment of American citizens who travel abroad, as well as foreign students, diplomats, scientists, and business people willing to sell out their countries for an SUV or a pat on the back. Homeland Security as Implicit Terrorism Ultimately, the DHS is about protecting the haves from the have-nots. Just like Phoenix coordinators were protecting large landowners from VCI revolutionaries fighting for agrarian reform. It is the problem of supporting personalities rather than democratic institutions, Colonel Stan Fulcher explained when we spoke in 1987. The Vietnamese were victims of our corruption. We smothered them with money. It's the same thing you see in Central America today. You can't take a Salvadoran colonel in a patron army without the corruption he brings along. The billions of dollars pouring from your paychecks into the DHS internal security boondoggle are smothering America in corruption, too. Given the dearth of actual terrorist acts in America, the Homeland Security Enterprise exists primarily to protect critical infrastructure assets in the private sector from disenfranchised citizens seeking justice and accountability from government and corporations. In this capitalist sense... DHS is the key component in the state-sponsored legal criminality Johann Galtung spoke about. Personal violence is for the amateur in dominance, Galtung said. Structural violence is the tool of the professional. The amateur who wants to dominate uses guns. The professional uses social structure. The legal criminality of the social system and its institutions, of government and of individuals at the interpersonal level, is tacit violence. 
Structural violence is a structure of exploitation and social injustice. Indeed, the stated goal of the Homeland Security Enterprise is the protection of critical infrastructure assets in the public and private sectors, not the protection of people. To that end, the DHS assigns intelligence officers and protective security advisors to fusion centers. This operation is run out of the DHS National Protection and Programs Directorate and focuses on physical, concrete blocks around buildings and cyber security. Given that your chance of being killed by a terrorist is less than dying from a bee sting, this joint business venture has achieved nothing in terms of saving lives. Instead, fusion centers and their DHS managers function as political police enforcing the ultra-conservative, freewheeling capitalist ideology that drives corporate America. In advancing this ideology, DHS managers seek to promote public support for, and indeed reverence toward, cops, soldiers, and the Homeland Security enterprise. They also generate the attendant apprehension within the general public that persons with contrarian views are suspect. You can count on DHS cadres not to support the constitutional right of anyone, like pro football player Colin Kaepernick, who refuses to stand during the national anthem. Like the Phoenix program it was modeled on, the DHS helps coordinate the systematic corruption and repression of grassroots American society on behalf of the rich political elite. Consider this. The act that created the DHS stripped 180,000 government employees of their union rights because there might be an emergency. On behalf of its private sector patrons, Congress eliminated civil service and labor protections for DHS employees who can be reassigned or dismissed without notifying their union representatives. Emboldened by Congress, DHS executive management sought the power to override any provision in a union contract, but for some reason the federal courts blocked that attempt at union busting. The key stakeholders in the enterprise are the owners of the private businesses that comprise the critical infrastructure of the national security establishment, anything related to war and law enforcement. Their intellectual partners occupy vastly overpaid management positions in elite law firms, hospitals, universities, non-governmental organizations, and non-profit groups looking to advance their careers while eliminating the competition. What CIA officer Lucien Conin said to me about Phoenix applies to Homeland Security. It's a great blackmail scheme for the central government. If you don't do what I want, you're VC. This is what Homeland Security has become, a protection racket. At the strategic political level, it consists of bankers and corporate lobbyists paying elected officials to create tax loopholes for the rich, blanket domestic surveillance that compels working people to live in terror of being fired if they make suspicious utterances, and corrupt officials rewarding their arms industry contributors by laundering taxpayer dollars into the war machine. For stakeholders in the national security establishment, the enterprise is the biggest boondoggle ever, and not just for the lavish public spending devoted to their military defense projects. It is a dream come true for their cadres, too. People like Bruce Lawler and Rob Simmons, see chapters 15 and 16, who sold their souls to the CIA's cult of death and also understand the arcane mechanics of internal security. Remember, the CIA believed that the U.S. could win the Vietnam War through military force. But the communists represented the interests of the people, and for this reason, the people sided with them. In response, operators like Lawler, Simmons, and Frank Scotton recruited spies to map out the VCI's organization and then targeted its upper-tier leaders for neutralization. In the process of going after the enemy's political leadership, they terrorized the leadership's friends and families and supporters as well. The lower tier they sought to pacify through psychological warfare. The same pattern is unfolding in America. Homeland Security cadres, through the DHS and the various parallel mechanisms, are identifying and targeting the national security establishment's political and administrative opponents in America for neutralization, 
For upper-tier dissidents, it means being the target of compromise and discreditation campaigns launched by ultras, often through deniable assets like the Association of Former Intelligence Officers, AFIO, and other swift boat-style organizations. Since the creation of the Homeland Security Protection Racket, over eight trillion taxpayer dollars has been moved from social programs into internal security programs that have provided the national security establishment with over 250,000 cadres to pacify the flag-waving American public. For the average American, this means eternal debt and subservience as their tax dollars are given to their protectors. The psychological warfare aspect of the pacification program is handled by Network News and Hollywood, which erase historical memory and with it any moral imperative on the part of average Americans to pretend they don't live in segregated communities. All that matters is dominance over some other, and anyone can dominate others by becoming a spy for homeland security. The methods for doing so are as ancient as language and the myth of Kronos overthrowing Uranus. Since the dawn of civilization, effete old men have created gods and religions to organize young men into warrior clans. They indoctrinate the youths with patriotic slogans, make them feel special, and then send them to rape and pillage their neighbors. Organizing society in this fashion protects the old men and their wives and wealth and power from those young men who have the urge to kill them and take everything they own. Within America, cops are organized and indoctrinated to function like a warrior clan that uses explicit violence to pacify the public. They execute teenagers for wearing baggy pants or casting disrespectful looks at them while they're on safari in black communities. They shower tear gas and rubber bullets on heretical white anti-war protesters and then happily rough them up during arrest. Everyone knows the cops will never be punished for excessive use of explicit force, and therein lies the power of implicit terror. Cops enforce the law. They do not obey it. DHS cadres in Mufti serve the same armed propaganda purpose. They understand that terror, whether explicit or implicit, is an organizing principle of society. Many are veterans who learned pacification techniques while conducting the house-to-house -house searches that turned Afghanistan and Iraq into human catastrophes unreported in the U.S. press. They even refer to themselves as door-kickers. Their managers take a broader view and study the collective terror Israel dishes out to crush the Palestinian soul. At the highest levels of government, they wage the feudalistic economic warfare sieges that drive entire nations into poverty. Madeleine Albright, as U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, acknowledged that U.S. sanctions on Iraq had led to the death of half a million children. We think the price is worth it, she said. Our monstrous rulers know how to justify their disastrous interventions by demonizing foreign leaders in the media. If fear of straw dogs like Saddam or Gaddafi or Kim doesn't win the hearts and minds of American citizens— they issue color-coded warnings of attacks that never occur. Network News reports that behind the scenes, without your knowledge, secret agents saved the day. As Guy Debord famously said, yet the highest ambition of the integrated spectacle is still to turn secret agents into revolutionaries and revolutionaries into secret agents. The Homeland Security cadres are expert in implicit as well as explicit terror of jack-booted guardsmen eyeballing travelers in airports, and keystone cops hanging onto armored vehicles, buffed up in bulletproof vests and swinging machine guns, while searching cars and homes without probable cause in an entire city on lockdown after the Boston Marathon bombing, or after some deranged white kid on Prozac slaughters his suburban classmates. Earlier I mentioned the manipulation of social forces to quell the type of protests Colin Kaepernick initiated when he refused to stand for the national anthem. The same phenomena occurred in July 2016, when police arrested people for criticizing cops on Facebook and Twitter after the shooting of Dallas cops. In a similar assault on constitutional rights, the chair of the Oklahoma's Political Safety Committee introduced the bill that would make it unlawful to wear a mask, hood, or covering during the commission of a crime or to intentionally conceal a person's identity in a public place.
The message is clear to the friends and families of the targeted and arrested people. You are free, up to the point you actually express your freedoms. The purpose of such psyops is to make you believe the authorities know everything about you and will use that information to destroy you. To that end, they have established in America the four programs that imbued the all-seeing phoenix with omnipotence. Surveillance and informant networks that identify suspects, interrogation centers that torture them, counter-terror teams that kidnap and kill them, and administrative detention laws that make it all possible. The domestic version of the CIA's Hamlet informant program in Vietnam began when Bush's Attorney General John Ashcroft laid the groundwork for the Terrorism Information Program, TIP. Check it out online to see its many features of mass surveillance. The counter-terror teams created in Vietnam have been perfected and expanded. Military veterans populate DHS and police SWAT teams. Many of these vets can't wait to relive their heroic experiences, rousting Muslim families in their homes in Iraq and Afghanistan. The PIC program is the model for the network of black sites, detention centers, prisons, and jails America builds in every nation it occupies. At the Guantanamo facility in Cuba, the CIA has perfected torture and now punishes suspects by slowly driving them insane. Same thing here. The DHS operates detention centers for illegal immigrants, but not their employers. Empty detention centers on military reservations await the sort of national crisis the CIA routinely provokes overseas to justify military intervention, at which point thousands of citizen suspects on dozens of blacklists shall be rounded up and interned. Administrative detention is the legal nail upon which the pacification of America hangs. In Vietnam, suspects were carted between interrogation centers, detention centers, and jails, until they confessed, died, or defected. Survivors were sent to a military tribunal or a CIA-advised Stalinist Security Committee for disposition. For high-value convicts, that meant imprisonment on Khan Son Island, 90 miles off the southern tip of South Vietnam. Khan Son, with its tiger cages, was the model for Gitmo. In September 1969, the CIA formed the Central Security Committee, CSC, in Saigon, to dispose of citizens arrested under the administrative detention laws. The Central Security Committee was chaired by the Prime Minister and included the Director of Corrections, the Director General of the National Police, and five prison wardens. It reviewed cases of communist offenders considered for conditional or early release. Unless a substantial bribe was paid, the committee always recommended further detention. It is noteworthy that the National Assembly tried to abolish the CSC in December 1970 without success. If you don't think it can happen here, think again. Donald Bordenkircher headed the court's prison system in Vietnam and served as chief advisor to the director of corrections. Bordenkircher began his career in 1957 as a correctional officer at San Quentin State Prison. By 1967, he was an assistant warden. Recruited that year by the Agency for International Development's Office of Public Safety, a frequent cover for the CIA, he spent five years improving conditions in Vietnam's prisons and jails. We were doing a magnificent job with the prisoners and the rest of the war, he claimed. The problem, he said, was that liberal politicians in Washington handcuffed the military. After Bush invaded Iraq, Bordenkircher, at age 69, volunteered to help bring that benighted nation under American rule. As with many Vietnam veterans, he was dying to win one. He became a contractor with the Department of Justice and, as National Director of Operations for all prisons in Iraq, got the job of shutting down Abu Ghraib. I was in charge of a team that went into the prison often, he said. After reading and looking at everything and talking to a hell of a lot of people, I came to the conclusion there wasn't a lot of brutality caused by American troops, said Abu Ghraib. Today, the penal system in America resembles the prison regimes it imposed upon Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. The same jailers with the same ultra-attitudes are in charge here, and they are doing well. Like the war on terror, incarceration is a growth industry. Since Nixon declared war on drugs in 1970, 
the prison population has grown from several hundred thousand to several million, mostly blacks. According to the ACLU, one in 31 adults is in prison or jail on parole or probation. With only 5% of the world's population, America has 25% of the world's prison population. Ask yourself, how can we be the land of the free and simultaneously the world's largest jailer with its highest per capita incarceration rate? Private as well as publicly owned prisons are a cornerstone of the critical infrastructure industry of domestic repression, as well as a boundless source of wealth for investors in the legally criminal homeland security apparatus. Seen from this pro-business perspective, administrative detention is the growth industry of the future. Along with the plea bargain boondoggle, it is how the national security establishment will keep jails packed with people who aren't guilty of any crime. For a glimpse into the future, look at Israel, which has had a leading role in teaching Americans how to do it. Their administrative detention makes it okay to round up civilians, detain and torture them indefinitely, destroy their homes with bulldozers, cast them to the four winds, and steal everything they own simply because they are Palestinians. Being a stateless Palestinian is a crime of status. In America, being a pacifist is a crime of status. The key is loosely defining what a terrorist suspect is. The Patriot, Homeland Security, and Domestic Security Enhancement Acts set in place the elements of administration detention. Americans captured on foreign soil, like John Lind, or said to be involved in terrorist activities overseas, can be held indefinitely in a military prison and denied access to lawyers and family members. No federal court can review the reason for the detention. They can be executed if found guilty by the president. Meanwhile, America's version of the Central Security Committee at Guantanamo Bay is still conducting secret Stalinist tribunals in 2016, seven years after Obama bragged in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech that he had ordered the facility closed. Detention laws apply domestically, too. To say nothing of having the same name, if you even resemble someone on the no-fly list, you can be detained. DHS routinely detains suspects without charge or having to disclose their names or location. DHS agents posing as cops can punish protesters and coerce them into becoming informants by holding them indefinitely as material witnesses when there is no basis to charge them with a crime. Secret subpoenas used by DHS to obtain information can't be refused or disclosed, making it impossible to defend against false charges. People arrested for unknown crimes uncovered as a result of secret surveillance are not entitled to judicial review of the warrant or the evidence obtained as a result. Detentions, evidence, trials, deportations, and executions are now conducted in secret. Administrative detention is structural violence for the professionals. It works in tandem with informant and surveillance programs that identify terrorist surrogates at the grassroots level of society. In this manner, the jerry-rigged justice system, always biased against the poor, becomes the ultimate form of ultra-terrorism. It is the greatest blackmail scheme ever invented. If you didn't do what the homeland gangsters want, your name appears on the blacklist, and into the black hole you go. Check out what happened to Jose Padilla. Political and Psychological Warfare Capitalism is America's ideology, and business its dominant party, controlling both political parties. Its Democratic wing works with labor's management class and has been responsible for some of the recent key anti-labor policies, such as offshoring. The Republican wing always supports business over labor, landlords over renters. The business party's strategic goal is the political control of people at home and abroad, and the subsequent acquisition of their property, wealth, and resources, through the centralization of power in multinational corporations and giant financial institutions exempt from anyone's laws, as well as through psychological operations. Myths about democracy are used along with Rotary Club-style front organizations to disguise the business party infrastructure in America, just as they were in Vietnam, 
where the only rule of the PSYOPs game was post your own score. Blessed with limitless resources and using sales techniques perfected by its private sector instructors in the advertising industry, the Americans distributed millions of leaflets stressing traditional Confucian values of obedience to authority while portraying the communists as a socially disruptive force that must be eliminated, the way Rudy Giuliani stigmatizes Black Lives Matter. But the Americans were out of touch with the reality of life in rural villages and could only reach the people through media like leaflets. And while Americans relied on cartoon books to sell democracy and free enterprise to a largely illiterate people, VCI cadres went from person to person, talking into ears, connecting on a human level. Unable to sell its product through media, the CIA resorted to coercion and drastically expanded the Hamlet informant program. Village chiefs were instructed to conduct classes on government ideology for villagers with revolutionary thoughts or relatives who had them. Attendance was mandatory. There was a one-week course with extensions for problem individuals. Daycare and lunch were made available in vacated homes. Creating defectors was emphasized, counseling was provided, and the populace was encouraged to report the activities of the VCI by dropping a note addressed to the police in local mailboxes. This method was credited with approximately 40% of the information used in Phoenix operations in one province. PSYOPs in support of Phoenix proved to be such a potent weapon in the attack on the VCI that in August 1970, the Pentagon's Special Assistant for Counterinsurgency and Special Activities described Phoenix as the number one MACV PSYOPs priority. At the same time, Congressional investigators revealed that the CIA used the Phoenix program as an instrument of mass political murder to neutralize politicians and activists who opposed the puppet regime or espoused peace. Five years later, the Church Committee revealed the extent of the FBI's similar attempts to suppress the Communist Party in the United States, which it claimed controlled the anti-war and civil rights movements. The FBI used the same kind of illegal operations Phoenix used in Vietnam, spreading lies and using forged documents to break up marriages and otherwise harass people into submission. FBI agents were able to persuade college administrators to prevent dissidents from giving public addresses. There was no evidence that any of them were Soviet agents fomenting armed rebellion. It was their ideas about a just society the FBI was trying to stamp out, along with the First Amendment. The military was at the forefront of the repression of the anti-war movement and is leading the charge again. As noted in Chapter 4, Sid Tao was a lieutenant with the 116th MIG in Washington, D.C. in 1970. As chief of a counterintelligence team, Tao investigated the anti-war activities of Army personnel and conducted offensive counterintelligence operations in the nation's capital. One job was disrupting anti-war demonstrations by building bonfires and inciting people to riot so the Capitol Police could be called in to bash heads. As Ed Murphy recalled in the same chapter, the 116th MIG targeted specific leaders of the anti-war movement. Photos of the targets were posted at headquarters. That's what DHS agents are prepared to do in the U.S. And with advances in technology and 40 years to learn from mistakes, Political neutralizations are easier than ever. Consider the anthrax letters mailed to Democratic senators after 9-11, now recognized as an inside job. It took only a few black propaganda terror operations to silence the political opposition's leadership and its resistance to the Patriot Act. Information management, including official secrecy and false accusations, is the key to pacifying the people through implicit terror while making the internal security apparatus appear legal, moral, and popular. This is being done against American citizens through the most ambitious Psywar campaign ever waged on planet Earth. Another essential ingredient of psychological warfare is properly indoctrinating and organizing political cadres. As Michael Ledeen, former employee of the Pentagon, the State Department, and the National Security Council, and involved in the transfer of arms to Iran during the Iran-Contra affair, stated in the days after 9-11,
New times require new people, with the willpower to stamp out the corrupt habits of mind manifest in the thoughts or actions of anyone who can't be assimilated into the business party or opposes its aggression disguised as the war on terror. The military has a lot of experience training political cadres. Soldiers slated to participate in Phoenix were given the CIA's patented motivational indoctrination course at Fort Bragg. They were the first political cadres to infiltrate the American military. In return for adopting the business party line and violating the laws of warfare by targeting civilians, a successful career was guaranteed. As noted, several CIA and military Phoenix veterans have held important DHS posts. The first chief of DHS counter-narcotic operations, CIA officer Roger Mackin, ran special police operations in Da Nang. At Fort Bragg, CIA Psywar experts taught Phoenix advisors how to wage political warfare. In the early 1980s, CIA officer Duane Claridge had the training manual translated into Spanish and reprinted for use in the Reagan regime's illegal Contra war. Titled Psychological Operations in Guerrilla Warfare, it stated that the human being should be considered the priority objective in a political war. And conceived as the military target of guerrilla war, the human being has his most critical point in his mind. Once his mind has been reached, the political animal has been defeated without necessarily receiving bullets. DHS cadres pass through the same motivational indoctrination courses before they hit the streets. DHS cadres in turn instruct civilian critical infrastructure personnel on how to spy and report on colleagues who serve as terrorist surrogates by even inadvertently revealing information on infrastructure vulnerabilities. DHS spies monitor private sector terror suspects until it comes time to expose them in the media as being under investigation. The most intimate details of a person's private life, all of which are known through blanket surveillance, become his or her greatest liability extramarital affairs, medical marijuana use, or mental health care are revealed, leading to a target being neutralized. In the absence of vulnerabilities, the CIA's dark army of computer hackers can create them. Through highly refined motivational indoctrination methods, complacent Americans are converted into Ladeen's new people who idolize the CIA, FBI, NSA, and DHS. People who aren't DHS cadres but wish to serve the ultra cause join front organizations like the Citizen Corps or the Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation or Community Emergency Response Teams. The ever-popular Neighborhood Watch Program supplies overly aggressive cops at fusion centers with the false rumors they need to detain activists as terrorist surrogates. The Medical Reserve Corps gives overpaid doctors working in hospital emergency rooms the chance to identify suspects among the masses of poor people falling through the safety net at the bottom of the jerry-rigged health care system. The pressure to join the new legions is irresistible. When Bush announced the DHS on 6 June 2002, he stressed that its primary mission was to mobilize and focus the American people to accomplish the mission of attacking the enemy where he hides and plans, by which he meant having Ladin's new people root out the enemy within, just as the CIA roots out insurgents in the colonies. The most highly motivated cadres are trained in techniques of persuasion over control of target groups, as outlined in psychological operations in guerrilla warfare. In the next national emergency, these cadres will be mobilized, attend mass meetings, carry placards, shout the proper slogans, and, if necessary, grab ropes and form lynch mobs. Theoretically, only 5% of the population needs to be organized in this fashion in order to wield control over the indifferent 90% and defeat the 5% that form the resistance. Waging this type of psi war is the maximum danger posed by the homeland security apparatus. Blackmail is the key. Hundreds of businesses and institutions across the country have already been placed on the consolidated terrorist watch list.
One Bush official said that merely being on the list could destroy the livelihood of all those organizations without a bomb being thrown or a spore of anthrax being released. Blacklists abound. The tip-off blacklist, the no-fly blacklist, the CAPS-2 blacklist, which uses credit card information and secret databases to assess a person's security risk level, and local blacklists like the one kept by the Denver Police Department and the secret ones you don't know about. Initially, the proliferation of blacklists had the leaders of many federal departments and agencies scrambling to figure out how they could influence Homeland Security without appearing disloyal. Writing for USA Today in 2002, James Bamford cited a Knight Ritter report saying that a growing number of military officers, intelligence professionals, and diplomats privately charge that the administration squelches dissenting views and that intelligence analysts are under intense pressure to produce reports supporting the White House's argument that Saddam poses such an immediate threat to the United States that preemptive military action is necessary. If a dissident or resistant bureaucrat has no past indiscretions, forged documents are used. One political opponent jailed in Vietnam by President Thieu revealed the existence of a systematic campaign of vilification by use of forged documents. Forged documents used to justify false arrests or conceal illegal operations often emerged as captured documents. A legislative aide working for the Senate committee investigating Phoenix in 1970, Riley observed that there seems to be captured documents to prove any point or to support retrospectively almost any conclusion. If what's past is prologue, in the forthcoming national emergency, the paranoia that currently infects the Muslim American community will spread nationwide until no one is sure who is a spy for the thought police. Midnight arrests and disappearances into detention centers will be commonplace, as the definition of a terrorist surrogate expands to include people deemed dangerous to the public order. As Ambassador Ellsworth Bunker wrote in 1972 about a secret emergency decree issued by the GVN, this means that virtually any person arrested can now be held on criminal instead of political charges. No specific charge is required. A DHS spy will accuse his neighbor, the one whose dog poops on his lawn, of disturbing the public order. Off the unlucky fellow goes into the local Gitmo. Last but not least, the crime of sedition will be resurrected and expanded to include disseminating information about government corruption and undermining the will of the state by challenging its authority. Calling for civil disobedience will be equated with threatening homeland security. Cadres in the Office of Cyberspace Security will expose you as a terrorist surrogate for sending sarcastic or satirical emails blaming Bush and Israel for 9-11. In the absence of actual utterances, cadres will manufacture them. Don't laugh. Anti-terror legislation passed by Congress allows for secret searches of the homes of people who meet the nebulous criteria of suspected terrorist. Because these secret searches violate the Fourth Amendment, the government is devising new tools that ease administrative burdens. Remember, CIA legal experts argued that Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions applies only to sentencing for crimes and does not prohibit a state from interning civilians or subjecting them to emergency detention when such measures are necessary for the security or safety of the state. In this way, indefinite detention, torture, and summary execution all carried out without previous judgment pronounced by a regularly constituted court, are perfectly legal in the criminal homeland security state because they result from administrative procedures. This is Phoenix, and this is what the national security establishment has in store for America. Part 4. Manufacturing Complicity. Shaping the American Worldview. All experts serve the state and the media, and only in that way do they achieve their status. Every expert follows his master, for all former possibilities for independence have been gradually reduced to nil by present society's mode of organization. 
The most useful expert, of course, is the one who can lie. With their different motives, those who need experts are falsifiers and fools. Whenever individuals lose the capacity to see things for themselves, the expert is there to offer an absolute reassurance. Guy Debord comments on the Society of the Spectacle. Chapter 18. Fragging Bob Carey, the CIA, and the Need for a War Crimes Tribunal. This chapter is a compilation of two articles. One was published in December 2003 and titled Preemptive Manhunting, the CIA's New Assassination Program, in response to an article by Seymour Hirsch titled Moving Targets, Will the Counterinsurgency Plan in Iraq Repeat the Mistakes of Vietnam? The other article, written two and a half years earlier, was titled Fragging Bob Carey, CIA War Crimes and the Need for a War Crimes Trial. It tells how former Senator Carey led a team of Navy SEALs into a village in Vietnam and murdered 20 women and children in 1969. He lied about the operation and said the team killed 21 VC. He was given a medal as a reward. Kerry's career took off as a result of that war crime and cover-up. He moved from one important public sector job to another until May 2016, when he was appointed chair of the Board of Trustees of the Fulbright University in Vietnam. One can only imagine what J. William Fulbright would have thought of that supreme act of arrogance. As Mark Ashwell has observed, as Fulbright said in his book, The Arrogance of Power, one simply cannot engage in barbarous action without becoming a barbarian. One cannot defend human values by calculated and unprovoked violence without doing mortal damage to the values one is trying to defend. The American media reacted as expected, with non-judgmental accounts about the irony of appointing a mass murderer of Vietnamese to head a Vietnamese institution. Featured in most accounts were the comments of Vietnamese who supported the decision. But what if the tables were turned? If the government of Vietnam sent a former revolutionary, known to have murdered American women and children, to head a Vietnamese university in America— the media would have flipped out and called for the renewed bombing of Hanoi. The hypocrisy of the American media is a wonder to behold. In my 2001 article about Kerry, I argued that the CIA, which instigated the raid on Tan Phong, should be tried for its policy of waging war crimes in Vietnam. I am still hoping that will happen, especially since 9-11 and the resulting CIA horrors, many of which have been carefully documented. The only difference is that I would now put the media in the dock, too. Seymour Hersh's December 2003 article is an example of how the mainstream media dissembles when it can no longer conceal evidence that political assassinations are official U.S. policy. In his article, Hersh revealed a new special forces operation in Iraq called preemptive manhunting. He compared the operation to Phoenix and noted that the new civilian assistant secretary for special operations in the Pentagon is Thomas O'Connell, an Army veteran who served in the Phoenix program in Vietnam and who in the early 80s ran Gray Fox, the Army's secret commando unit. An article by Julian Borger, published the same day as Hirsch's, 8 December 2003, dealt with the same subject, minus the sensational rhetoric. As Borger noted, and as the New York Times had reported a month earlier, Task Force 121 was the name of the unit conducting the Phoenix-style operation in Iraq. Trained by Israeli commandos, Task Force 121 was originally designed to capture and assassinate high-value targets within Saddam Hussein's Ba'athist party. However, the targeted Ba'athists tried to hide among family, friends, and supporters— and soon Task Force 121 death squads were kicking down the doors to private homes, and, as Hirsch correctly observed, killing everyone within the broad middle of the Ba'athist underground. A CIA officer, Frank Snepp, had written 40 years earlier, the Phoenix strike teams opted for a scattershot approach, picking up anyone who might be a suspect, and eventually, when the jails were packed to overflowing, they began simply taking the law, such as it was, into their own hands. 
Hirsch's article was billed as news, but it wasn't. CIA commandos had been in Iraq since 2002, preparing rebel Kurdish forces to guide the task forces that followed in 2003. These earlier CIA units assembled the blacklists that Task Force 121 later used to target Saddam and his senior staff. The military called this earlier adventure decapitation and credited it with degrading the Iraqi army's ability to resist the U.S. invasion. Prior to the invasion, CIA officers also squeezed key Iraqi army officers and civil officials into defecting and spreading CIA-scripted black propaganda in widely dispersed articles like the one Chris Hedges wrote for the New York Times on 8 November 2001, titled, Defectors Cite Iraqi Training for Terrorism. Likewise, characterizing Phoenix as a special forces assassination program is a half-truth at best, akin to saying that baseball is only about throwing a ball without mentioning the fielding and hitting. The CIA managed the entirety of the multifaceted Phoenix program, just as it manages every task force sent into Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, etc. Some prominent left journalists have spread the fiction that the military is in charge, hopefully out of stupidity. Special Forces units participated in Phoenix operations, yes, but as I'll show in this chapter, as one of the many elements the program coordinated, and always under the supervision of senior CIA officers. Phoenix operations ranged from small units on snatch and snuff missions to Milai style cordon and search operations involving hundreds of American and Vietnamese soldiers, special police officials, and psychological warfare, Psywar teams. In their pursuit of communist political cadres, senior Phoenix officials conducted operations in Cambodia, Laos, and North Vietnam, as well as in South Vietnam. As Colonel Douglas Dillard revealed to me, they even had the authority to call in massive airstrikes. From mid-1968 until mid-1969, Dillard, under the guidance of Jim Ward, the CIA's region officer in charge, coordinated Phoenix operations in the Delta region of South Vietnam. Dillard told me that he and Ward had the authority to call in B-52 strikes on targeted groups and individuals. The idea was that if we knew their pattern, and if we could put the fear of God in them, then we could influence their movements, so they could never assemble as a battalion, Dillard explained. We continued to try to do that from the summer of 1968 on, and we started getting in some pretty good defectors because of that pressure. Uh, the overall coordination was working. Indeed, and this is important in understanding Bob Carey's mission, coordination at every level of the Phoenix program was absolutely essential. For example, the CIA could not run a small unit operation in enemy territory without first consulting its military associates, because, as Dillard put it, it's conceivable that the operations people have scheduled a B-52 strike in that area. In a thesis he wrote for Air University in 1974, titled The Future Applicability of the Phoenix Program, CIA officer Warren Milberg described a typical Phoenix operation involving several U.S. Army infantry companies. The operation was conducted in the village of Tuang Tsa in Quang Tri province in early 1968. As Milberg noted, Tuang Tsa had served as a staging area for the Viet Minh in the First Indochina War, and its inhabitants still supported the communists. However, According to Milberg, the villagers' support for the communists had been coerced through atrocities and armed propaganda, and therefore the Americans had no choice but to save the villagers from themselves. The decision to conduct a Phoenix operation of massive proportions against Tuang Tsa was made by the Province Security Council at the direction of Milberg's boss, Bob Brewer, the CIA's province officer in charge. Brewer functioned like a warlord, and once permission was granted, only the barest essential information was given to the various Vietnamese agencies in Quang Tri, Milberg wrote. Cutting out the Vietnamese was designed to prevent local officials on the VC payroll from interfering with the planning process. To further ensure security, 
The actual name of the targeted village was not released to the Vietnamese until the day before the operation. In preparing the Thuong Tsa operation, information from South Vietnamese police special branch informers, along with information from Province Interrogation Center, PIC, reports, was fed into the Phoenix program's newly established District Intelligence and Operations Coordinating Centers, DIOCCs, near Thuong Tsa. A blacklist of suspected VCI was compiled in Quang Tri's Province Intelligence and Operations Coordination Center, PIOCC, and then cross-checked against Master Phoenix lists at the Phoenix Directorate in Saigon to ensure that high-level CIA penetration agents were protected. Before the operation, Provincial Reconnaissance Unit, PRU teams, advised by U.S. Marines detached to the CIA, were sent to locate and surveil targeted communist cadres known as members of the Viet Cong Infrastructure, VCI. Escape routes were studied for ambush sites, and local U.S. Army and Marine units were conscripted to act as a blocking force to seal off the village, just as happened at My Lai on 16 March 1968. At dawn on the day of the Phoenix operation in Tuang Tsa, U.S. military aircraft dropped thousands of Psi War leaflets on the village, urging the targeted VCI to surrender and offering rewards to defectors and informers. All that happened at Milai, too. None of the villagers took advantage of the deal. Instead, the residents braced for the shock. In the early morning hours, the PRU counter-terror teams, accompanied by special branch interrogators and CIA advisors like Milberg, started searching people's homes for weapons, documents, food caches, and VCI suspects. As Milberg noted, the special police and its CIA advisors compared the names and descriptions on the blacklists with every man, woman, and child in Tuang Tsa. Suspects were sent to screening zones where they were interrogated, while people identified as innocent bystanders were fed and entertained by R.D. Cadre Psi War teams. The VCI, meanwhile, were driven into the northeast corner of town, where they were killed or captured as they tried to escape through Milberg's Ring of Steel. The result was two VCI captured. One was the district party chief, the other was the chief of the local National Liberation Front Farmers Association. Both were sent to the CIA's brutal interrogation center in Da Nang. Eight other targeted VCI were killed or escaped. Two Psi War teams stayed behind to assert the puppet government's presence. But within a month, they were driven out of town and Tuang Tsa reverted to communist control. As a result of such costly failures, which depleted resources without producing spectacular body counts, the CIA turned to small, unilateral operations like the one Bob Kerry conducted. The military initially resisted on moral and legal grounds. General Bruce Palmer, commander of the 9th Infantry Division in the Mekong Delta, objected to the involuntary assignment of American soldiers to Phoenix. He did not believe that people in uniform who are pledged to abide by the Geneva Conventions should be put in the position of having to break those laws of warfare. Despite the hesitancy of conventional military commanders, U.S. Special Forces, including Navy SEALs, have no compunctions about killing civilians. As Frank Snap noted, as mentioned above, small unit Phoenix operations proliferated and took the law such as it was into their own hands. They also proved to be the most efficient way of waging a counterinsurgency. Today, under CIA guidance and coordination, U.S. Special Forces and the military's legion of unaccountable mercenary contractors have become the de facto policemen of the American empire and each branch of the military has created its own commandos to conduct such extra-legal operations. It's the new wave. But counter-subversion is a police responsibility, and as the American agency mandated to work with foreign special police forces, the CIA will always manage Phoenix-style assassination programs, with the military providing the manpower to staff them in America's colonies around the world blaming the victim. To his credit, Seymour Hirsch was correct when he said the original moving targets were members of the Ba'ath Party. 
but he studiously avoided putting either the Vietnam War or the Iraq War in its proper context. He ignored the overarching fact that the CIA's assassination programs in Iraq and Vietnam were both illegal precisely because they targeted civilians. He didn't mention the network of CIA interrogation centers and special police informant programs upon which pacification depends. Nor did he mention that American war managers, through administrative detention laws, denied targeted Iraqi and Vietnamese civilians due process in their own country as part of the Phoenix model the CIA applies in every nation the U.S. conquers and corrupts. Hirsch did focus on the problems caused by faulty information, but he omitted a significant gory detail, that based on the word of an anonymous informant, Ba'ath Party members who had never harmed a single American were detained indefinitely and tortured until they confessed or became double agents, spreading CIA propaganda. Instead, Hirsch focused on soldiers who escaped the dragnet. He did not accuse U.S. Commander Stanley McChrystal of systematic war crimes related to the political cleansing that preceded the reconstruction of Iraq, nor did he call the task force hit teams death squads or name the war criminals who ran the murder machine at McChrystal's headquarters 50 miles north of Baghdad. Something else Hirsch failed to mention. Anyone who resisted the American invasion was put on the CIA's hit list, not just former Ba'ath Party members. Nor was the murder of those people a mistake arising from faulty intelligence, as Hirsch suggested. It was and is policy. As the CIA learned in Vietnam, killing specific targets doesn't terrorize an entire population into submission. Only indiscriminate mass murder can achieve that ghastly goal. Phoenix, according to Hirsch, was on everyone's minds in late 2003. He said that many of the anonymous officials he interviewed were afraid the preemptive manhunting strategy would turn into another Phoenix program. But that's not true. The officials planning the war within the Bush regime, including Phoenix veteran John Negroponte, knew exactly what the consequences of preemptive manhunting would be. They had every intention of using the Phoenix model to permanently fracture Iraq society, rule it through a regime of corrupted collaborators, and then steal all its oil wealth. Hirsch never characterizes American military aggression as a function of capitalism and imperialism. The trick for journalists like Hirsch was to cover up the plan using cherry-picked interviews that follow the CIA script. For example, one anonymous Pentagon advisor Hirsch interviewed justified preemptive manhunting by asserting that America's leaders had to stop the 9-11 terrorists from striking again. In other words, America had no choice. But as Hirsch strikingly neglected to mention, Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. The Iraqis were terrorists only in the sense that they resisted the American occupation of their country. They hadn't even had WMDs. Hirsch never says anything about the CIA or special forces as instruments of an unstated but intentional policy of systematic and sustained war crimes. There is, always in his reporting, a justification for what Americans do. They can be misled, and sometimes they mislead, but only when the nation's survival is at stake. In a final apologetics tour de force, Hirsch exonerated his American sources for any mistakes that were made. In choosing targets, he said in regard to Phoenix, the Americans relied on information supplied by South Vietnamese army officers and village chiefs. The operation got out of control. Even for a craftsman like Hirsch, this generalization was a nifty piece of disinformation. As Milberg noted above, the CIA excluded its Vietnamese counterparts from Phoenix planning. But the operations failed anyway, and not because the communists had coerced the people, as Milberg claimed, but because the people supported them. Hirsch failed to note that the Americans were fully aware much of the incriminating information they were fed was false. But, as this book has shown, their system was geared to work that way. The CIA deliberately jerry-rigged the Phoenix program so it would overflow with false confessions and accusations, precisely so it could get away with mass murder and terrorizing the population.
What a writer doesn't say is often more important than what he or she does say. In this regard, Hirsch did not mention that as soon as American soldiers started fighting and dying in Iraq, they cultivated grievances against the Iraqis who hated them for kicking down their doors, invading their homes, and carting off their men to torture chambers. American war managers always factor this inevitability into their schemes. Why don't journalists acknowledge it? William Calley and his men blamed every Vietnamese man, woman, and child for the deaths of their comrades, which is why the majority of Americans refused to condemn them for massacring hundreds of civilians in My Lai. This is what makes America exceptional. Our lives have value, others don't. It's that double standard that enables the American war machine to cut a swath of righteous savagery across the Muslim world and for the media to characterize it as protecting the American people from terror. This places me among those who say it. Some of America's top leaders do have evil intentions. Those who planned the war on Iraq knew that war crimes like the Milai massacre would proliferate in Iraq just as they had in Vietnam, and for all the same reasons. The CIA is their increasingly not-so-secret instrument for carrying out many of those evil plans, including a long and well-documented history of well-concealed programs that result from the mass murdering of civilians whose beliefs the war managers hate and whose wealth they covet. And over the course of the CIA's criminal career, it has relied on journalists like Hirsch to never tell that part of the story. In their corrupt world of anonymous sources and quid pro quos, Americans never have evil intentions. Quoting one of his stable of anonymous sources, invariably tough guys who talk like John Wayne, Hirsch perpetuated the myth that the Iraqis attacked us first. The only way we can win is to go unconventional, Hirsch quoted one of his patent heroic American sources as saying. We're going to have to play their game. Guerrilla versus guerrilla, terrorism versus terrorism. We've got to scare the Iraqis into submission. All this BS served its intended purpose. It made Hirsch's audience of pseudo-intellectuals, middle-class liberals, and compatible leftists feel good, thinking that America was a victim and had no choice but to resort to terrorism. Men in Black in a concerted effort to scare an entire population into submission, the CIA went unconventional in Vietnam, establishing Phoenix centers and conducting selective terrorism in each of the country's 240 districts. The stated policy was to replace the bludgeon of B-52 bombings and My Lai-style search-and-destroy operations, which had alienated the people, with the scalpel of assassinations of selected VCI. Phoenix co-creator Robert Comer called this the rifle-shot approach. Much of this terrorism was the result of unilateral CIA counter-terror operations. As Din Tuang An noted in his series of articles in 1970 and 1971 about Phoenix for Tin Sang, Phoenix was a series of big continuous operations which destroyed the countryside and put innocent people to death. In the sky are armed helicopters, but on the ground are the black uniforms, doing what they want where the helicopters and B-52s do not reach. Americans in black uniforms, said Ahn, are the most terrible. Ahn could have been writing about the SEAL Team mission former Nebraska Governor and Senator Bob Carey led into Tang Fong Village on the night of 25 February 1969. During that mission, Kerry and his seven-man squad murdered in cold blood more than a dozen women and children, as reported by Gregory Vistica 32 years later. To make matters worse, the SEALs lied about it when they got back to their Navy base. Kerry reported that they had killed 21 Viet Cong guerrillas in a terrible battle and received a bronze star in return. The CIA's strategy of using systematic war crimes was christened Contra coup by its creator, CIA officer Ralph Johnson, in South Vietnam. A veteran of the Flying Tigers and notorious ladies' man whose most famous liaison was with Nguyen Cao Ki's wife, Johnson was described by one colleague as a good-looking, fast-talking, snake-oil salesman. In his book, The Phoenix Program, Planned Assassination or Legitimate Conflict Management, 
political warfare pioneer Johnson described Contra Coup as turning the communist terrorist strategy which had proven effective into a U.S. Saigon pacification strategy. This is the same disingenuous argument Hirsch made above, the idea that we have no choice but to adopt the enemy's use of selective terrorism and use it against them to protect ourselves. This strategy of being more terrifying than the Viet Cong was based on the belief that the war was essentially political and psychological in nature. The CIA misrepresented the war as being fought by opposing ideological factions, each side amounting to about 5% of the total population, while the remaining 90% were caught in the crossfire and just wanted the war to go away. On one side were communists, supported by comrades in Moscow and Peking. The communists fought for land reform, to rid Vietnam of American militants, and to unite the North and South, which had been split apart at the end of World War II. The other faction was composed of Americans and its GVN collaborators, many of whom were Catholics the CIA had relocated from North Vietnam in 1954. This faction was fighting to protect South Vietnam's rich political elite under the direction of quiet American businessmen. The object shared by both factions was to win the uncommitted 90% over to its side by coercion if necessary. The Contra Coup strategy was adopted and advanced by Père de Silva, who arrived in Saigon in December 1963 as the CIA's station chief. De Silva claimed to have been shocked by what he saw. In his autobiography, Sub Rosa, he described how the VC had impaled a young boy, a village chief, and his pregnant wife on sharp poles. To make sure this horrible sight would remain with the villagers, one of the VC terror squad used his machete to disembowel the woman, spilling the fetus onto the ground. Several military and CIA veterans I spoke with had the same experience as De Silva. Warren Milberg, for example, served his first tour in Vietnam as an Air Force security officer. He returned in 1967 as a CIA employee, at which point the scales fell from his eyes and he began to see evidence of how the Viet Cong were operating in the hamlets, and what will always stand out in my mind was the terror and torture they used to strike fear and get compliance from the villagers. Milberg cited an event where a particular village chief's wife, who was pregnant, was disemboweled and their unborn baby's head was smashed with a rifle butt. We stumbled on this incident quite by accident within hours of its happening, I'd never seen anything like it in my life. The aforementioned Colonel Douglas Dillard had the same experience. Assigned as the senior Phoenix officer in the Mekong Delta in February 1968, Dillard, as he recalled, arrived in Canto on a Friday afternoon. The two army sergeants who had come in to be my administrative assistants met me at the airport and took me over to the compound and settled me in the CIA's regional embassy house. The next day, Dillard took a chopper to Chow Dok province on the Cambodian border. It was my first introduction to the real war, Dillard said. It was right after Tet, and there was still a lot of activity. The young sergeant there, Drew Dix, had been in a little village early that morning. The VC had come in and got a couple out that were accused of collaborating with the government, and they'd shot them in the ears. Their bodies were lying out on a cart. We drove out there, and I looked at that and I had my first awareness of what those natives were up against. Because during the night, the damn VC team would come in, gather all those villagers together, warn them about cooperating, and present an example of what happened to collaborators. They shot them in the ears on the spot. So I knew what my job was. I realized there was a tremendous psychological problem to overcome in getting that specific group of villagers to cooperate in the program because to me the Phoenix program required adequate, timely, and detailed information so we could intercept, make to defect, kill, maim, or capture the Viet Cong guerrilla forces operating in our area, or put a strike on them. If either through intercepting messages or capturing VCI you could get information on some of the main force guerrilla battalion activity, you could put a B-52 strike on them, which we did in four corps. It's debatable how random such introductions to VC terror actually were. As I mentioned in Chapter 6, The Afghan Dirty War Escalates, 
CIA officer Robert Haynes, who was serving as a deputy to Evan Parker in the Phoenix Directorate in February 1968, told Senator Brewster that CIA teams committed atrocities and made them look like the work of the V.C. Such black propaganda was not uncommon. In his autobiography, Soldier, Anthony Herbert told how he reported for duty with the CIA's Special Operations Group in Saigon in late 1965 and was asked to join a top-secret Psywar program. What they wanted me to do was to take charge of execution teams that wiped out entire families and try to make it look as though the VC themselves had done the killing. The rationale was that other Vietnamese would see that the VC had killed another VC and would be frightened away from becoming VC themselves. Of course, the villagers would then be inclined to some sort of allegiance to our side. Herbert refused to join the Black Propaganda SOG program. Not only that, he spilled the beans on one of the CIA's dirty tricks. As a result, Herbert was vilified in military circles. For above all, Americans can never be said to willfully do anything evil. They can never be said to be hypocrites, either. But Station Chief De Silva, who said the VC were monstrous, authorized the creation of small counter-terrorism teams, later renamed the PRU, to do the exact same thing and worse— to commit acts of selective terror and blame them on the V.C. As De Silva described the counterterrorism teams in the passage from his book cited above, they were designed to bring danger and death to the Viet Cong functionaries themselves, especially in areas where they felt secure. Ever suspicious of their Vietnamese counterparts, the military branches organized their own counterterrorism teams to terrorize V.C. in territory they controlled. The Navy had responsibility for the Mekong Delta and gave the job of creating counterterrorism teams to its nascent SEAL program, which President Kennedy authorized in 1962 and was still experimental in the mid-1960s. In the Phoenix program, I featured my extensive interview with Navy Lieutenant John Wilbur. In 1967, Wilbur arrived in Vietnam as deputy commander of SEAL Team 2, a 12-man detachment with no combat veterans in its ranks. Wilbur's SEAL team was assigned to a naval riverine warfare group and quartered in a Quonset hut at the Mito River dock facility in the middle of the Mekong Delta. Frankly, Wilbur told me, the Navy didn't know what to do with us. They didn't know how to target us or how to operationally control us. So basically they said, you guys are to go out and interdict supply lines and conduct harassing ambushes and create destruction upon the enemy however you can. Mostly, we were to be reactive to and protective of the Navy's PBRs, patrol boats, river, Wilbur said. That was our most understandable and direct mission. The PBR squadron leaders would bring us intelligence from the PBR patrols. They would report where they saw enemy troops or if there was an ambush of a PBR. Then we'd go out and get the guys who did it. Knowing what to do and doing it were two vastly different things. Despite being highly trained and motivationally indoctrinated, the SEALs started out, in Wilbur's words, with the typical disastrous screw-up operations. In our first operation, we went out at low tide and ended up getting stuck in mudflats in broad daylight for six hours before we could be extracted. We didn't have any Vietnamese with us, and we didn't understand very basic things. We didn't know whether it was a VC cadre or a guy trying to pick up a piece of ass late at night. The only things we had were curfews and free fire zones. And what a curfew was and what a free fire zone was became sort of an administrative political decision. For all we knew, everybody there was terrible. We got lost. We got hurt. People were shooting back at us. And other times we never got to a place where we could find people to shoot at. There was a lot of frustration, Wilbur said, of having no assurance that the information you got was at all reliable and timely. Wilbur cited the time his team raided an island across from where the U.S. 9th Infantry Division was based. We surrounded the settlement that morning and came in with guns blazing. I remember crawling into a hut, which in Vietnam was a sort of shed encompassing a mud pillbox where people would hide from attacks, looking for a VC field hospital. There I was with a hand grenade with the pin pulled, my hand on my automatic, guys running around, adrenaline going crazy, people screaming— and I didn't know who the hell was shooting at who. I can remember that I just wanted to throw the goddamn grenade in the hut and screw whoever was in it, and all of a sudden discovering there was nothing but women and children in there. 
It was a very poignant experience. The CIA assigned Vietnamese scouts from its PRU program to Wilbur's SEAL teams as a way of improving its effectiveness. But the PRU were not trusted, and once acclimated, the SEALs worked unilaterally. Which brings us to Bob Carey. Phoenix comes to Tan Phong. The village of Tan Phong was located in Kien Ho province in the Mekong Delta. It was one of the places the VCI were said to control in February 1969. Crisscrossed with waterways and rice paddies, Kien Ho province was an important rice production area for both the insurgents and the GVN. It was close to Saigon, densely populated, and one of the eight most heavily infiltrated provinces in Vietnam. The estimated 4,700 VCI in Kien Ho province accounted for more than 5% of the insurgency's total leadership. In Operation Speedy Express, the U.S. Army's 9th Infantry Division spent the first six months of 1969 rampaging through the province, obliterating villages and killing an estimated 11,000 civilians, all supposedly VC or VC sympathizers. Meanwhile, the U.S. Navy was patrolling Kien Ho's waterways, looking for guerrillas who had escaped the Army's genocidal offensive. As the Navy's unconventional warriors, the SEALs had the task of mounting Phoenix-style snatch-and-snuff operations against targeted VCI in the Delta. The Navy coordinated its anti-VCI with the Phoenix Directorate in Saigon, with Phoenix Regional Headquarters in Canto, and with the CIA's officer in charge in whatever province the operation was to occur. Coordination was necessary to make sure the SEALs were not targeting CIA double agents in the villages, as Jim Ward and Doug Dillard explained earlier. As Gregory Vistica noted in his book The Education of Lieutenant Carey, SEAL advisors were made available to the CIA's Phoenix program, and Langley used them to train Vietnamese provincial reconnaissance units. Vistica added, by 1968, it was common for complete SEAL platoons to operate with the PRU. Phoenix advisors in Kien Ho province did not report to individual military units, but were organized within MACV Advisory Team 88 as part of the CORDS program. Phoenix advisors in the province's District Intelligence and Operations Coordinating Centers, DIOCCs, wore the MACV patch and were often Army counterintelligence officers like Sid Towell involuntarily assigned to the program. See Chapter 4. As Vistica noted in his book, the head of MACV Advisory Team 88 had to coordinate the State Department's pacification program and CIA and Army intelligence. Based on information from the local Phoenix DIOCC, the MACV Team 88 commander believed the tiny coastal village of Tan Phong was a VC stronghold, and that an important VCI cadre was planning a visit there. This intelligence was passed to the CIA's province officer in charge, POIC, who had cognizance over all anti-infrastructure operations in Kien Ho, and from the POIC to the CIA's region officer in charge, Jim Ward or his replacement, and from the ROIC to Navy SEAL commanders. The SEAL commanders assigned Lieutenant Bob Carey and his SEAL team the job of capturing or killing the targeted individual. It was Carey's maiden mission. He was 25. In an article written for the New York Times, Vistica recounted how the operation unfolded. Carey's group was called Delta Platoon SEAL Team 1 Fire Team Bravo, Vistica said. Unofficially, they would be dubbed Carey's Raiders, in honor of their enthusiastic commanding officer who was ready to take on Hanoi, as he had said many times, with a knife in my teeth. Only two of the men, Mike Ambrose and Gerhard Klan, had previous experience on SEAL teams in Vietnam. The others, William H. Tucker III, Gene Peterson, uh, Rick Nepper, a medic named Lloyd Schreier, and Carey himself, were flying into the unknown. Carey's platoon was based at Cat Lo near Vung Tau, site of the sprawling R.D. Cadre facility where the CIA trained its PRU teams. Kerry's SEAL team launched their mission into the Tan Phong secret zone from the joint CIA-Navy compound at Vung Tau. They were delivered on swift boats. Everything indicates Kerry's SEAL team was on a traditional Phoenix operation. The program was still under CIA control in February 1969, 
and the intelligence for the mission came from a DIOCC through the chain of command described above. Vistica interviewed Captain David Marion, the senior Cords advisor in the district where Tanfong was located. Marion's GVN counterpart, Tiet Lun Du, was a 45-year-old military officer trained at Fort Bragg in North Carolina. According to Vistica, Du designated Tan Fu District a free-fire zone, which allowed combat pilots and Navy warships to attack targets of opportunity, including people and villages, without prior command authority. Marion's intelligence, obtained from the Tan Fu DIOCC, indicated that the VCI village secretary was planning a meeting in the area at some unknown point in time. Based on that sketchy information, the preemptive manhunt for a moving target commenced. Again, it followed Phoenix SOP. Tanfang consisted of 75 to 150 people living in groups of four or five hooches, strung out over about a third of a mile of shoreline. On February 13, 1969, according to the SEAL's after-action reports, Kerry's team entered a section of Tanfang, searched two hooches, and interrogated 14 women and small children looking for the village secretary. They departed on a swift boat the next day, then returned to the general area later that night, only to abort because of a malfunctioning radio. Kerry's team performed exactly as Warren Milberg and Din Tuang An described Phoenix operations earlier in this book. The CIA always sent a small unit, the PRU or Hunter team, into a village the day before the operation to map out the village and capture people targeted for interrogation. The next day, the CTPRU team would return with the killer team to take out the larger target, the people in the village itself. The massacres were afforded plausible deniability back at headquarters, where, insofar as the only rule in psychological warfare is post your own score, the victims were identified as armed and dangerous VC guerrillas. Some important details standard to such operations are missing from Kerry's story. For example, how did the SEALs conduct their interrogations? Did they have a PRU interpreter with them? Did they chop off fingers? In any event, Carey knew how the village was laid out, how many people lived there, and where they lived. All that was needed was a provocation generated through CIA black propaganda or otherwise, and such a provocation magically occurred a few days later when the VC allegedly committed an atrocity of some sort in the area, the monstrous kind Milberg, De Silva, and Dillard have described above. Once the provocation had occurred, Captain Martin and District Chief Duke responded in the usual manner. They told the villagers an operation was going to be conducted, and that anyone who wasn't gone would be considered VC and killed. And indeed, on the night of 25 February, a swift boat brought Carey and his SEAL team back to Tanfong to finish their business. The marauders moved in around midnight, and by Carey's account, the killings were committed in self-defense. According to Carey, his team stumbled on a home they hadn't noticed the first time they were in the village, even though it was on the prearranged path they had walked a few days earlier. The home was occupied, Carey said, by two lookouts. Carey ordered two seals to kill the lookouts using their knives, often Gerber Mark II daggers. American commandos are taught how to put their hand over the sleeping victim's mouth, slip the dagger up under the second rib through the heart, and then give it a flick so it snaps the spinal cord, or they just slice the throat from ear to ear. Having done that, the team, according to Kerry, worked their way along a dike into a hamlet consisting of four hooches. Suddenly, without warning, someone opened fire on the seals, who in a blind fury responded with everything they had, expending 1,200 rounds of ammunition. When the dust settled, 14 people were clumped together, dead. Seven more were killed trying to flee. That's Kerry's version, as reported by Vistica. According to Gerhard Klan, the most experienced SEAL on the mission, and later a member of SEAL Team 6, credited with killing Osama bin Laden, the murders were not committed in response to an ambush, but were conducted systematically in cold blood. Klan told Vistica that Kerry ordered him to kill an old man, an old woman, and three children in the first home, the one Kerry said was occupied by armed VC guerrilla lookouts. When the old man resisted, 
Terry kneeled on him so Clan could slit his throat. Reminiscent of a scene out of Truman Capote's book In Cold Blood, a third seal came to their assistance and helped kill the old woman and kids, who were now fully awake and screaming. A Vietnamese woman, Pham Tri Lan, witnessed the murders and confirmed Clan's account. She added that the old folks, Bui Van Vat and his wife, Lu Ti Khan, were the children's grandparents. Vistica confirmed they existed by visiting their graves in the village, something the New London Day could have done if it really wanted to know what really went on in the PIC Rob Simmons ran, as described in Chapter 15. Having dispatched with those five yellow-skinned commie simps, the heroic seals abandoned their preemptive manhunt for the elusive, moving VCI cadre. They knew the other villagers had heard the murdered family's screams, so according to clan they rounded up all the women and children from a group of hooches on the fringes of the village. Having done that, they searched their homes. Finding no arms or evidence of the political cadre they were hunting, they massacred everyone else in an attempt to conceal the murder of the five people in the first home, and as a psychological warfare warning to villagers in surrounding villages. Clan said they were less than ten feet away from the people they cut down, and that Kerry gave the order. Some were still crying and squirming after the first barrage, so they finished off the survivors, including a baby. As CI officer Pere de Silva put it, the SEALs were monstrous in the application of murder to achieve the political and psychological impact they wanted. Then they went home and reported they had killed 21 VC. You spend half your life just covering up. It's ludicrous to think Kerry and the SEALs didn't know what they were getting into and didn't intend to murder everyone in Tanfong. While on contract with the CIA from early 1967 through early 1969, Marine Captain Robert Slater served as director of the PIC program and chief interrogation advisor to the special police. In a 1970 thesis for the Defense Intelligence Institute titled The History, Organization, and Modus Operandi of the Viet Cong Infrastructure, Slater described the district party secretary as the indispensable link in the VCI hierarchy. As Slater explained, the district party secretary usually does not sleep in the same house or even hamlet where his family lived to preclude any injury to his family during assassination attempts. But he added, the Allies have frequently found out where the district party secretaries live and raided their homes. In an ensuing firefight, the secretary's wife and children have been killed and injured. Kerry's SEAL team targeted a village party secretary for assassination in Tanfong, and the same result occurred. Even though they couldn't find the target, everyone present was killed, including children. This is the intellectual context in which Kerry's war crime took place. It was standard procedure to kill the target along with his family and friends. For purposes of plausible denial, you could say the others were unintended victims and collateral damage. But when you know it's going to happen, and it happens every time, consistently, over years, that threadbare excuse doesn't hold water. Omerta, the mafia's term for its sacred code of silence alone, enabled Kerry and the SEAL team to get away with the premeditated murder and mutilation of 21 defenseless people, and then report it as a fierce battle with VC. That's American military idolatry in a nutshell. Convicted of murdering 22 unarmed civilians in My Lai, William Calley was venerated as a hero and served three years under house arrest until pardoned by Richard Nixon. Callie's defense was to say that massacring civilians happened all the time. Bob Kerry's friend and colleague, Secretary of State John Kerry, used the same everyone-else-does-it grade-school rationale to defend Kerry. Along with Senators Max Cleland and Chuck Hagel, John Kerry, then a senator, issued a statement in 2001 stating their belief that an investigation into the Tanfong massacre would be counterproductive insofar as it blamed the warrior rather than the war. While in effect conceding that the war as a whole was criminal in character, John Kerry elaborated in one television appearance on the thesis that soldiers should not be held responsible for actions that were in accordance with the policies of the U.S. government. The raid on Tanfong was part of Operation Phoenix, he said, 
and the Phoenix program was an assassination program run by the United States of America. Bob Carey's war crime was made worse by the fact that the unarmed civilians his SEAL team murdered were prisoners. But unrepentant Bob defended himself from that charge by claiming he was ordered not to take prisoners. He didn't want to kill those little kids. He was told to do it. Where have we heard that before? In any event, justice of a sort prevailed. On his next mission, a grenade exploded at Carey's feet. Who put it there is not known. Is it possible that he was fragged by his fellow seals for some unknown reason? However the grenade got there, it blew off the lower part of a leg. Carey's career as a killer came to a close, and he went home to weep in his mother's arms. After a few months of self-pity, Carey began his descent into the self-deception and revisionism that accompanies war crimes. It is a process of identity recreation he shares with many veterans of Vietnam and America's neocolonial wars since 9-11. To a large extent, as I've noted throughout the text, the success of their collective cover-up defines America's exceptionalism. Carey's rebirth as a certified hero began when he received the Medal of Honor on 14 May 1970, a mere ten days after the Ohio National Guard murdered four anti-war protesters at Kent State. The medal was a meal ticket, not unlike being inducted into the Mafia as a made man. One of the protected few, Carey was forever guaranteed fame and fortune. The only burden he carried was the grudge he held against the anti-war protesters who didn't appreciate his sacrifice. Elected governor of Nebraska in 1982, he dated movie starlet Deborah Winger, became a celebrity, and got elected to the U.S. Senate, where he served as vice chair of the Intelligence Committee. The picture of a neoliberal, he even ran for president in 1990 showering self-righteous criticism on draft dodger Bill Clinton for his pension for lying. Kerry was no longer in government in 2001 when Klan revealed what had really happened in Tan Fong. But the Ultras immediately and wholeheartedly rallied to his defense. His SEAL team, apart from Klan, closed ranks and backed his version of events. Kerry accused Klan of having a personal grievance against him and implied he was lying. Colonel David Hackworth, representing the military establishment, defended Kerry by saying there were thousands of such atrocities. Hackworth said that his own unit committed at least a dozen such horrors. He said it nonchalantly, as if he were mowing the lawn. Representing Hollywood and the propaganda industry's huge financial investment in the myth of the American war hero, Jack Valenti told the L.A. Times that all the normalities of a social contract are abandoned in war. By the same token, this means it is perfectly okay for terrorists to attack Western civilians because CIA officers operate in secret and cannot be located. Kerry also received support from veterans of the Vietnam Press Corps. Former New York Times correspondent David Halberstam, author of The Best and the Brightest, described the region around Tan Phong as the purest bandit country. He added that by 1969, everyone who lived there would have been third-generation Viet Cong. Clichés are the grist of revisionism at its sickest, and Halberstam's racist, anti-communist rant exposed him as nothing more than a myth-maker for the rich political elite. Halberstam might just as well have said, kill them all. Two other journalists stand out as examples of the press corps' complicity in war crimes in Vietnam. Neil Sheehan, author of the aptly titled Bright Shining Lie, confessed that in 1966 he saw American GIs slaughter as many as 600 Vietnamese civilians in five fishing villages. He had been in Vietnam for three years by then, and it didn't occur to him that he was witnessing a war crime. It was business as usual. Morley Safer is next on the list of co-conspirators. Safer vented his personal hatred for me, when he wrote the half-page review in the New York Times that killed my book, The Phoenix Program, in its cradle. I wasn't surprised that the Times employed Safer to assassinate my book. In it, I'd said, when it comes to the CIA and the press, one hand washes the other. In order to have access to informed officials, reporters frequently suppress or distort stories. In return, CIA officials leak stories to reporters to whom they owe favors. 
at its most incestuous, reporters and government officials are actually related, like Delta PRU commander Charles Lemoyne and his New York Times reporter brother James. Likewise, if Ed Lansdale had not had Joseph Alsop to print his black propaganda in the U.S., there probably would have been no Vietnam War. At the time of the review, October 1990, I thought Safer hated me primarily for accusing the press corps of covering up war crimes. I thought he did it for pecuniary reasons, too. Safer's self-congratulatory book on Vietnam had come out a few months before. It wasn't until 25 years later that I found out that Safer owed William Colby a favor. Safer revealed his incestuous relationship with Colby for the first time at the American Experience Conference in 2010. I got a call to come and see Colby in his office, Safer explained, and I walked in, and I had met him. We had no strong relationship at all, but... And Colby said, Look, can you disappear for three days? Laughter. And I said, I guess. Laughter. And he said, Well, be at the airport, be it, inaudible, at the airport tomorrow morning at 5.30. Bernard Kalb, the moderator, asked Safer if Colby wanted him to bring along a camera crew. No, no, Safer replied. And I showed up, and Colby said, Okay, here are the rules. You can see that I'm going on a tour of all the stations. You can't take notes, and you can't report anything you hear. And I spent three days, first of all, down in the Delta, and they were really, really revealing. There was only one meeting that he would ask me to leave the barracks, and it was fascinating because the stuff that these guys were reporting through whatever filters to you had been so doctored by the time it got to you. I mean, to this day, I still feel constrained in terms of talking about it. Colby introduced Safer to all the top CIA officers in Vietnam and introduced him to the interrogation centers and counterterrorism teams. Safer got to see how the CIA crime syndicate was organized and operated, and like Don Corleone dispensing favors in The Godfather, Colby knew that one day Safer would be obligated to return it. That is how the CIA, as the organized crime branch of the U.S. government, functions like the mafia through its old boy network of complicit media hacks. Can Bob Carey be tried for murder? Carey says his actions at Tanfang were an atrocity, not a war crime. He feels remorse, not guilt. Totally rehabilitated, he has come to view Vietnam as a just war. Was the war worth the effort and sacrifice, or was it a mistake? Carey asked rhetorically in a 1999 column in the Washington Post. When I came home in 1969, and for many years afterward, I did not believe it was worth it. Today, with the passage of time and the experience of seeing both the benefits of freedom won by our sacrifice and the human destruction done by dictatorships, I believe the cause was just and the sacrifice not in vain. At the Democratic Party convention in Los Angeles in 2000, Kerry lectured the delegates not to be ashamed of war crimes and to treat Vietnam veterans like him as heroes, not terrorists. I never felt more free than when I wore the uniform of our country, he said without irony, and without noting that wearing the uniform made him free to murder women and children. Promulgating the militaristic business party line is the price Bob Kerry pays for getting away with mass murder. As long as he promulgates it, he is one of the protected few, entrusted with the government's top secrets. Indeed, he is one of a handful of Americans who has read the secret 28 pages on Saudi Arabia's role in 9-11. He knows where all the bodies are buried. Gregory Vistica traveled to Vietnam and visited the graves of Bui Van Vat, his wife Lu Thi Khan, and their three grandkids in Tan Phong. And now that Kerry knows where his victims are buried, he could pay his respects to the victims too. While he's in Vietnam running the Americans' Fulbright University, he could also pay a visit to the War Remnants Museum in Ho Chi Minh City. According to Wikipedia, the War Remnants Museum features a display based on the Tan Phong incident. It includes several photos and a drain pipe, which it describes as the place where three children hid before they were found and killed. The display includes the following account. The seals cut 66-year-old Bui Van Vat and 62-year-old Lu Thi Khan's necks and pulled their three grandchildren out from their hiding place in a drain and killed two, disemboweled one. 
Then the rangers moved to dugouts of other families, shot dead fifteen civilians, including three pregnant women, disemboweled a girl. The only survivor was a twelve-year-old girl named Bui T. Luom, who suffered a foot injury. One wonders if Kerry will visit the graves of the children his SEAL team disemboweled the next time he visits Vietnam. Perhaps he fears being arrested if he does. As attorney Michael Ratner at the Center for Constitutional Rights told Counterpunch, Kerry should be tried as a war criminal. His actions on the night of February 24 to 25, 1969, when the seven-man Navy SEAL unit which he headed killed approximately 20 unarmed Vietnamese civilians, 18 of whom were women and children, was a war crime. Like those who murdered at My Lai, he too should be brought into the dock and tried for his crimes. The Geneva Conventions, Customary International Law, and the Uniform Code of Military Justice all prohibit the killing of non-combatant civilians. The brutality of others is no justification. That is why there is a moral imperative to expose the Phoenix program as the basis for the CIA's ongoing policy of committing war crimes. It is imperative to try the CIA officers who created it, as well as the people who participated in it, including the journalists who covered it up. If America's policy of conducting war crimes is ever to end, people of conscience must expose the dark side of our national psyche, the part that allows us to employ terror to assure our world dominance. To accomplish this, there must be a war crimes tribunal, like the one Bertrand Russell and Jean-Paul Sartre put together in 1966 to 1967. I've assembled enough evidence in this book alone to put the likes of Bruce Lawler, Rob Simmons, Frank Scotton, and Bob Kerry in the dock. The National Security Establishment will try to prevent it. The U.S. government has gone to great lengths to shield itself and its cadres from international law, while corrupting international institutions like the United Nations to prosecute U.S. enemies like Slobodan Milosevic. But if the U.N. could free itself from U.S. influence, it could establish an ad hoc tribunal, such as it did with the Rwanda ICTR and Yugoslavia ICTY. Alas, according to Ratner, the legal avenues for bringing Kerry and his cohorts to justice in the U.S. are limited. A civil suit could be lodged against him by the families of the victims under the Alien Tort Claims Act. There is no statute of limitations for war crimes, and under 18 U.S.C. Section 2441 War Crimes, Kerry could be sentenced to death or life imprisonment. But at the time of his crimes in Vietnam, U.S. criminal law did not apply to what U.S. citizens did overseas. Only military law applied— and now that Kerry is no longer in the Navy, the military courts have no jurisdiction over him. In yet another great irony, Kerry, as a senator, voted for the war crimes law, allowing others to be prosecuted for crimes similar to those he committed. Prosecution in Vietnam and extradition are also possibilities. Universal jurisdiction does not require the presence of the defendant. He can be indicted and tried in some countries in absentia or his extradition can be requested, Ratner said. Some countries may have statutes permitting this. Kerry should check his travel plans and hire a good lawyer before he gets on a plane. He can use Kissinger's lawyer. But that's not going to happen. The rule of law ended with 9-11, when legal invasions and occupations became stated policy, along with targeted assassinations and mass murder. And until the media stops glorifying preemptive manhunting of moving targets as necessary for our security, rather than fueling the terrorism that threatens the unprotected many, the war crimes will never stop. Chapter 19 Top Secret America Shadow Reward System after Dana Priest and William M. Arkin's three-part series, Top Secret America, appeared in the Washington Post, pundits and academics began falling all over themselves in a rush to quantify the post-9-11 counterterrorism apparatus. Although few of them had seen fit to even notice the elephant in the room before, they all swooned at its $75 billion price tag— as well as the implications such a monstrous surveillance and covert action apparatus has for a free society. 
There were, however, dimensions to the problem that Priest and Arkin didn't dare touch upon. Let me tell you a story that fills in some of the blanks. In 1985, I was contacted by a CIA officer. Larry had served as a deep-cover agent overseas for over 15 years. He'd had a breakdown and wanted to tell me his story. He'd read my book about my father, the Hotel Tekloban, and thought I'd understand. Larry's story began in South Vietnam in 1966, where, as a gung-ho Marine, he came to the attention of a CIA talent scout. The CIA officer ran a background check and discovered that Larry was an only child from a broken marriage. Larry was an emotional orphan looking for something to latch on to. He chose the ultra-conservative route. In high school, his favorite activities were attending the local Lutheran church and participating in the Rotary Club debate team. His dream was to become a self-described crusader and follow in the footsteps of his hero, John Wayne. Larry described himself as being for freedom, the American way of life, and free enterprise. Plus, he was avidly anti-communist and a combat veteran, which made him even more attractive to the CIA. Strange things began to happen. Although still a Marine, he was sent to Okinawa and given special training in scuba diving, skydiving, demolition, and the martial arts. No one told him why he was being groomed, and being a good soldier, he didn't ask. But he soon learned that the CIA had decided to turn him into a deep cover agent. At the time, the CIA's central cover staff managed a worldwide network of deep cover agents and freestanding proprietary companies. It existed, and may still exist with some new name, outside the regular CIA bureaucracy and was used by presidents to conduct the CIA's most sensitive operations. The central cover staff concocted an elaborate cover story. Only Larry's case officer knew what was fact and what was fiction. The story went like this. Larry's father was an Australian soldier who, during a tour in the Philippines in the Second World War, had an affair with a woman whose maiden name was Valesco. His mother was half Spanish, half Filipino, from the upper class. The necessary documents were forged to prove that his mother had been a lawyer working in Samboaga. Larry's mother and the Australian soldier were never legally married, but Larry was by birth a Philippine citizen. Abandoned by the Australian soldier, Larry's mother succumbed to depression and never recovered. She was hospitalized, and Larry was put up for adoption. At the age of three, he was adopted by a loving foster family in America. His middle-class parents raised him as their own son, never mentioning that he was not their natural child. He was, according to the legend the CIA created, popular and smart with an aptitude for mechanics. The CIA forged documents to show that he'd received a scholarship to the General Motors Institute for Automotive Engineering and had attended the Sloan School of Management at MIT. According to his cover story, Larry enlisted in the Marines and, based on his mechanical aptitude, was selected for helicopter pilot training. However, during the required security check, the Marines discovered that he was a Filipino citizen, not an American. This revelation came as a shock, but it also provided him with a pretext to visit the Philippines to discover his past. Larry made the trip immediately upon leaving the Marines in 1968. As outlined in the Central Cover Staff's script, and as actually happened, Larry learned to speak the language and settled in the land of his birth. He got a job as a manager and translator with a Japanese mining company. He did well, but left that job to manage a Shell Oil service station franchise on the island of Leyte. Over the next ten years, Larry held management positions with B.F. Goodrich, an American building and supply contractor to Clark Air Force Base, General Motors, Visa Card, and Westinghouse, which built the first nuclear reactor in the Philippines. As is true of most American multinationals, Larry's employers all knowingly provided cover for CIA agents as a way of maintaining influence overseas as well as in Washington. By 1980, Larry had established himself as an upright Filipino citizen. His cover was impeccable, and to make a long story short, he was elected to public office. While in that position, however, things went wrong. 
the U.S. State Department became aware that he was a deep-cover CIA officer serving in the Philippine legislature. A series of actions were taken to destroy all records of his existence, and he was whisked out of the Philippines. After Larry's breakdown, the CIA got him a job as a manager of a Playboy club in Detroit. Later, they transferred him to Washington, D.C., as manager of the posh Four Ways restaurant off DuPont Circle. When I met him there, his Filipino wife and entourage were working as the kitchen and wait staff. To make sure Larry behaved himself, the CIA had placed a former security officer in charge of finances. This restaurant was the fanciest place I had ever been in my life. It was a place where striped pants State Department officials, foreign dignitaries, and business tycoons met to make deals while sampling fine wines and haute cuisine. Each lavishly appointed room had its own dining table and waiter. I was directed to a leather booth in the wood-paneled basement bar room, where Larry casually explained that each room was bugged by the CIA. As we were talking, a group of well-dressed young men and women, chaperoned by an older man, took the booth next to us. The rest of the barroom was empty. They ordered drinks, but remained silent and alert, as Larry explained the ins and outs of his CIA experience to me. At one point Larry nodded to the older man at the next booth, then informed me that the young people listening to our conversation were junior officer trainees from Langley. Larry told me that the CIA manages a parallel society where deep cover agents like him, as well as retired CIA officers and their agents, are provided with comfortable employment in their retirement years, or when they otherwise need sanctuary and recompense for their services. Many of these agents have no applicable resume, so they are folded into this parallel universe as managers of the local Ford dealership or proprietors of a Chinese restaurant, or in hundreds of other jobs held in abeyance by cooperating businesses. Think of it as a witness protection program, which since 2001 has grown exponentially. It is the hidden geography of top-secret America a subculture of highly trained operators with a dangerous set of skills that can be called upon at any moment. The one thing they have in common is that they are entirely dependent on the war criminals running the CIA. As John Lennon said, imagine. Chapter 20 How the Government Tries to Mess with Your Mind Lou Rockwell those of us who were interested in the church hearings, which we don't hear much about anymore, learned about Operation Mockingbird, the CIA's program to take control of the U.S. media. Has Operation Mockingbird continued? Is the American mainstream media pretty much a PR operation for the CIA? Valentine. Mockingbird, as you know, was a program the CIA launched in the early 1950s to influence the mass media. CIA officers Cord Meyer and Frank Wisner are credited with creating Mockingbird. Meyer, through his friendship with the owner of Random House, tried to suppress Al McCoy's book The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia in 1972. Wisner famously referred to the CIA's army of Morley Safer-style assets in the publishing and journalism world as the Mighty Wurlitzer, which he could turn on and off whenever he wished. Wisner's son, by the way, served in the Phoenix program. In her book, Catherine the Great, Catherine Graham and the Washington Post, Deborah Davis said that by the early 1950s, according to Deborah Davis, Wisner had implemented his plan and owned respected members of the New York Times, Newsweek, CBS, and other communications vehicles, plus stringers, four to six hundred in all, according to a former CIA analyst. Carl Bernstein, citing CIA documents, said basically the same thing in his famous 1977 expose for Rolling Stone. The CIA and the media, how America's most powerful news media worked hand in glove with the Central Intelligence Agency and why the Church Committee covered it up. The CIA established a strategic intelligence network of magazines and publishing houses, as well as student and cultural organizations, and used them as front organizations for covert operations including political and psychological warfare operations directed against American citizens. In other nations, the program was aimed at what Cord Meyer called the compatible left, which in America translates into liberals and pseudo-intellectual status-seekers who are easily influenced. All of that is ongoing, 
despite being exposed in the late 1960s. Various technological advances, including the Internet, have spread the network around the world, and many people don't even realize they are part of it, that they are promoting the CIA line. Assad's a butcher, they say, or Putin kills journalists, or China is repressive. They have no idea what they're talking about, but they spout all this propaganda. Nowadays, it goes way beyond the CIA. Several government agencies are propagandizing not only the American people, but the world. This includes the State Department and the military. The military is the nation's biggest advertiser, I believe, and the media depends on its revenue. Television especially isn't dependent on viewers, but on advertisers. So the media is probably more financially dependent on the military and the State Department than it is on the CIA, but the CIA laid the groundwork. The question one has to ask, given all this propaganda, is what makes CIA propaganda different than State Department or military propaganda, or even the red, white, and blue advertisements being thrown at the American people every second of every day? Everywhere you look, there are signs wrapped in American flags selling things, and that's propaganda too. It's just emanating from the business party. What makes CIA propaganda different? Rockwell, you make an interesting point about advertising. Doesn't the DEA do a huge amount of advertising, too? Valentine, well, sure. The DEA is selling the notion that America is the victim in the war on drugs. It spouts this kind of nonsense at congressional hearings and through taxpayer-funded propaganda campaigns like D.A.R.E. and Nancy Reagan's Just Say No Idiocy. They coordinate their message with state and local law enforcement agencies and their civil offshoots. The DEA claims foreign countries like Mexico are pushing drugs on us, and therefore the DEA needs $50 billion a year to police the world and stop these horrible people, most of whom don't look like us. Meanwhile, the American demand for drugs persists, and the war goes on and on. But the propaganda is convincing and Americans feel good that it's not their demand that's fueling the problem. It's the fault of a couple of cartels in Mexico. The FBI has a huge propaganda machine, too. Gangbuster J. Edgar Hoover understood how to promote FBI agents as heroic crime stoppers, as the good guys who got John Dillinger. Like the DEA, Hoover knew how to manipulate statistics and how to go after the proper criminals to promote the interests of his fiefdom. The government is composed of huge bureaucracies like the FBI and DEA, all competing for federal taxpayer dollars. They each have their own propaganda machine, which exists primarily for bureaucratic reasons, so that they can get a bigger piece of the federal budget. There are all sorts of reasons for propaganda, and many types of propaganda, and the CIA is one of the agencies engaged in self-promotion to get more of your money. But the CIA also has operational reasons for using propaganda to target particular people or nations. Rockwell, uh, what is it that differentiates CIA propaganda from all the rest of these agencies? Valentine, the CIA advances the unstated goals and policies of the United States government, as opposed to the State Department, whose propaganda is promoting its stated objectives— which, of course, are wrapped in the same kinds of circumlocutions and euphemisms the CIA and military use. The language is pretty much the same for whichever agency is propagandizing, which adds to the confusion about where it's coming from. The purpose of CIA propaganda is to create plausible deniability, to hide or disguise the fact that it is the source of a particular piece of misinformation designed to mislead the American public. It has briefing officers who tell PR people in other government agencies what to say to hide the fact that it is engaged in a particular covert action that is designed to start a war or that supports a terrorist group or subverts a friendly government or promotes a fascist political party in Ukraine or a military dictatorship in South America. The sorts of things that, if the public was to find out that the U.S. government is doing them, would cause the president and the government embarrassment, like the attempted Gulen coup in Turkey. Journalists, of course, report all these carefully scripted communiques as fact. The CIA is in charge of doing the things that are illegal and anti-democratic. Its propaganda is generally referred to as gray or black propaganda. Black propaganda is used to completely disguise CIA operations and blame them on someone else, be they friends or enemies. 
Gray propaganda uses questionable sources, the sort of anonymous sources Seymour Hirsch is famous for using. I'll give some examples. The CIA introduced New York Times reporter Chris Hedges to two Iraqi defectors who claimed in November 2001 that Saddam Hussein was training terrorists to attack America. That's black propaganda. It was completely untrue, but the lies could be blamed on the Iraqi defectors. The Ben Affleck film Argo, winner of multiple awards, told a fictionalized story of the CIA's successful rescue of several embassy employees held hostage in Tehran in 1979 and 1980. It was based on a book written by a CIA officer, and the CIA helped produce the film through its Old Boy Network and its Entertainment Industry Liaison Office. The CIA has an office that works with Hollywood. If a film is pro-CIA, it provides advisors. That's propaganda designed to rewrite history. In this case, the Canadians had more to do with the rescue than the CIA, and to give the CIA a good name and portray its officers as happy-go-lucky heroes. Journalists writing articles and authors of political books on current affairs tend to deliver CIA propaganda, some wittingly, others because they're stupid. There is an obscure discipline known as the interpretation of intelligence literature that involves studying these texts, like rabbis studying the Talmud for eschatological meaning, or English lit majors wondering why Eliot said, Madame Blavatsky will instruct me in the seven sacred trances. There's an esoteric quality to propaganda that can drive some people crazy trying to figure it out. Some CIA officers spend their careers trying to unravel Russian propaganda. Some end up paranoid, seeing enemy agents everywhere. That's why Colby fired James Angleton. Angleton thought Colby was a Russian agent. Sometimes, however, it is easy to identify and discern the meaning behind CIA propaganda. Back in 2011, reporter Jeff Stein wrote an article about Fethullah Gulen, the American-based Turkish exile I referenced above. Gulen was accused of trying to overthrow Prime Minister Erdogan in July 2016. In his article, Stein referred to a memoir written by Osman Nuri Gundes, a top former Turkish intelligence official who alleged that the Gulen movement has been providing cover for the CIA since the mid-1990s. Citing the Paris-based Intelligence Online newsletter, Stein reported that the movement sheltered 130 CIA agents at its schools in Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan alone. Having CIA agents operating out of schools in Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan sounds like something the CIA would do. It's a great way of manipulating a social and political movement. Case officers could easily place principal agents, PAs, in the schools. The PAs could run agent nets or even assassins into Russia as legal travelers. Maybe the schools are spreading CIA propaganda. It was certainly influencing political and social movements. It may even front for a drug smuggling apparatus here and in Central Asia. Journalists like Stein know they have to look to foreign magazines and sources to get the true story about what the CIA is doing. At the same time, they have to maintain their credibility here in the States, which means they have to report the CIA line. Being a responsible journalist, Stein contacted two former CIA officers who both said the allegations were untrue, that the CIA would never do anything like that. So whom do you believe, the CIA or your own lying eyes? Stein's is not an article one needs to pick apart for hours trying to figure out if it's gray or black propaganda or Russian disinformation. The New York Times, however, functions as the CIA's protector and thus dutifully published a series of stories that did their best to bury under a mound of disinformation and overtly biased reporting any hint that Gulen is a CIA agent. One article, steeped in schmaltz, described Gulen as a moderate who promotes interfaith dialogue, leads a worldwide network of charities and secular schools, favors good relations with Israel, and opposes harder-line Islamic movements like the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas. According to the New York Times, and as universally adopted as truth by its readers, someone who favors Israel and opposes Hamas is all right, even if, as it acknowledged, 
a former CIA official, helped Gulen get a green card. The Times reporters did not explain that the CIA routinely creates and manipulates social and political movements like Gulen's and keeps them in place for decades until the time is right to launch a coup. They didn't explain that the Gulen movement ran one of Turkey's largest, most anti-Erdogan newspapers, or that the CIA uses such newspapers to spread propaganda before a coup. Instead, they cited Gulen's denials and his defenders at length. One expert said the Gulen movement was a golden generation of young people who are educated in science but have Muslim ethics. No one in the media will examine the network of schools the Gulen movement has planted in the U.S. to see if they are part of an elaborate CIA counter-espionage operation, like Operation Twofold, see Chapter 12, through which the CIA is hiding an operational unit that bumps off Gulen's political opponents. The fact that the mainstream media never looked too deeply into it proves it is a CIA operation. Indeed, the media does exactly the opposite. Within days of the coup, the writer's group PEN, which functions as a propaganda arm of the Israeli government and the CIA, sent all its members an urgent request to sign a petition to the Turkish government protesting the arrest of journalists involved in the coup. Penn never mentioned that many of the arrested journalists were, by virtue of their anti-Erdogan work on behalf of Gulen, tacitly working for the CIA. The purpose of signing such a meaningless petition is not to put pressure on Turkey, but to shape the assumptions of Penn's deluded members, to make them hate Turkey, which is not Israel's best friend. Rockwell the CIA has always specialized in assassinations, the military too, but now we have the president openly assassinating people and claiming he has the right to. In the earliest days, the CIA was allegedly prevented from operating within the U.S. I think that was always a myth. Now the CIA is just openly and massively involved here. Do you think it is committing assassinations here as well? Valentine. It's impossible to prove. You'll never find a document that says the president ordered the CIA to kill some critic like Senator Paul Wellstone when Wellstone died in a suspicious plane crash. You're never going to find any proof that can be used in a court of law that would show the CIA conducted that kind of a political assassination within the United States. The CIA doesn't conduct that kind of an operation unless it's deniable. My inclination, based on everything I know about the CIA, is that, yes, they do but I can't prove it because of the reasons I've just stated. They get the mafia to pay some petty crook to kill Martin Luther King Jr., and then work with what Fletcher Prouty called the secret team to cover it up. Rockwell, what's your opinion of Philip A.G.'s book Inside the Company, CIA Diary? He was, of course, a former CIA agent who wrote about just how many people were on the payroll and how many people were controlled by the agency. Is that a persuasive book? Valentine. Absolutely it is. Modern history of the CIA begins with A.G. and his revelations. Nothing A.G. said has been disproved. His fatal mistake was telling the truth, naming over a hundred CIA officers and linking some of them to specific crimes. He was easily discredited on that basis alone, and anyone who reads A.G. and responds rationally to his revelations is also by association a traitor. His revelations were akin to the collateral murder video Chelsea Manning gave to WikiLeaks. Manning was tormented and imprisoned for revealing the truth about what the CIA and military really do, which is the equivalent of treason in America. A.G. was never imprisoned, but he was threatened and forced to settle in Cuba. A.G. and his publishers revealed the inner workings of the CIA. It's not a coincidence that the church hearings followed pretty much on the heels of his revelations. A lot of things were coming out in the late 1960s and early 1970s, but A.G. and later John Stockwell were the only CIA officers ever to reveal the CIA's criminal deeds and, more importantly, criminal intentions in operational detail. That will never happen again. After A.G. and Stockwell, the CIA placed one of its officers, Rob Simmons, see Chapter 15, in the Senate Intelligence Committee where Simmons shepherded the Agent Identities Act into law. It's now illegal to name CIA officers, and if you do, you go to prison like John Kiriakou, who exposed the CIA's use of waterboarding. That repressive measure was the legal outcome of A.G.'s revelations. Rockwell, 
We're finding out just now a lot more information about the Paris Review, a very influential literary publication, being in effect a CIA front. I've always been interested in National Review, one of my least favorite publications, which was founded by Bill Buckley, a former CIA agent. Maybe I should put former in quotes. A number of other former CIA people were also involved. This is a magazine that set out as its goal to destroy any anti-war feelings on the so-called right. Do you think that the National Review was a CIA operation too, like the Paris Review? Valentine. I'm glad you asked that question, because there are CIA agents who work for a CIA case officer and are on the payroll, and then there are people, in this case media propagandists, who do it for love. They inform on colleagues or otherwise help a spy agency for ideological reasons. Buckley is a perfect example of this. There are people who, by predilection, appear to be CIA officers, but are simply ideologically in sync with it and would do these things anyway. In Buckley's case, it isn't necessary to try to distinguish whether he was an agent of the CIA or just somebody doing it out of, like I say, love. Where you need to focus is not on people whose ideology is the same as the CIA's, but on the left, which in my usage of the term includes liberals. The Nation, for example, is a popular leftist liberal magazine. Would The Nation promote the CIA line in a particular instance? Could it be infiltrated? Could the CIA be directing some of its efforts in critical situations? The CIA doesn't have to infiltrate and direct the ultras. It directs its efforts at what Cord Meyer called the compatible left. Cord Meyer was associated with Operation Mockingbird, which was a way of courting the compatible left. This is what the CIA does. It's not courting Bill Buckley or the National Review, because the ultras already love the CIA and know exactly what to say about it. They say the same things as the CIA anyway. The CIA penetrates the media that pretend to be nonpartisan or leftist. The further to the left a magazine or a media outlet is, that's where the CIA would be found. Rockwell. For example, the Congress for Cultural Freedom in the early years, too. Valentine. Yes, the CIA doesn't have to tell the New York Times what to say. Arthur Oakes Sulzberger, Jr. and his staff know what to say. They're on the CIA's wavelength. They have the same interests and exist within the same stratospheric economic and political class. The CIA wants to know what everyone is thinking and planning, from Marine Le Pen to Benjamin Netanyahu to Bashar al-Assad. It is trying to influence everyone to as great an extent as possible. It's infiltrating socialist parties and trying to bring them over to the freewheeling capitalist model. They're going to concentrate in areas that are thought to harbor enemies of the United States, like the Chinese and Russians. They're going to infiltrate troublesome domestic groups as well. They're going to try to move the Black Lives Matter people to moderate their positions on equality. They're commandeering emigre groups like Gulen's and redirecting them against foreign opponents within the United States. But mostly, they are trying to adjust American public opinion to support intervention abroad arming Israel and Saudi Arabia and Egypt to keep the oil flowing. Rockwell, you know, Doug, if somebody wanted to learn about the CIA, what would be the books that you would tell them to read? Valentine, regarding propaganda, people should read Manufacturing Consent, The Political Economy of the Mass Media, and Counter-Revolutionary Violence, Bloodbaths in Fact and Propaganda, both by Noam Chomsky and Edward S. Herman. For books about the CIA, I'd recommend A.G.'s and Stockwell's books, as well as Victor Marchetti's The CIA and the Cult of Intelligence. Another book from days gone by is Fletcher Prouty's The Secret Team, which does the best job explaining how the CIA hides itself in other agencies and how its briefing officers write the script for the rest of the government. I'd stay away from books written by anyone working for the New York Times. If you read books about the CIA by Evan Thomas or Tim Weiner, do so with a block of salt. They're basically advocating hero worship. I'd also stay away from academic books that rely on official documents, all of which, including the Pentagon Papers, as Prouty explains, have all the credibility of Bob Carey's after-action report, the one that said his SEAL team killed 21 VC instead of 21 women and children. Those early books are important, 
But the CIA has undergone significant organizational changes in the last 15 years. The clandestine services have been reorganized and are under new names. It's a shell game. So these older books refer to the CIA organizationally in ways that are outdated, although the policies and practices haven't changed. It's important to read whatever information the CIA publishes about its organizational structure. It has a website that sketches its organizational structure, its different branches and divisions and what they do in a straightforward way. Looking at its organizational chart is the first step, while keeping in mind that, as with any organization, channels of power flow off the organizational chart. An organization like the CIA has back channels and ways of doing things that defy any kind of structural analysis. It's difficult to understand, like higher mathematics or the petrochemical industry. It takes serious study and a lot of effort. You have to read a lot of books, and you have to stay up to date. A serious student has to read a lot of translated foreign publications on the subject as well. You have to get into the details. For example, in 1989, there was an article in Marine Corps Gazette talking about modern warfare. That was 27 years ago. The authors of this article said, The new type of warfare will be widely dispersed and largely undefined. The distinction between war and peace will be blurred to the vanishing point. There will be no definable battlefields or fronts. The distinction between civilian and military will disappear. Success will depend heavily on effectiveness and joint operations as the lines between responsibility and mission become blurred. The kicker in the article was when they said that this new type of warfare will depend on psychological operations manifested in the form of media information intervention. All of this became standard operating procedure at home and abroad in terms of the military and CIA intervening in media information. The article said one must be adept at manipulating the media to alter domestic and world opinion. On this new psychological battlefield, television news may become a more powerful operational weapon than armored divisions. Twenty-seven years ago, before the Internet, the military was talking about how, in the global village, national boundary lines would vanish and the U.S. would become the dominant power and influence events everywhere through the control of information. The article predicted that propaganda and psychological operations would become the defining factor in shaping political and social affairs. This was before Facebook allowed people to talk to people in Brazil or the Philippines or enemy nations like Russia or China. This was before we could read Russia Today and get information from sources that contradict the official U.S. line. The military and State Department and CIA understood that this was evolving and were making plans to control it. To become an individual who can look at all this information and understand that the CIA is covertly trying to manipulate it, to make you think, feel, and behave a certain way, well, that is a breathtakingly complex thing to do. It's almost impossible to try to figure out where a particular piece of information is coming from. Is it from the State Department, or the military, or the CIA? As the Marine Corps Gazette said, the boundaries have vanished. The information is so rapid and overwhelming, and mixed in with corporate messages, other kinds of messages that are coming at us. It's just like the person who wrote that article said. It's a blur. Guy Debord talks about it in The Society of the Spectacle. How can people adapt themselves and adjust their assumptions about reality in order to be able to discern within a media spectacle that produced Donald Trump as a viable presidential candidate what is really happening and where messages are coming from? It's an incredible challenge. People are so overwhelmed and alienated, they tend to withdraw, which is how Trump could create and control a social and political movement through tweets and symbolic messages. How can anyone begin to sort this out by reading a few books, if you see what I'm trying to say? Rockwell, but it still is possible, isn't it? It's just a matter of a lot of work. Valentine, oh, it's possible, because all the information is there. Rockwell, one last question. This is a huge question, so you may just want to sort of skip over it lightly. But since you're an expert on the DEA as well as the CIA, what about the story of CIA drug running? Is it true that in the late 1940s it began to get involved in the Golden Triangle and so forth, 
and maybe until recently used drugs for political and maybe financial purposes? Valentine. It's true. As I've explained elsewhere, the CIA made a point of infiltrating the DEA under the Nixon administration as a result of rising addiction in the U.S. being tied to the CIA's drug networks in the Far East. All that was being exposed. But prior to that, the CIA didn't have to tell the people who ran the DEA or its predecessor organizations that the drug wars were essentially political and dependent on psychological warfare. Starting in 1949, it was official U.S. policy to blame communist China for America's drug problem. It was not true, but the CIA didn't need to tell the old Bureau of Narcotics to do that. The commissioner of the Bureau of Narcotics, Harry Anslinger, was one of the great propagandists of all time. He associated pot smoking with Mexicans trying to seduce white women. He associated heroin addictions with black musicians. He manipulated statistics in order to aim his agents at a rogues gallery of despised minorities and leftist organizations. Anslinger taught the CIA how to propagandize. He helped form the OSS. One of his senior agents, Garland Williams, went to England in 1942 with a man named Millard Preston Goodfellow, who was a Hearst executive and owned the Brooklyn Eagle. Williams and newspaper magnate Goodfellow were members of the Office of the Coordinator of Information. They went to England and met with John Keswick, who ran England's special operations executive. Keswick had been involved in the opium trade in China, and based on that knowledge and experience, was put in charge of England's special operations executive, which conducted dirty tricks in World War II. Williams and Goodfellow returned to Washington with the SOE's training manuals and set up the OSS. In other words, the guys who created the CIA included a narcotics agent who taught OSS officers how to avoid the security forces of foreign nations, which is what the narcotics people had been doing for decades. Not surprisingly, it was a newspaper man who taught the OSS how to control the message. This stuff is standard operating procedure. It doesn't matter whether it's the DEA, CIA, FBI, or the military. These people all know what to do. They mostly do it for their own different bureaucratic reasons, but the CIA ultimately controls the final product. Rockwell. Well, Doug Valentine, thank you for what you do. This is not the sort of career that leads to power and wealth. You've chosen the path of truth and of teaching truth, and we're all very much in your debt. Please come back on the show again. This has been terrific. Valentine, you're very welcome. I would love to. Chapter 21. Disguising Obama's Dirty Wars In a speech to West Point cadets delivered in early December 2009, President Barack Obama declared, We're in Afghanistan to prevent a cancer from once again spreading throughout that country. But this same cancer has also taken root in the border region of Pakistan. That's why we need a strategy that works on both sides of the border. The hackneyed phrasing and use of the buzzword cancer signaled that Obama's troop surge in Afghanistan, announced a week earlier in direct opposition to his campaign promises to reduce U.S. military presence in Muslim nations, would adhere to the dictates of what the CIA calls political and psychological warfare, the cornerstones of any counterinsurgency. As I've stressed throughout this text, political and psychological warfare depends on information management. In this case, the careful revising of history and official government communiques to conceal the fact that American covert actions and unstated policies, including its reliance on drug-trafficking warlords, were responsible for the so-called cancer in the first place. Indeed, at a meeting a month before Obama announced the surge, the U.S. ambassador in Kabul advised against a large buildup of forces, according to one report, as long as the Karzai government remained unreformed. Regional Commander General David Petraeus told Mr. Obama to think of elements of the Karzai government like a crime syndicate. Ambassador Eikenberry was suggesting, in effect, that America could not get in bed with the mob. All of this rhetoric was completely disingenuous, given that America had installed the Karzai crime syndicate in the first place. Let's review the actual history. America's ignoble defeat in Vietnam in 1975 did not end its militant anti-communist jihad. 
which President Carter simply repackaged and sold as a policy of promoting human rights. While Carter was preaching human rights, his national security adviser, Zbigniew Brzezinski, was secretly subverting the pro-Soviet regime that had ascended in Afghanistan in 1978. The covert actions began immediately and consisted of CIA case officers recruiting, funding, arming, and forming warlords from Afghanistan's non-Pashtun ethnic groups into the infamous Northern Alliance. Through allied Islamic nations like Saudi Arabia, the CIA also recruited mercenaries like Osama bin Laden and aimed them against the secular communists. Brzezinski's big idea was to provoke Soviet military intervention and to drag the Russians into a debilitating Vietnam-style war through a carefully sustained insurgency. The cancer America was eradicating at the time was communism, along with its goals of income equality and liberation of the Afghan women, who were encouraged to attend universities and get jobs. Like Monsanto, selling dioxin-laced herbicides to happy American suburbanites as the solution to their lawn problems, the CIA launched an information campaign to convince Muslims that communism was antithetical to Islam's basic tenets, such as the belief in God. To wipe out the Kami weeds, the CIA created the Mujahideen, paving the way for Al-Qaeda. It created the civil war that destroyed Afghanistan's emerging modern society. Just as mighty U.S. corporations in search of profits produce the toxins that create actual cancer, the CIA created the conditions that prompted the traumatized Taliban to arise from the ashes of the CIA-provoked civil war in an attempt to restore law and some semblance of order to their nation. If Obama really wanted to rid the world of cancer, maybe he should have bombed Monsanto or sicked his death squads on the tobacco companies. While we're on the subject of carcinogens, Obama borrowed a page from Carter and while visiting Vietnam in the spring of 2016, chided the Hanoi government for human rights violations. He did so without acknowledging the horrific plague of cancers the U.S. visited on Vietnam through the systematic spraying of some 20 million gallons of Agent Orange over 12% of Vietnam, adversely affecting over 3 million innocent people. And don't think this is Vietnam War history. It's a huge problem today. As Marjorie Cohn noted in December 2015, those exposed to Agent Orange during the war often have children and grandchildren with serious illnesses and disabilities. The international scientific community has identified an association between exposure to Agent Orange and some forms of cancer, reproductive abnormalities, immune and endocrine deficiencies, and nervous system damage. Second- and third-generation victims continue to be born in Vietnam, as well as to U.S. veterans and Vietnamese Americans in this country. Individual CIA officers made liberal use of poisons in Vietnam as early as 1961, when, according to Tom Ahern in his book Vietnam Declassified, CIA officer Ralph Johnson's Vietnamese counterpart proposed deploying special teams to poison VC rice depots, booby trap VC munitions depots, kill or capture VC cadre in ambushes or in raids on communist-controlled villages, and gather intelligence. Johnson endorsed this program, saying he expected it to tie down Viet Cong military forces and reduce communist pressure on Montagnard villages. While stationed in Kien Ho province in 1964, Ahern proposed the use of sophisticated booby traps, incendiaries, and materials toxic to livestock in areas considered to be under uncontested communist control. Ahern encouraged this despite the possibility of civilian casualties and suggested using leaflet drops to warn that persons using particular routes now incurred mortal danger. CIA officers like Ahern were well aware of the cancer they were spreading, the U.S. government, along with its British allies, developed dioxin in the 1940s as a weapon of war ostensibly to destroy Nazi and Japanese crops. They had known since the 1950s that it, along with nuclear fallout, was a lethal cancer-causing agent. The U.S. also knew what would happen to its own expendable soldiers as well as the Vietnamese people by saturating Vietnam with dioxin, just as it knew what would happen when it planted the Mujahideen cancer in Afghanistan.
When asked if he regretted creating terrorists, Brzezinski replied, What is most important to the history of the world, the Taliban or the collapse of the Soviet Empire? Some stirred up Muslims or the liberation of Central Europe and the end of the Cold War. When asked by Leslie Stahl if she regretted that U.S. sanctions on Iraq had led to the death of half a million children, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright said, We think the price is worth it. Albright's comment was made on 60 Minutes in 1996, but as reported by Rahul Mahajan, a Dow Jones search of mainstream news sources since September 11 turns up only one reference to the quote in an op-ed in the Orange County Register, 91601. This omission is striking, given the major role that Iraq sanctions play in the ideology of arch-enemy Osama bin Laden. His recruitment video features pictures of Iraqi babies wasting away from malnutrition and lack of medicine, New York Daily News, 92801. The inference that Albright and the terrorists may have shared a common rationale, a belief that the deaths of thousands of innocents are a price worth paying to achieve one's political ends, does not seem to be one that can be made in U.S. mass media. Commenting in October 2011 about her needless destruction of Libya and the ramming of a knife up Muammar Gaddafi's rectum, Hillary Clinton chortled majestically, We came, we saw, he died. Being an exceptional American means never having to say you're sorry. If you're a top American leader, it also means never going to prison. Left as Right Delivered a week after he addressed cadets at West Point, Obama's Nobel Prize acceptance speech, in which he boasted about ordering the Guantanamo Torture Center closed, marked an important juncture for him as he took on the job of selling more war in Afghanistan. It didn't matter that American hands had already been stained by the blood of thousands of innocents killed in bombing raids. Never mind all that innocent blood— Obama's double talk was hailed by neoconservatives who believed they had surprisingly found in the young biracial president a far more effective spokesman for their interventionist causes than the inarticulate buffoonish George W. Bush. The shift in rhetoric at Oslo was striking, observed neocon theorist Robert Kagan in a Washington Post op-ed. Gone was the vaguely left-revisionist language that flavored earlier speeches, highlighting the low points of American global leadership, the coups and ill-considered wars, and lowballing the highlights, such as the Cold War triumph. But then, those words were intended for the American public, with a view to winning an election. Indeed, in his Oslo speech, Obama shoved six decades of bloody low points behind one five-word clause whatever mistakes we have made. Obama more than willingly shouldered the job of arms salesman for the war in Afghanistan. He reveled in his role as custodian of the kill list and boasted of his power to cross international borders to assassinate Taliban leaders in Pakistan and later an American citizen in Yemen. Under Obama's stewardship, the role of the president evolved from moral leader to predator drone orchestrator conducting surgical hits. Being a tough guy who enjoys murder is also a popular stance in America. Obama leaves office in the summer of 2016 with a 51% approval rating. But it was never necessary for Obama to win the support of the majority of the American public for the war on terror. Programmed Americans instinctively rally around the flag and support the troops. It is the knee-jerk reaction Obama and the national security establishment counted on when they sent 30,000 soldiers to Afghanistan. And even though the surge would eventually count among mistakes we made, decades of political and psychological warfare have successfully shifted the responsibility for those mistakes from leaders with good intentions onto the general public which has as its only obligation the moral imperative to support the troops. The trick is to make the public feel, every day in every way, that there is an ongoing urgent need for wars they must support. So Obama packaged his surge as a cure for cancer. He made it an involuntary matter of personal survival, like the radiation and chemotherapy treatments that take a terrible toll on a patient's body but are necessary if the patient wants to live. 
Fifteen years after Bush invaded Afghanistan and provoked its current civil war, the American public is still paying for some magical cure that will stop the fear and insecurity its leaders created, a condition of psychological dependence that makes the public incapable of shaking off its political oppressors here at home. Beyond relying on alternating doses of medicinal fear and patriotism, Obama's incestuous war council, symbolized by the marriage of neocon Robert Kagan and Obama's neoliberal assistant secretary of state for European and Eurasian affairs, Victoria Nuland, knows that public confusion is helpful. Most Americans don't have the time to learn what really happened in Afghanistan, in this case, that there was never an insurgency to counter, but rather a resistance movement to American military occupation by Afghan nationalists. One could say that America's unstated policy of conquest through massive corruption was a mistake. Or one could say that the national security establishment wanted to control the drug trade and use the profits to train a new generation of special operations forces, who since 9-11 primarily invade private homes at midnight on targeted snatch-and-snuff missions and thus refer to themselves as door-kickers, while colonizing Afghanistan and using it as a base to subvert Russia and China. Either way you say it, that's what intentionally happened and will continue to happen. What is counterinsurgency? In his speeches, President Obama defines America's objectives in Afghanistan as, one, suppressing the Taliban resistance forces to American military occupation and the corrupt puppet regime the U.S. installed in 2001, two, eliminating several Arab terrorists, and three, creating a stable pro-American government and economic infrastructure. David Galula, author of Counterinsurgency Warfare, Theory and Practice, and a recognized authority on the matter, stressed that counterinsurgency includes building or rebuilding a political apparatus within the population. In this sense, any counterinsurgency is also an insurgency. It just depends on who is telling the story and when the story begins. In Afghanistan, the Taliban ruled for several years until the CIA's Northern Alliance drove them out. Since the Civil War, there have been two governments. Obama's successor will continue to define the Taliban as the insurgents. But the Taliban, who by 2005 once again controlled many parts of Afghanistan, view the Americans as invaders backing a corrupt insurgency that undermines traditional Muslim law. As every government propagandist knows, the essence of existence is no longer to be or not to be, but to define or be defined. Thus, military occupation is not a phrase one hears when Americans tell the story of Afghanistan. One only hears the word counterinsurgency. But the U.S. military's strategy for defeating the Taliban has always been to clear and hold territory the corrupt warlords on its payroll covet for economic purposes. To clear and hold means to drive the resistance out of their secure areas in the countryside, through Phoenix-style operations perfected in Vietnam. Such operations range from small-unit death squads like Bob Carey's, when his SEAL team slaughtered the women and children of Tan Phong, just like the U.S. commandos did in Ghazi Khan 40 years later. The idea in either case is to terrorize the public into no longer supporting the resistance movement. This terror strategy worked in Iraq. According to the story told by Washington's ruling national security establishment, President George W. Bush's 2007 surge and the clear-and-hold strategy won the war in Iraq, although it merely gave rise to ISIS, yet another cancer. As in Afghanistan in 2002, the reality in Iraq is diametrically opposed to the story we have been told. More important than the surge and the temporary drop in violence were the massive bribes. Billions of Pentagon dollars are still unaccounted for, used to pay off Sunni tribes in 2006, along with Bush's agreement in 2008 to reduce the U.S. military presence. But that is not what Bush and Obama wanted people to believe. For instance, establishment propagandists Evan Thomas and John Barry at Newsweek 
asserted that the clear and hold strategy worked because it protected the friendly civilians who provided the tips that enabled the CIA and its special forces sidekicks to find and kill people who were, as in Bob Carey's after-action report at Tan Fong, said to be terrorists or members of the resistance. By ratcheting back the heavy use and overuse of firepower, they claimed, U.S. military commander in Afghanistan General Stanley McChrystal has reduced civilian casualties which alienate the locals and breed more jihadists. The reality, however, is far less humane and clinical. 1. It is false to assert that a counterinsurgency is gentler than the shock and awe of, say, the Iraq invasion. Such an assertion is propaganda intended to deceive its target population in the United States into thinking that innocents are not being intentionally killed and robbed of everything they own. 2. The assertion that only jihadists are targeted for assassination obscures the fact that thousands of people are fighting not for religious reasons, but for nationalist reasons. Afghans, or name your target population, are simply opposed to American invaders and their corrupt collaborators. 3. The notion that civilians provide information because they are friendly to the Americans is misleading, since most intelligence is coerced or bought. Only in the world of illusion created by Barry and Thomas can a warlord like Ghul Aga Shazai, whose tips in 2001 led to the massacre of hundreds of his personal rivals and sparked the civil war, be said to be a friend. As Anand Gopal revealed in No Good Men Among the Living, Shazai supplied the CIA with a network of informants that targeted their business rivals, not the Taliban. In return, Shazai received the contract to build the first U.S. military base in Afghanistan, along with a major drug franchise. In an effort to create an insurgency and a pretext for eternal military occupation, the CIA methodically began torturing and killing Afghanistan's most revered leaders in a series of Phoenix-style raids that radicalized the Afghan people. The Newsweek propagandists were correct only when they said that Obama's dirty war was modeled on the Phoenix program, whose goal was to target and assassinate Viet Cong leaders. As usual, they only told the part of the story they wanted people to hear— they didn't add that waging a successful dirty war depends on spreading disinformation as to who is the enemy and why they and everyone around them are being killed. Intelligence Intelligence is gained primarily through informants, detainees, interrogations, defectors, electronic intercepts, and secret agents. 1. Voluntary informants like Shirzai typically work for money and vengeance. Ideology is a factor, but more often informants in a civil war are given no choice. Fracturing a society or culture into opposing factions, Sunni versus Shia, and then coercing rivals into becoming informants is the CIA's strong suit. 2. Detainees also provide coerced information in an effort to escape a jerry-rigged legal system in which due process is denied and spilling the beans is the only alternative to torture and death. Producing and coercing detainees is one of the CIA's major means of assuring that a society will remain divided and manageable. Sowing suspicion, fear, and confusion keeps a subject population suppressed. 3. In the Afghan conflict, interrogations are conducted by members of the Afghan National Army, ANA, the Afghan Secret Police, KHAD, or private militias operated by warlords like Shirzai. When not actually conducted under the supervision of CIA and military officers in jointly managed facilities, torture sessions are conducted unofficially by private militias acting as CIA mercenary forces. High-value targets captured in unilateral CIA operations are tortured in secure facilities off-limits to militiamen. Not publicized by Newsweek is the fact that the CIA and U.S. military purchased from members of the corrupt Afghan government the right to operate secret torture and detention centers, as well as the right to use unilateral paramilitary teams to target capture and kill Afghans who pose security risks to its profitable drug network.
Based on administrative detention laws developed in Vietnam, the CIA's secret detention and torture centers were supposed to be handed over to the Afghan secret police. Suspects theoretically appear before review boards that afford them a fleeting chance to present evidence of their innocence. Reporters and international human rights officials are supposed to have access to the trials. The reality is far different. As reported in the 28 November 2009 Washington Post, two Afghan teenagers held in U.S. detention north of Kabul this year said they were beaten by American guards, photographed naked, deprived of sleep, and held in solitary confinement in concrete cells for at least two weeks while undergoing daily interrogation about their alleged links to the Taliban. 4. The CIA's defector programs for Muslims evolved from the CIA's Chu Hoi program for communists in Vietnam. Defector programs are the essence of political and psychological warfare and rely totally on the control of information. A typical defector program consists of dropping leaflets on a targeted village in a secure enemy area. The leaflets promise mutilation and slow death to those who resist and riches beyond one's wildest dreams to those who defect. Immediately upon defecting, defectors are interrogated, often by former comrades who have defected and repented. Defectors are made to prove their loyalty by providing actionable intelligence so military operations can be mounted immediately. Having proven their worth, defectors are then taught the American line by other defectors. To further prove their sincerity, they are then conscripted into CIA-funded militias and sent back to contact other resistance members and recruit more defectors. Defectors are used as pseudo-insurgents in black propaganda operations and as translators and interrogators in torture centers. The CIA's espionage operations are populated by defectors. 5. American electronic intercepts are entirely unilateral and directed mostly against the various agencies of the puppet Afghan government as a way of detecting double agents and discovering information that can be used to bribe and coerce officials in the puppet regime. 6. The CIA and U.S. military run agents in liaison with militia leaders like Shirzai, as well as with subservient police and military officials in the Afghan government. Often, however, the militias target police and military officials belonging to rival tribes. Thus, the CIA values most highly its unilateral agents within the various militias and government agencies in order to keep in touch with real events as opposed to the stories it tells to the press. It is difficult recruiting agents within the Taliban leadership, which is composed of religious clerics who dispense justice, not social services per se. Taliban leaders have not succumbed to the cash nexus and are not easily bribed. They do not have bookkeepers, nor do they organize in Western-style corporate hierarchies. They do not issue press releases, broadcast their plans and strategies, or allow photography, which can confound CIA assassins. These ideological precepts make them nearly impervious to blackmail, extortion, and corruption, the CIA's standard means of penetrating the enemy infrastructure, and the means by which it controls top-ranking officials in the Afghani government. The Taliban leadership does meet with foreigners to negotiate land and mineral rights, as well as to form alliances. But after being preemptively manhunted for 15 years, they are loath to deal with Americans, which further hampers the CIA's ability to penetrate their ranks. The Taliban's cultural practices make it hard to know if any intelligence gathered is reliable, but that does not much matter. The Taliban, according to Hillary Clinton, treat their women like animals, and that is reason enough to wipe them off the planet and steal everything they own. The main function of intelligence in the Afghan Dirty War is to create public support for U.S. government policies. Intelligence managers skew intelligence to this political purpose, as happened with the bogus reports of WMD in Iraq. Any policy can find supporting intelligence, especially when the meaning of words is garbled by Afghan or Iraqi or Syrian collaborators and U.S. officials who are required to report what the CIA wants to hear 
and which they disseminate respectively for their own survival and or career advancement. As Phoenix program veteran Stan Fulcher explained to me, the Vietnamese lied to us. We lied to the Phoenix Directorate, and the Directorate made it into documented fact. It was a war that became distorted through our ability to create fiction. Intelligence programs have two other functions in a dirty war. One is to map out the clandestine organizations that drive the resistance so they can be destroyed. At the secret detention and torture centers it operates in Afghanistan, the CIA draws up blacklists of actual and fabricated Taliban cadres based on their social and family ties, position within the infrastructure, age, sex, and profession, etc. The idea is to send paramilitary teams out to capture them, make them inform on their comrades, turn them into double agents, or kill them and their families and friends. None have the right to due process. Some of these death squad operations have surfaced during U.S. military disciplinary proceedings. In one case, an Afghani identified as suspected insurgent leader Nawab Buntangyar was encountered on 13 October 2006 by an Afghan army patrol led by U.S. Special Forces Captain Dave Staffel. Afraid that the suspected terrorist might be wearing a suicide vest, the Americans kept their distance while checking his description against the CIA's kill or capture list. Concluding that the man was indeed Buntangyar, Staffel ordered American sniper Troy Anderson to fire from a distance of about a hundred yards away, putting a bullet through the man's head and killing him instantly. The soldiers viewed the killing as a textbook example of a classified mission completed in accordance with the American rules of engagement, the International New York Times reported. The men said such rules allowed them to kill Buntangyar, whom the American military had designated a terrorist cell leader once they positively identified him. When Staffel's civilian lawyers said the Army's Criminal Investigation Command concluded that the shooting was justifiable homicide, a two-star general in Afghanistan then initiated a murder charge against Staffel and Anderson. Both were released on technicalities. An even more telling tale involved Sergeant Major Anthony Pryor, who in 2007 was awarded the Silver Star for gallantry in action. As Pryor said modestly at the award ceremony, I just did what I had to do. Anand Gopal chronicled the actual event in No Good Men Among the Living. In his book, Gopal told how Pryor's Special Forces A-Team attacked a schoolhouse where Al-Qaeda terrorists were said to be hiding. It was January 2002, only three months after the U.S. launched its invasion of revenge for 9-11. The men in the schoolhouse were said to have defended themselves, but were overwhelmed. As Pryor soon discovered, the men he attacked were part of a pro-American local government. Like Bob Carey after Tan Fong, Pryor claims he acted in self-defense, Gopal wrote. But Kas Uruzgan residents point out that the bodies were found in their beds, handcuffed, and there were no signs of struggle. Either way, every official was killed. As Gopal noted, the massacre would have been controversial anyway, but the schoolhouse was within the governor's compound. The anti-Taliban police chief lived in the compound, but he too was beaten and kidnapped. The governor, Tawil Dar Yunis, heard the commotion and escaped, but others were summarily shot in the head. The survivors were put in an AC-130 gunship, the kind featured in the collateral murder video Chelsea Manning was sent to prison for leaking, and flown to a CIA military base. Pryor and his team left behind a sadistic card saying, Have a nice day, from Damage, Inc. Gopal said, In a thirty-minute stretch, the United States had managed to eradicate both of Kas Uruzgan's potential governments, the core of any future anti-Taliban leadership, stalwarts who had outlasted the Russian invasion, the civil war, and the Taliban years, but would not survive their own allies. Weeks later, the Americans realized their mistake and released the prisoners. Brutalized beyond belief, they were now eager to fight back. As usual, a series of such mistakes, the kind Obama referenced in his Nobel Prize speech, and which the Pentagon claimed was the reason U.S. and British forces killed and wounded dozens of Syrian soldiers who were fighting ISIS on 17-18 to 18 September 2016, 
created the nationalist resistance that would force the United States to occupy Afghanistan for the next 15 years and into the foreseeable future. At some point, one must ask, are they really mistakes based on faulty intelligence? Or are they the essential ingredients of colonization and military occupation? In Afghanistan, the CIA aims its death squads at Taliban judicial officials operating religious law courts and assessing and collecting taxes, resistance members operating business fronts for purchasing, storing, or distributing food and supplies, including farm products, public health officials distributing medicine, security officials targeting American collaborators and agents, officials in transportation, communication, and postal services, military recruiters, and military leaders and forces, or anyone said to be engaged in these activities. The other major purpose of the intelligence programs is to understand how resistance leaders prepare Afghan civilians to cope with the violence the CIA and U.S. military visited upon them for generations. Through opinion polls and surveys, the CIA tries to understand what drives people into the resistance, or, conversely, into the arms of corrupt warlord regimes. Based on this attitudinal intelligence, the CIA seeks to establish the rationale for its own parallel government, which it portrays to the press as free of corruption and drug traffickers, and modeled on Afghan sensibilities. The media admits the CIA occasionally makes mistakes, but minimizes the mistakes by insisting the agency and its military adjuncts only have good intentions. Guys like William Calley, Bob Carey, Rob Simmons, Frank Scotton, Dave Staffel, Troy Anderson, and Tony Pryor. It's enough to make you want to give the CIA a big medal. How to Disguise a Dirty War the CIA forms its parallel governments in foreign nations in conjunction with the U.S. military and State Department. In Afghanistan, it hides itself in consulates and secret compounds on military bases, as it does in most of the hundreds of military bases America has spread around the world. After establishing itself on military bases, the CIA expands its operations under cover of the State Department's Agency for International Development, AID, Civic Action Missions. Cywar is what makes it all possible, having collaborators like Thomas and Barry who are willing to tell the American public the approved version of the story, good guys doing good deeds who occasionally make mistakes. The CIA follows in the tradition of the Christian missions that brought Bible classes to underdeveloped nations around the world. In the process, the benighted natives were softened up for military conquest, bureaucratic colonization, and economic exploitation, no matter how well-intentioned the missionary. Indeed, the more effective the missionary's message, the more malleable the natives became. AID missions serve the same softening-up function today though their gospel is development, not the word of God. In either case, by accepting the outsider's medicines and message, the natives tacitly accept the outsider's authority. They are converted into a compliant workforce, recruited into the occupation army or as petty officials in the puppet government, and as special police in its homeland security apparatus. As were Christian missionaries of old, the modern AID worker is a highly indoctrinated fanatic. As one aid worker in Afghanistan told me, the ANA, the Afghan National Army, is really good. People trust them and share intelligence with them, something they are not willing to do with internationals. This AID worker did not acknowledge the Taliban as being people. After all, one cannot become an AID worker unless one preaches the CIA gospel chapter and verse. No heretics need apply. As I've mentioned ad nauseum in this book, AID programs provide cover for the CIA and are symbolic of the evil intentions that lurk behind the righteous U.S. facade. In the following paragraphs, I'll outline an AID program that existed in Thailand during the Vietnam War and which serves as an example of what is currently happening worldwide on a massive scale. The CIA proprietary company Joseph Z. Taylor Associates was planted in Thailand as a community development counseling service. 
At the same time, it had a contract with the Thai Border Patrol Police, BPP. The BPP was a paramilitary force of 10,000 airborne rangers created by the CIA in the early 1950s and charged with internal security, which meant killing communists, guarding the king's opium fields, protecting CIA drug smuggling networks, and eliminating the competition. Taylor Associates employed CIA contract officer Ray Coffey and his Green Beret assistants to oversee BPP intelligence collection, counterinsurgency, and border control operations in northern Thailand. As Coffey explained to me in 1972, CIA advised BPP operations in northern Thailand were redirected on narcotics intelligence collection. Coffey was not happy about the job. He recalled sitting on a mountainside in 1973 and watching a battalion of KMT soldiers with 200 mules moving a huge opium shipment. I had 30 men to stop a battalion, Coffey recalled, so I said forget it. According to Coffey, the Thai military also moved drugs, 10 tons of opium at a time on barges into Chiang Mai. In the early 1980s, when author James Mills was in Chiang Mai writing about DEA operations, the BPP was still considered totally corrupt and responsible for the transportation of narcotics. I was told the same story by Gordon Young, a CIA officer in Thailand since 1954. Originally a BPP advisor, Young in 1972, as part of Nixon's incipient war on drugs, was put under AID public safety cover and assigned to Hue Sai, Laos, which is mentioned elsewhere in this book as the epicenter of the CIA's drug operations in the Golden Triangle. Young described the anti-narcotics effort between 1972 and 1974 as a messy, uncoordinated affair, with each outfit, CIA, DEA, USAID public safety, state, the military, and customs, all pulling in different directions, each looking jealously for the rewards. Like Coffey, Gordon had no illusions that he could overcome official corruption fueled by the CIA. As is true in Afghanistan today, no one was there to be heroes, he said. It was like dealing with mafia chiefs, Young added. He recalled a trip he took to meet a BPP captain in the jungle. The captain was sitting beside a huge pile of heroin, morphine, and opium. Young asked if he would surrender it. You may have it, the captain said. But by the time you get through... Ray Coffey's area of expertise was not drug interdiction. It was conducting civic action operations in remote areas. To this end, through a facet of Taylor Associates called DEVCON, Coffey and his special forces assistants created the Hill Tribe Research Center in Chiang Mai, Thailand, in 1967. As part of the CIA's parallel government in Thailand, the Hill Tribe Research Center employed Thai nationals as teachers, agronomists, animal husbandrymen, and engineers. Under the supervision of American case officers, these Thai nationals doubled as principal agents who recruited informants and ran agent nets. As a cover for its espionage activities, and to baptize the indigenous people in the holy cash nexus, the center bought and marketed their handicrafts. Many of them were recruited and sent back into the local opium growing areas to gather intelligence on drug traffickers. The Hill Tribe Research Center famously employed Putaporn Kramkruan, a CIA agent arrested for smuggling opium into the U.S. The case began in 1972 when Putaporn sold opium to several Americans through a Peace Corps volunteer in Chiang Mai. The Americans packaged the opium in film canisters and sent it home. An initial shipment went through without any problems, but a second 59-pound package was spotted by customs inspectors in Chicago. The receiver was arrested when he came to pick it up. Upon closer examination, the inspectors found that Putaporn had wrapped the opium in a magazine with his name and address on it. A customs agent was sent to Thailand to investigate. Although snubbed by the CIA officer in Chiang Mai, the customs agent learned that Putaporn was, at that very moment, in the U.S. as part of a business seminar sponsored by the Agency for International Development. AID, in fact, had given him $1,600 for airfare. 
Back in the U.S., customs agents arrested Putaporn and stuck him in the Cook County Jail. When questioned, he confessed to everything. Not only did he name his U.S. accomplices, he said he was an officer in General Li Mi's Kuomintang Army in Burma. His job, he said, was to guard opium caravans traveling from Burma to Hue Sai, Laos. It was a CIA operation, he said, and he named his CIA case officer as the U.S. consul in Chiang Mai, James Montgomery. In 1973, the CIA under William Colby was looking at the big picture, meaning Nixon's overture to China, which included negotiations over the status of Taiwan. Many CIA senior officials had invested 20 years of their lives supporting the Kuomintang in Taiwan. They considered Taiwan a strategic military base and were violently opposed to rapprochement with China. As Rob Simmons was quoted as saying in an earlier chapter, they would do anything to eradicate communism. One thing they did was use opium caravans to detect Chinese troop movements. Despite Nixon's official presidential directives to the contrary, doing so was official policy, and in Afghanistan it still is, for all the same Russian and Chinese reasons. DEFCON agents spied on Soviet and Chinese agents in Thailand, and Putaporn was directly involved in the intrigues between the CIA, the KMT in Burma and Taiwan, and the Chinese. Nixon took a personal interest in his case after Putaporn told DEA agents that he had led commando raids into China for the CIA. Putaporn threatened to confess that he had smuggled the opium into Chicago at the request of the CIA. His lawyer stated his intention to call DEFCON boss Joseph Taylor, as well as the CIA station chief in Bangkok, Louis Lapham, and the CIA base chief in Udorn, Thailand, Pat Landry, as witnesses. His defense team was also preparing to subpoena incriminating documents. The CIA's reaction was predictable. It refused to provide the documents and witnesses, and directed the assistant U.S. attorney in Chicago to dismiss the case in April 1974. The stated reason was to protect Joe Taylor, who was working with senior Thai police and political officials, planning intelligence operations against Chinese agents in Malaysia and against Russian agents in North Vietnam. On July 24, 1974, two weeks before his resignation, Nixon appointed Joseph Z. Taylor as Assistant Inspector General of Foreign Assistance. At congressional hearings into the Putaporn case, CIA Director William Colby said, We requested the Justice Department not to try him for this reason. They agreed. CIA lawyers told Senator Charles Percy that Putaporn was hired only to report on narcotics trafficking in northern Thailand, not to attack and spy on China, and that his crime was a controlled delivery designed to counter narcotic trafficking. Percy said with a heavy sigh, CIA agents are untouchable, however serious their crime or however much harm is done to society. Fred Dick ran the DEA's office in Bangkok at the time and was involved in the Putaporn operation. As he explained to me, the agency folks are masters at going behind the scenes in the U.S. court system and convincing the judiciary an open exposure of this sort would jeopardize national security. To my knowledge, they have never failed with this ploy. DEA agents knew the CIA was lying and, at Dick's direction, told Senator Percy that Putaporn had been employed by the CIA since 1969 as a member of a multi-million dollar opium ring. They also told Percy that Putaporn's close friend, Victor Tin Sein, had been killed while living in the United States by unnamed parties for his involvement in and knowledge of Putaporn's smuggling ring. The murder dovetailed with a case CIA-slash-DEA agent Joe Lagatuta was working on. A member of Lou Conin's CIA-controlled Special Operations Unit, outlined earlier in this book, Lagatuta was sent to Amsterdam to recruit a specific Chinese asset, Victor Tinsen. Victor was not an informant, but an agent and part of a CIA operation for Conin and a significant figure who must remain nameless. Lagatuta hinted that the significant figure was William Colby. We were very successful, Lagatuta said. 
not just in heroin seized, but the planning and execution of the sting leading to arrests and destruction of several significant trafficking rings. Unfortunately, Victor Tinsane was sent to San Francisco against Lagatuta's wishes, where, according to Lagatuta, he was assassinated, as opposed to being murdered. For his part, Putaporn was released and returned to Thailand. CIA case officers and their agents in the puppet Afghan government are following the same script, and anyone who deviates from the script, even some stratospheric character like Ahmed Karzai, the former Afghan president's half-brother, is assassinated. Ahmed's assassination occurred, it should be noted, after mainstream reporters connected him to drug trafficking. Anand Gopal summarized the situation in Afghanistan. Bush administration officials had drawn up a list in 2005 of the most wanted international drug barons who posed a threat to U.S. interests. When Assistant Secretary of State Bobby Charles saw it, he asked, Why don't we have any Afghan drug lords on the list? This was, in fact, a thorny problem because some of the biggest Afghan narcotics kingpins, Gul Aga Shazai and Ahmed Wali Karzai, chief among them, were allied with Washington, and in some cases even paid by the Americans. Running the drug business in a foreign country is dangerous work. Afghanis who collaborate with the CIA in this criminal endeavor must inform on their countrymen or die. Likewise, Afghanis working in USAID programs as part of the CIA's parallel government must preach the party line. They must refer to the resistance as insurgents in exchange for their prosperity and survival. The CIA is just like Al-Qaeda and the Taliban in this regard. No heretics allowed. As the AID worker in Afghanistan told me with all the histrionics of a Clinton or Trump campaign speech, the wrath on informants, should the resistance prevail, will make the rape camps of Serbia look like picnics in the park. How he knew this is not the point. His job is to propagandize, to terrorize Americans. The terror that accompanies institutionalized CIA corruption enables civic action teams to train rural villagers how to build perimeter fences. When not administering medicine and forming militias, CIA-guided special forces units, having learned to dress and grow beards like Afghanis, slip into the countryside at night and, using intelligence from their assets, snatch and snuff the local resistance cadre. Urban units do likewise in cities. Sometimes they engage in black propaganda activities designed to produce defectors by inflicting atrocities on the population that can be blamed on the enemy. When they function in this manner, they are terrorists. Instilling terror, as their Jesuit forefathers knew, is how the CIA creates converts among the resistance. Any AID worker who helps the CIA in this mission is someone author Graham Greene would have described as a dumb leper who has lost his bell, wandering the world, meaning no harm. It doesn't matter that many Taliban men, women, and children are pure in thought and deed and are seeking only to defend their homes and culture from foreign invaders. Most do not participate in terrorism or even guerrilla action, and yet they are uniformly dehumanized as cancer by the likes of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, who must prove their willingness to stigmatize and kill innocent people in order to command the respect of the national security establishment. Meanwhile, in the mainstream news media, the U.S. government's intentions are always characterized as heroic, generous, cancer-curing which is how bad becomes good. Dependent on official government sources, like addicts depend on heroin, the media's propagandists justify the policy of war crimes by covering up the existence of CIA parallel governments dependent on corruption and criminal collaborators, and by blurring distinctions between combatants and non-combatants. Few reporters dare to report that in Afghanistan, as in Vietnam, the CIA offers bounties to anyone willing to identify the political leaders of the resistance, the shadow government of the people that exists apart from the CIA-imposed criminal conspiracy that is despised for its corruption and collaboration. I'll give an example. Griff Witt wrote in the Washington Post on 8 December 2009 that the Taliban has an elaborate shadow government of governors, police chiefs, 
district administrators, and judges, that in many cases already has more bearing on the lives of Afghans than the real government. Witt quoted Khalid Pashtun, a legislator from the southern province of Kandahar, who has close ties to Karzai, as saying, These people in the shadow government are running the country now. Witt also cited the case of the shadow governor, Maulvi Shahid Kail, who is regarded as fearsome but clean. A former minister in the Taliban government, he became the shadow governor here last year after being released from government custody. Residents said he spends most of his time in exile in Pakistan, but occasionally crosses the border to discuss strategy with his lieutenants. In many parts of Afghanistan, Witt continued, Afghans have decided they prefer the severe but decisive authority of the Taliban to the corruption and inefficiency of Karzai's appointees. From Kunduz province in the north to Kandahar in the south, even government officials concede that their allies have lost the people's confidence and that increasingly residents are turning to shadow Taliban officials to solve their problems. All of these statements are confirmed by my independent sources. And yet, while Witt spoke truth when interviewing Afghanis, he veered into propaganda when quoting U.S. sources. Specifically, he claimed that all Taliban officials are combatants. There are no clear lines between the Taliban's fighting force and its shadow administration. Insurgents double as police chiefs. Judges may spend an afternoon hearing cases, then take up arms at dusk. Although sprinkled with truth to achieve believability, Witt's article ultimately supported the notion that all Taliban, including civilians, are legitimate military targets to be subjected to murder and mutilation without due process. Secret Government The intelligence apparatus in Afghanistan is the foundation of the CIA's parallel government. Just as it operates under the cover of U.S. and NATO AID missions, it lurks behind whatever group of professional criminals and warlords it installs in the official government in Kabul. Obama, like every public official, struggles to present this criminal enterprise in the best terms possible, though in reality it is no different than the corrupt political apparatus the CIA imposed on South Vietnam. In 1965, the CIA named Air Force General Nguyen Cao Ki as Chief of National Security. In exchange for a lucrative narcotic smuggling franchise, Key then sold the CIA the right to extend its parallel government from Saigon into the countryside. Called the Revolutionary Development Cadre Program, it consisted of CIA covert action programs staffed by corrupt Vietnamese officials. The CIA did the same thing in the 1980s, when it coerced U.S. law enforcement agencies into looking away in regard to both cocaine smuggling by the Nicaraguan Contra terrorists and heroin trafficking by the Northern Alliance warlords fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan. This history is not lost on Afghan bandits. A 2010 article by the McClatchy newspapers noted that by blocking a diplomatic solution in Afghanistan in favor of Obama's surge, U.S. militarists spared President Karzai from having to make meaningful reforms. He even refused to send his drug-dealing half-brother Ahmed into honorable exile. After 15 years of U.S. military occupation and misrule by its collaborators, the situation hasn't changed. Informants, interrogators, hit teams, and corrupt politicians understand the evil they're doing, but their prosperity and lives depend on U.S. patronage. As a result, the definition of insurgent gets skewed to mean anyone who is not compliant with the U.S. occupation. Just like Rudy Giuliani and ultra-law and order fanatics petition Obama to label the Black Lives Matter organization as a terrorist group. I would like to close this chapter by quoting from John Cook, an army officer assigned to the Phoenix program in Vietnam. CIA officers taught Phoenix advisors at the Vietnamese Central Intelligence School. As Cook recalled, there were 40 of us in the class, half American, half Vietnamese. The first day at the school was devoted to lectures by American experts in the insurgency business. Using a smooth, slick delivery, they reviewed all the popular theories concerning communist-oriented revolutions. 
Like so many machines programmed to perform at a higher level than necessary, they dealt with platitudes and theories far above our dirty little war. They spoke in impersonal tones about what had to be done and how we should do it, as if we were in the business of selling life insurance, with a bonus going to the man who sold the most policies. Those districts that were performing well with the quota system were praised. The poor performers were admonished, and it all fitted together nicely with all the charts and figures they offered as support of their ideas. Like many of his colleagues, Cook resented the pretentious men in high position who gave him unattainable goals, then complained when he did not reach them. Fifty years later, the U.S. government has expanded Phoenix worldwide, with all the missionary zeal of Jesuits. Only now its cadres are more highly indoctrinated. There is little resentment anymore among the rank and file. Former Delta Force Commander General William Boykin is a born-again Christian who casts the war on terror as a holy crusade against Islam. As zealous as any jihadist, he believes an anthropomorphic god directs his personal actions. When asked about Phoenix and the war on terror, Boykin said, I think we're running that kind of program. We're going after these people. Killing or capturing these people is a legitimate mission for the department. I think we're doing what the Phoenix program was designed to do without all of the secrecy. On July 16, 2012, Family Research Council President Tony Perkins announced that Boykin had been named the group's executive vice president. Like the terrible god Boykin believes in, with its savior crucified on a cross, the cancer Obama sought to destroy in Afghanistan was merely a projection of the dark side of the twisted American psyche, and more of a threat to the safety of the American people than to any Taliban or ISIS terrorist. Whomever the business party, in the name of its one true god, Mammon, forces upon the American people in the 2016 elections and beyond, his or her job will be to preserve the myth of America as altruistic liberator. The terrible truth is that a cult of death rules America and is hell-bent on world domination. Chapter 22 Parallels of Conquest, Past and Present After the bloody Battle of Hastings in 1066, William the Conqueror's army of Norman invaders buried its fallen comrades, but left the mangled corpses of the Anglo-Saxon defenders to rot in the fields. Wounded defenders were mutilated. William's shock and awe invasion quickly turned into a brutal occupation. The pacification strategy, like America's today, was to eliminate the enemy's leadership and terrorize the civilian population into submission. Colonization is murderous work. Anglo-Saxon lords had their eyes plucked out and their hands and feet cut off, and were left in chains in front of their castles for the peasants to behold. Others were castrated and thrown into the dungeon in one of the hundreds of castles William built across the countryside to defend Norman interests. The pacification campaign took twenty years. During that period, an estimated 300,000 indigenous peoples were murdered and starved to death, one-fifth of the population, and an equal number of French and Norman entrepreneurs and bureaucrats were planted in England in vacant positions of authority. The entire Anglo-Saxon nobility was exterminated. William took all their property and gave it to the Norman upper class. By the time William repented his sins on his deathbed in 1087, England had been totally transformed. Such is the beastly nature of colonial war. The victor inflicts all manner of suffering and humiliation on the vanquished and steals everything they own. Nearly a millennium later, the United States is doing the same thing in Iraq and Afghanistan. The only difference is that William the Conqueror bragged about his brutal theft of another nation and its wealth, while America's ruling class cloaks its barbarism and plunder under a veil of good intentions and self-defense. When accepting his Nobel Peace Prize, President Obama put on the Don Vito Act and said with a straight face, I believe the United States of America must remain a standard-bearer in the conduct of war. That is what makes us different from those whom we fight. That is a source of our strength. That is why I prohibited torture. 
That is why I ordered the prison at Guantanamo Bay closed, and that is why I have reaffirmed America's commitment to abide by the Geneva Conventions. All lies. From Tanfong to Ghazi Khan and a thousand villages in between, American boys have been slaughtering Muslim civilians as part of vicious pacification campaigns in nations that pose no threat to the United States. Guantanamo remains open, and CIA officers continue to torture Muslims there and in dozens of dungeons around the globe, hidden in CIA compounds on military bases, in secret police safe houses, and on U.S. Navy vessels. Boasting like William the Conqueror, ultras in the United States trumpet their disdain for international laws, the United Nations, and the Geneva Conventions. Due process for citizens in American colonies is non-existent and will soon evaporate in the U.S. too. While the U.S.-led occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan are different in minor details, there are disturbing parallels in the extent of the carnage and the strategy of coercion, in the innocent blood that has flowed, and the number of survivors who have been tormented, tortured, and terrorized. Just as William the Conqueror ignored the English battlefield dead, the U.S. government has not publicly identified nor even estimated the number of Iraqis, Afghanis, Libyans, and Syrians it has killed or caused to be killed during its invasions, occupations, and CIA-led insurgencies. Neither is anyone in the media publicly counting the number of Muslims the U.S. has killed, crippled, rendered homeless, starved, driven into poverty and despair, and or condemned to disease and insanity. U.S. government officials say they are looking away as a means of avoiding the body-count mindset that incentivized ambitious CIA and military personnel to commit mass murder during the Vietnam War. But looking away also makes it impossible to quantitatively measure the amount of misery U.S. policymakers are wreaking on civilian populations in nations they have ravaged since 9-11. The lack of official numbers also enables the U.S. government to cast doubt on unofficial estimates that put the number of Iraqi dead alone in the hundreds of thousands or possibly over one million. Most reports in the mainstream U.S. news media cite much lower estimates to avoid offending the powers that be in Washington. Out of the Press As much as possible, U.S. leaders have sought to keep the ugliness of these wars, the mangled bodies, the burned-off faces, the squalid refugee camps, the abused captives, out of the press and away from the public's consciousness, in order to preserve the pretense of moral superiority that defines American exceptionalism. One advantage of having no official casualty estimates and few photos of atrocities in Muslim nations is that the American people aren't reminded of the horrendous consequences of the wars of aggression launched by Presidents Bush and Obama. Making Americans feel good about their wars is a top priority of American politicians. By suppressing the human toll and censoring the press, the Bush regime was able to sell the wars against Afghanistan and Iraq as benefiting the Afghani and Iraqi people. That fiction has been thoroughly dispelled by the rise of ISIS from the heap of ashes that once was Iraqi and Syrian culture. Raised in America's Gulag archipelago of detention and torture centers, many young Muslim men know nothing about the world they have inherited except oppression and injustice. No wonder they are filled with rage. However manipulated or protected by the West, insofar as its actions further unstated U.S. goals, ISIS remains a manifestation of the intense suffering America has visited upon the Muslim peoples of North Africa, the Middle East, and Central Asia. And yet, the American media is able to shield our criminal leaders and allow them to avoid residual responsibility by blaming the rage of Muslim men on the nature of Islam, while always casting American methods and motives in a positive light. That is one big difference between the slaughter of Englishmen by William the Conqueror and the carnage unleashed by Bush and Obama and Hillary Clinton, our modern-day conquistadors. William's cruelty was done in the light of day. Our brave leaders rely on prevarication, stealth, and manufacturing complicity. 
Truth be told, the U.S. government does keep tabs on those it kills, maims, and renders as orphans. It simply doesn't want the American people to know the quantity or the specifics as a way of stripping the human dimensions from its actual war against Islam. In Afghanistan, for example, the CIA and military have conducted a census of every village, town, and city in the country, much like William's infamous Doomsday Book, which assessed the property, including tenant farmers, of every English landowner for the purpose of levying taxes or confiscation. And don't forget the extensive corporate studies on profitable Afghan resources. As reported in the 14 June 2010 New York Times, the previously unknown deposits, including huge veins of iron, copper, cobalt, gold, and critical industrial metals like lithium, are so big and include so many minerals that are essential to modern industry that Afghanistan could eventually be transformed into one of the most important mining centers in the world, the United States officials believe. An internal Pentagon memo, for example, states that Afghanistan could become the Saudi Arabia of lithium, a key raw material in the manufacture of batteries for laptops and blackberries. The vast scale of Afghanistan's mineral wealth was discovered by a small team of Pentagon officials and American geologists. The Afghan government and President Hamid Karzai were recently briefed, American officials said. Likewise, the commanders of the U.S. occupation armies know the name of every Afghan, Iraqi, Libyan, and Syrian property owner. So their analysts can decide who is a collaborator and might be spared, and who, in the vague vernacular favored by Hollywood-obsessed Americans, are the bad guys. The bad guys are invariably robbed, and their businesses plundered. U.S. businessmen wait in the wings, like Joe Biden's son in Ukraine, to gobble up the spoils. The facts are all there, but one needs to dig deeper than network news. Tracking the Taliban Through their ongoing surveys... American war managers determine where each man lives, how many people are in his family, who his wife and children and relatives are, where he works, and where his property is. In places like Marja, a Taliban stronghold in Afghanistan where a U.S.-led offensive unfolded in 2010, the CIA and military obtain actionable intelligence through their dubious networks of spies, as well as via electronic surveillance, including satellites. This biographical information about Afghanis is entered into a computer at occupation headquarters where the material is painstakingly monitored by the CIA and military special operations units for high-value targets and targets of opportunity, including business opportunity. Within a separate folder for suspected Taliban, every man is categorized by his rank and position within the organization. His valuable possessions are also known. Low-level fighters are left to the blue-collar Marines, while high-value targets are handled by the CIA and military special operations forces and their acquisitive collaborators in Afghanistan's warlord upper class. High-value targets get the kind of special attention William the Conqueror reserved for English noblemen whose possessions the Normans coveted. Make no mistake about it. High-value targets in Afghanistan own the property intellectual as well as material, including opium fields, that America's colonial administrators wish to own and share with their collaborators. As a result, much more biographical information is gathered about property owners than non-property owners, and their movements are tracked 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Through their spies and sophisticated electronic surveillance devices, CIA and military commanders have a very good idea when high-value targets are leaving one safe house and traveling to another. The jets are fueled, the drones are in the sky, and the black choppers are fueled and waiting. This is how and why 27 Afghan civilians were slaughtered on 21 February 2010 while traveling between remote provinces in a caravan of minibuses. The CIA and military special operations forces were alerted that some high-value target was traveling with his family, and General Stanley McChrystal seized the opportunity to kill them all. For despite their alleged disinterest in body count, the CIA exists solely to start wars, and military commanders like McChrystal solely to kill in them, 
so American businessmen can steal everything they own. The only way for individual CIA and military officers to succeed and become wealthy warlords is to show piles of dead bodies, like the English corpses laid out at Hastings. In dirty wars like the ones in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, and Syria, killing high-value targets almost always means murdering them while they are at home or while traveling with their families. Despite the spin, it is official if unstated policy, for the killing of a nation's leaders along with their entire families has a devastating psychological warfare impact on the rest of society. The mainstream U.S. news media plays along by never citing this central fact of U.S. dirty wars. The killing of civilians is always dismissed as accidental and is always accompanied by a routine apology from some anonymous U.S. spokesperson whose facts cannot be challenged because they are classified, and it is said to release them might put Americans at risk of being tried for war crimes. Most of all, killing important leaders along with their families makes it easier to buy their vacated property at 10% of its value, always a perk for American geologists and the U.S. Occupation Army's corporate camp followers. Savagery, Past and Present Though U.S. media propagandists treat CIA and military commanders as honorable warriors doing the hard work necessary to protect America, the truth is that they are no less savage than William the Conqueror or the ISIS militants demonized for atrocities. Both spread terror by killing their enemies, dismembering bodies, and inflicting death and cruelty on non-combatants as well. One needs only to see the bodies mutilated by missiles fired from drones or helicopter gunships. Rhode Island Senator Jack Reed, patron of Textron Systems and the senior Democrat on the Senate Armed Services and Intelligence Committee, is a typical American businessman in his blue suit and red tie, with his manicured fingernails and distinguished white hair, selling 15,000-pound daisy cutters to Saudi Arabia for use in Yemen. Daisy cutters were perfected in Vietnam and Afghanistan and brought huge profits to many members of Reed's enterprising class. The only difference between them and William the Conqueror is that the Norman leaders actually fought alongside their men, unlike American chicken-hawk politicians. William and his army did their killing up close, with battle axes and swords for everyone to see, while American politicians and their high-tech killing machines inflict their carnage from far away with 2,000-pound bombs, and then cloak the horror behind censorship and propaganda. These cover-ups are essential. Otherwise, the American public might resist Washington's imperial adventures, which often end up with working-class American soldiers dead or maimed, while invisible U.S. corporate bosses slither away with valuable resources from the conquered countries or otherwise use them for economic or geopolitical ends. This strategy works because most Americans don't know, and many don't care to know, the names and biographies of their victims. Chapter 23 Propaganda as Terrorism Interviewer's Note Author Douglas Valentine says that the United States does not abide by any of its international obligations and its calls for war against Syria violate international law and the U.N. Charter. Quote, The U.S. has threatened about 50 nations with military attack. Warmongers on the left and right claim this right on the basis that America is an exceptional nation. That means the U.S. is an exception to all laws. It is the policeman of the world, and policemen don't obey laws. They enforce them on others, said Douglas Valentine in an exclusive interview with the FARS news agency. What follows is the text of FNA's October 2013 interview with Mr. Valentine on the ongoing crisis in Syria and the U.S. war threats against it. The interview has been updated, but is meant as a general overview, not a comprehensive review of all events. Kurosh Ziabari The U.S. war rhetoric on Syria looms large these days. 
and despite the agreement between the United States and Russia to bring serious chemical weapons under the UN safeguards, as well as the ceasefire agreement arranged by Secretary of State John Kerry and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov in September 2016, some extremist neocons in the U.S. Congress and administration are continuing to call for a military strike against Syria. Indeed, on 17 to 18 September, U.S. and British military forces sought to undermine the ceasefire agreement by bombing Syrian army forces against U.S. and Israeli-backed ISIS forces. Why does the United States persist on its hawkish policies? Hasn't it learned a lesson from its previous military adventures in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya? Valentine America's greatest strength is its vast military forces and intelligence services. This is what makes America the dominant world power, not its diplomatic corps, which serves primarily as a stalking horse. Americans identify with and celebrate their military prowess, their many wars, and their honored war dead. The extremist neocons were the group most associated with this militant ethic in America, but the Democratic Party under hawkish Hillary Clinton has adopted the same ethic. In order to win the support of the thoroughly brainwashed American public, this protected group of war profiteers portrays themselves as the guardians of America's prestige, which is symbolized by the military, which in turn is always viewed as heroic. For its part, the military's inclination is to always call for action, in high hopes of accommodating its financial backers and prospective employers in the U.S. arms industry, which needs to expend ammunition and constantly develop new weapons in order to make profits. There are always vocal exceptions, but the policy has been in place for generations and advances on a specific course like an aircraft carrier fleet, which can only be tweaked and never driven off course. It is more complex than that, of course. There are also the dynamics of American culture to consider. The sense many Americans have that they are exceptional and destined to rule with an iron fist a world that is hostile to the American way. Donald Trump is the popular manifestation of this America as victim delusion. It is the lie in the soul that enables America to project its collective shadow on the other. This has been recognized for decades. On 4 April 1967, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. delivered his famous Beyond Vietnam speech at the Riverside Church, citing a very obvious and almost facile connection between the war in Vietnam and the struggle I and others have been waging in America. King said he had moved into an even deeper level of awareness, through which he realized that he could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. The speech was considered treachery by America's ultras, and a year later King was dead, assassinated allegedly by a petty criminal, a lone gunman who had been paid by a cabal of mafioso and southern racists, while under 24-hour-a-day surveillance by the FBI, military intelligence, and local police forces. On 7 May 1970, the eminent British historian Arnold Toynbee put his life on the line when he said in the New York Times, For the whole world, the CIA has now become the bogey that communism has been for America. Wherever there is trouble, violence, suffering, tragedy, the rest of us are now quick to suspect the CIA had a hand in it. Toynbee was responding to Henry Kissinger's barbaric invasion of Cambodia. In fact, Toynbee continued, the roles of America and Russia have been reversed in the world's eye. Today, America has become the world's nightmare. For many years, even the so-called left believed America was in a life-and-death struggle with the Soviet Union. This Cold War was fought largely in the Third World, though the Americans were conducting all manner of covert political actions in Europe as well to assure that no industrial state would emerge as a threat to its economic interests there. Average Americans believed they were fighting totalitarian communism in Africa, for example, while in reality the capitalist elite was suppressing nationalism and independent economic policies of emerging states that favored their domestic development. We were stealing their wealth and resources, but it had to be done in a way that assuaged the public. 
so the job was given to the CIA. The CIA, covered by complicit media, still and in greater force operates in the shadows as a projection of the dark, rapacious side of the American psyche. With the rise of the fundamentalists in Iran in 1979 and the demise of the Soviet Union ten years later, America's ruling elite has been able to redirect the energies of the American people away from communist and socialist nations toward Muslim nations, all of which are stigmatized as inscrutable, inferior, and hostile. The holy crusade against Islam and the attendant wave of manufactured hatred sweeping America began when Richard Pearl and a cabal of pro-Israeli neocons in the Bush administration's Office of Special Plans grabbed control of the mighty Wurlitzer, the CIA's propaganda machine, see Chapter 20, after 9-11. They created the conditions for neocolonial imperialism in order to ensure Israel's ability to appropriate Palestinian land and to prevent the Russians and Iranians from exerting any influence in the Middle East. Through a carefully orchestrated propaganda campaign, assisted by the Israeli lobby and other ideologically attuned organizations, they trained the American people to love the song Trump is singing out loud, Ban Muslims and Mexican Immigrants. This nativist call to arms against the other encompasses black Americans, whose struggles for equality are still resented by a large percentage of Americans. Sixty years after King brought the civil rights movement into mainstream American politics, blacks are still being gunned down by cops and confined to segregated communities. The hatred is visceral and ubiquitous. Trump symbolizes the embedded racism within America. Make America great again means make America white again. The racists are proud of it. In order for an individual to lead America, he or she must represent this supremacist might-is-right ethic. It is part of the irreversible strategic course I referred to early in my aircraft carrier fleet allusion. National security in the United States is equated with white supremacy. It always will be. The entire strategy is wrapped in lies and deceptions and double standards. During an address to Dartmouth College in May 2015, Hillary Clinton defined Iran as an existential threat to Israel and promised that as president she would happily obliterate Iran if Israel's protection required it. She made this statement despite the fact that Iran has no nuclear weapons and Israel has 200, all of which, as former Secretary of State Colin Powell observed, are pointed at Iran. If that isn't an existential threat, nothing is. Clinton has also expressed her willingness to use cluster bombs and toxic agents as well as nuclear weapons. She is also a proponent of Bush's first strike policy. As Secretary of State, she proved her militancy by destroying Libya and chiding Obama for not doing likewise to Syria. She is truly vicious, but that's what Americans want in a leader. I'll give you an example. While having my teeth cleaned recently, I asked the hygienist how her son was doing. She said he was in the Air Force repairing fighter planes in Saudi Arabia. I asked her how she felt about that. With no compunctions or self-awareness, she said, Better to kill them over there before they kill us here. She represents the prevailing sentiment. Only a very few enlightened individuals are aware of the problem, and they are incapable of preventing the rich political elite from seeking a military solution to every problem the CIA provokes. As our strutting leaders love to proclaim, they rule the world, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. As President Putin said in an op-ed for the New York Times, America's elite increasingly relies on brute force to get what it wants, and what it wants is to assert its power and to control all other nations of the world. The political elite must also accommodate its financial backers in the Israeli lobby and arms industry, there is certainly a lot of outside pressure on America from various nations, but most of the so-called left has been assimilated and is as dedicated to these supremacist ends as the ultras are, as the achievement of these ends validates their sense of superiority and enables them to prosper. Seen from this perspective, the wars in Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan, Somalia, Sudan, and Syria are going just fine. 
America has destroyed any significant progress those nations had made in education, health care, infrastructure such as water treatment and electricity, postal services, courts. By degrading the standards of living for people in perceived hostile nations, America's ruling elite empowers itself while claiming that it has ensured the safety and prestige of the American people. Sometimes it is even able to convince the public that its criminal actions are humanitarian and designed to liberate the people in nations it destroys. Ziabari, in recent days, and especially after the United States discarded its plans for attacking Syria following its agreement with Russia concerning chemical weapons, this occurred in September 2013, more attention has been paid to the role of Iran in resolving the crisis in Syria and bringing to an end the almost three-year civil war in the Arab country. The United States has so far refused to accept that Iran should be included in the comprehensive international talks about Syria, but a number of American newspapers and TV channels are suggesting that Iran needs to be part of the talks for finding a solution to the Syrian dilemma. What's your viewpoint about the role Iran can play in ending the violence and unrest in Syria? Valentine The U.S. has not discarded its plans to destabilize Syria and oust Assad. It never will. The equation changed when Russia interceded and began attacking ISIS. That led to a tenuous ceasefire in early 2016 in which Iran and other regional players had a voice. But it was an exercise in futility— as Obama was by then a lame duck, and John Kerry was viewed as giving away the store by the entrenched national security establishment, which will never accept any Russian influence in the region. Russia still attacked ISIS, and the CIA and America's client Arab states still armed and supported anti-Assad forces. Ultimately, the U.S. military took matters into its own hands, as it tends to do when a new administration is waiting in the wings, and it bombed Syrian army forces, killing and wounding dozens. As it always does, the U.S. propaganda machine characterized this terrorist attack as a mistake, but the results speak for themselves. The U.S. national security establishment does not follow international law and reserves the right to kill as many people as it wants without any consequences and without acknowledging it is policy. Having said that, I am unaware of the plans and strategies of Iran's ruling elite. I assume there are conflicting forces in determining those plans and strategies. It's my understanding that Iran publicly backs Assad, as does Russia, and that Iran seeks to help Assad defeat the rebels, many of whom are foreign mercenaries trained and financed by the CIA, Israel, Jordan, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia. I assume Iran will impose its will on the situation to whatever extent it can, whether through direct negotiations, indirect negotiations, or in the absence of negotiations. In view of its having sabotaged Kerry's ceasefire, it is obvious that the national security establishment is unwilling to negotiate an end to the crisis. It created the crisis as part of a long-term strategy to defend Israel and help effectuate its racist expansionist policies while gobbling up the region's resources and countering Russian influence. America does not recognize Syria's sovereignty and has violated that sovereignty for years through covert action and its support for the mercenary armies attacking Syria. Iran ought to be officially involved in negotiations around Syria's fate. But if history is any indicator, the U.S. is an unreliable negotiating partner. Some American national security officials and politicians might accept Iranian participation in negotiations, but only as window dressing and a cover for more covert political actions. It's hard to know what Trump would do, but I suspect he would become a willing captive of the national security establishment. We know Hillary Clinton won't deal honestly with Iran and will only accept a deal that leaves Syria in the same hellhole the Palestinians inhabit. Trump said he didn't want to create more refugees, but Clinton keeps calling for regime change in Syria. Her policies created the conditions that sent Syrian refugees pouring into Europe, with the result that certain European nations are destabilized and Syria no longer poses a threat to Israel, which has pretty much annexed the Golan Heights. Obama and Secretary of State John Kerry are marginalized, 
and Syria has been totally destabilized, as Hillary Clinton intended when she started the insurgency. We have seen the U.S. and Iran reach an agreement. Iran agreed to abandon its nuclear weapons program, and the U.S. agreed in return not to obliterate Iran as Clinton threatened. But Iran has still not agreed to the partition of Syria, and that could sweep the old agreements away. To that end, the U.S. and its regional allies continue to engage in covert actions and maintain sanctions against Iran in hopes of provoking a response that will give the ultras, under Trump or Clinton, a green light to attack Iran in one way or another. Remember, the U.S. elites do not consider Iran to be a sovereign nation. It was an American colony, from the CIA's 1953 coup d'etat and installation of the Shah until 1979, when students, leftists, and Islamists tossed him out. But the U.S. national security establishment hasn't forgiven that blow to its prestige, and prestige, as I mentioned earlier, is the ambiguous measure for all policy decisions. It will never forgive Russia for the same reason. It still thinks Iran is a colony, like a slave that temporarily escaped into Mexico. The U.S. won't negotiate honestly with a former colony, so what purpose would negotiations serve? Ziabari. There have been extensive reports indicating that Saudi Arabia, Israel, Jordan, and Qatar were involved in supplying chemical weapons and illicit materials to the rebels in Damascus and other Syrian cities. With such weapons, the rebels would be able to destabilize Syria and sponsor insecurity and unrest there. Why don't the international organizations take action to stop them and their dangerous actions? Valentine. By international organizations, I assume you mean the UN and Human Rights Watch. I'm not sure why these organizations adhere to the American line that Assad's forces are responsible when even ultra-pundits like Rush Limbaugh accused Obama of staging the chemical attacks as a provocation. The simple answer, I suppose, is that the CIA has suborned top officials in these international organizations. We know the NSA spies on everyone, and that the NSA passes information to the CIA. Perhaps these officials have been bribed or blackmailed. There is certainly enough corruption to go around. Others may have aligned with the U.S. for ideological reasons. There is certainly no objectivity or even a pretense of objectivity. The World Court and ICC don't do anything against the U.S. for the same reasons. To look to international organizations for relief is ridiculous. Ziabari. According to the French interior minister, Manuel Valls, in 2013 there were 110 French terrorists fighting the government of President Bashar al-Assad in Syria. This meant that half of the European combatants taking place in the civil war in Syria at the time came from France. Some commentators suggest that France is looking for ways to regain its colonial dominance over Syria, and that is why President François Hollande continually pushed for a war against Syria. What's your viewpoint on that, Valentine? If history is any indicator, that is correct. A century ago, France persuaded the Tsar to mobilize against Germany after Germany had finally reached an agreement with Russia. It was this action, taken with the consent of the British government, that ultimately triggered the Great War. France's elite are economically and ideologically aligned with the U.S. and U.K. elites, against socialism anywhere, and against nationalism in other nations seeking sovereignty. And that includes the Socialist Party. It is a major colonial power. France wants its colonies, along with the wealth that colonialism entails and prestige, back. It has never given up control of the Algerian army, just like the U.S. continues to control the South Korean military. The U.K. was the primary fighter in Libya. Hollande is a socialist when he runs for office, but like every other French president, governs like an imperialist. On 17 July 2016, using CIA intelligence, France slaughtered 120 civilians in Syria. It was a symbolic gesture done to avenge the killing of dozens of people in Nice by a non-practicing Muslim from Tunisia. There was no other reason to attack Syria. The flood of Syrian refugees into Europe the attack on the Charlie Hebdo cartoonists in Paris in 2015, the bombings in Brussels in 2016, and finally Nice, have been used by French and American propagandists as an excuse for imperial aggression. 
Islamophobia is reaching a crescendo in France. French Minister Bernard Cazeneuve said they will start shutting down mosques that preach hate and violence. They will check all the mosques and imams in France. Trump and his nativist faction want to do the same thing in America. Ziabari. According to the UN Charter and the General Treaty for Renunciation of War as an Instrument of National Policy, to which the U.S. is a signatory, the unilateral use of military force or threatening to use force against a sovereign nation is illegal and a violation of international law. However, the U.S. has repeatedly threatened Syria with a military strike, and no international organization has raised its voice to protest the U.S. calls for war. What do you think in this regard? Valentine. The U.S. has threatened about 50 nations with military attack. American militants on the left and right claim this right on the basis that America is an exceptional nation, meaning international laws don't apply to it. It is the policemen of the world, and as everyone knows, policemen don't obey laws. They enforce them on others. There is nothing anyone can do about it. The U.S. has a monopoly on force. Sovereignty is the key issue from the standpoint of international organizations and international law. But it is impossible for the U.N. to acknowledge that America engages in aggression within the meaning of the act, because 1. The U.S. can intimidate enough U.N. members, and 2. The U.N. itself has a long history of intervention, going back to Korea and the Congo. The U.N. is largely an instrument of U.S. foreign policy. Ziabari if you look at what many former U.S. officials and intelligence executives say, you'll find that many of them are opposed to a U.S. military strike against Syria. They argue that the United States does not have the legal or political authority, that it's not Washington's business to do the tasks of an international policeman. Do you agree? Valentine. What does it matter what I think or they think, or what the laws say? If it wishes, the United States can rain death and destruction down on Syria simply through its air and naval power. It can do to Syria what was done to Libya. It can do what Israel did in 2009 in Gaza and did again in 2014. Sure, the U.S. regime has no legal authority to do anything in Syria, but it is already violating international law by giving weapons to the so-called rebels. The U.S. military and the CIA will do what they are told to do. The job of CIA officers is to follow illegal orders, to provoke a crisis. I don't trust anything former military or intelligence officers say, even when I agree with them, because they tend to couch subtle deceptions and ulterior motives in their statements. They say one thing and secretly do another. Ziabari. Some analysts and critics of the U.S. foreign policy say that the U.S. is adopting a hypocritical attitude toward the concept of terrorism by supporting and arming the al-Qaeda and ISIS-aligned mercenaries fighting in Syria, while it has launched its project of war on terror with the purported aim of dismantling the same al-Qaeda and ISIS organizations, which the United States considers a threat to global peace. Why is the United States behaving in such an insincere manner? Valentine. The war on terror is a monumental fraud, the greatest covert operation ever. As recently reported in Russia Today, Obama waived America's own anti-terrorism provisions to arm its mercenaries in Syria, a process the CIA has been managing for five years anyway, the way it manages the international trade in illicit drugs. Reagan called CIA-backed terrorists in Nicaragua freedom fighters. It just goes on and on. Al-Qaeda and ISIS provide America with a pretext to intervene in every Muslim nation in the world and to wage preemptive wars, as promulgated on 20 September 2002 in the National Security Strategy of the United States. That's the imperial first-strike strategy Hillary Clinton has embraced. Al-Qaeda and ISIS also provide mercenaries to topple governments like Syria's that the U.S. does not like. The U.S. has really never been against al-Qaeda. The CIA created al-Qaeda in Afghanistan as a force against the Soviets and has used factions of al-Qaeda to fight in Chechnya, Kosovo, Bosnia, and other places. The U.S. has created a colonial army of mercenaries, much like the British did with their Nepalese Gurkhas. The U.S. mercenaries are from all over the Muslim world. They are fighting in Africa right now. This is the U.S. proxy army worldwide, 
trained by U.S. special forces under CIA control. Ultimately, the term Al-Qaeda is an empty vessel used to tell whatever story the U.S. government needs to tell to justify its wars to its own people. Orwell described the phenomenon very well. 1984 is full of war reporting where the allies and enemies are constantly changing from day to day. The terms friend and foe ceased to have any recognizable meaning for those watching the TV screen. That's where we are today. Ziabari, Iran and Russia say that diplomacy is the best way to deal with the crisis in Syria and eradicate extremism and fanaticism in the Arab country. But the United States hasn't so far allowed diplomacy and dialogue to work. Why is it insisting on a military solution to the crisis in Syria, while a negotiated solution through a comprehensive national dialogue can solve all the problems? Valentine The U.S. does not negotiate unless a preponderance of circumstances compels it to do so. Consider the events at the U.S. Embassy in Tehran in 1980. Reagan famously refused to negotiate with terrorists, even while secretly selling arms to Iran as part of a policy to destabilize Iraq and Iran on behalf of Israel. The reality of CIA and Mossad's support for Savak, or the fact that the Shah allowed the CIA to use Iranian nationals and territory to spy in Russia, was never mentioned. All that mattered were the photographs of Americans bound and blindfolded and being held as hostages. All that matters is that Americans have died in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Libya. When pushed into a corner as to why she was instrumental in and celebrated the murder of Gaddafi, Hillary Clinton forgets all about the humanitarian intervention cover story. All that mattered was that Gaddafi, she said, had blood on his hands, as if she doesn't. Reconciliation and negotiations are impossible when a nation is committed solely to dominance and vengeance. They are merely tactical maneuvers in a bigger game. The American war against Syria and its covert actions against Iran are part of a larger strategy to weaken and encircle Russia. The U.S. is insisting on a military solution because it believes that Iran and Russia will ultimately sacrifice Syria to avoid war with the U.S. Syria is just another domino about to fall. The goal of the American elite is to make Syria, and then Iran, and then Russia, join the ranks of Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Libya, and Iraq. The plan is to smash it into ethnic and religious lines and to fuel fighting between these groups for many years. Time will tell if I'm right. Chapter 24 The War on Terror as the Greatest Covert Op Ever The War on Terror is the greatest covert operation ever. In explaining why, I'll begin by defining some terms, because when discussing business politics and terrorism, word management is all important. The FBI defines terrorism as the unlawful use of force and violence against persons or property to intimidate or coerce a government, the civilian population, or any segment thereof, in furtherance of political or social objectives. Clearly, this ambiguous definition begs the question, when is terrorism lawful? The U.S. government's stated policy regarding terrorism is well known. It always condemns terrorism, and accordingly America is never a perpetrator of terrorism, but always a victim of it. The war on terror is the ultimate expression of this stated policy. It is lawful violence in self-defense, not unlawful violence by a non-state actor for a political or social purpose. That is the stated policy incessantly hammered into the dim American collective consciousness by Pentagon and State Department saturation ad campaigns. But if one looks behind the suffocating cloak of secrecy, censorship, and propaganda that surrounds the government's unstated policies, an entirely different story emerges about deliberate war crimes against humanity committed on a massive scale. Like Diogenes with his lantern held high, I visited the FBI office in Springfield, Massachusetts, on 21 November 2012. I didn't have an appointment, but one of the resident agents agreed to listen to me. My intent was to make him respond to evidence of the CIA's engagement in and support for terrorism in Syria. 
To that end, I cited a 21 June 2012 New York Times article stating that a small number of CIA officers are operating secretly in southern Turkey, helping allies decide which Syrian opposition fighters across the border will receive arms to fight the Syrian government, according to American officials and Arab intelligence officers. I asked the FBI agent if the article wasn't proof that CIA officers were engaged in terrorism. Not only was CIA violence designed to overthrow the Syrian government, it was driving thousands of civilians into poverty, ruin, early graves, and the despair of exile. And while the President and Congress undoubtedly gave the CIA legal authority to overthrow the Syrian government, its violence against innocent Syrian civilians was certainly illegal, yes? I added that, according to the Times, CIA officers arranged for tons of weapons to be smuggled across the Turkish border by way of a shadowy network of intermediaries that included jihadists the U.S. government itself identified as terrorists. Apart from managing a criminal conspiracy within the illegal arms and drugs smuggling network, I said, the CIA's arming of al-Qaeda constituted support for terrorism, even if the U.S. media kindly refers to the CIA-sponsored terrorists in Syria as rebels. The flabbergasted FBI agent referred me to FBI headquarters, and after a lot of artful dodging, FBI spokeswoman Kathleen Wright threw in the towel and said, With regarding to questions about the CIA or USG policy related to the CIA, that is not within our lane to answer. In other words, the nation's premier law enforcement entity has no legal authority over the CIA. And only within the context of this institutionalized double standard can the profitable business of American terrorism be properly understood. As I hope to show in this chapter, the CIA is the preferred weapon in this international criminal enterprise because it conducts its terrorism secretly and you never know about it. And when revealed accidentally, like in the recent Gulen flap, or for propaganda purposes, CIA terrorism is always equated with national security. When defined as extra-legal self-defense, it is called counter-terrorism. The CIA manages the international arms trade like it manages the drug trade, through a covert army of mercenaries from every nation, all of whom are homicidal maniacs with combat experience and a thirst for more of it. During the Vietnam War, the CIA paramilitary officers in charge of this army were called knuckle-draggers. The mercenary army is supported by deep-cover CIA finance officers operating offshore banks like Nugan Hand, deep-cover logistics officers like Ed Wilson running proprietary and deniable shipping companies, and foreign intelligence staff officers within the CIA's back-channel counter-terror network corrupting strategically placed military officers and special policemen, often trained at American schools, as well as politicians, who then provide safe passage for drug traffickers and black sites for torture as needed, all compartmentalized and managed by the big bosses at CIA Central. CIA officers and their political bosses are never punished for engaging in terrorism. As we recently learned, they even get away with planting plastic explosives in a Virginia school bus. It was a training exercise, we are told. But why are CIA officers trained to plant explosives in school buses? Because once you enter the CIA, the rest of us, even school kids, are either lab rats or cannon fodder as far as the CIA is concerned. Psychological Warfare and Covert Operations Politics is said to be the process by which people make collective decisions. But who really makes the overarching political decisions in America? Who makes terrorism policy? America is ostensibly a nation of laws, but our elected officials in Congress, the nation's premier lawmaking body, have exempted CIA officers engaged in terrorism from federal laws aimed at terrorists. When CIA officers are revealed to be engaged in terrorism, as in Syria, the media does its job and follows the script. It never reveals the contradictions that permit state-sponsored terrorism. The continued existence of this big lie is truly phenomenal, given the mass of available evidence exposing it. Yet it is applied systematically, without exception, 
as the essential feature of spectacular domination with the desired effect. A majority of Americans not only believe it, they applaud it. They believe that CIA officers engage in terrorism to protect them. Convincing them of this is the greatest covert operation ever. As Carl Jung said, everyone carries a shadow, and the less it is embodied in the individual's conscious life, the blacker and denser it is. The business party that rules America has helped to impose this mass psychosis on its customers and consumers. It is essential to perpetuating the capitalist system in which 1% of the population possesses most of the nation's wealth. Should the people emerge from the shadows of self-deception and stop projecting their irrationality onto others, the house of cards would collapse. In order to maintain the fiction that America does not engage in terrorism, the government and media, on behalf of big business, deceive the public in a variety of practiced ways that can best be discerned and understood if viewed as a standard covert action program. The CIA will only launch a covert action if it meets two criteria. First, it must have intelligence potential. It must be able to gain knowledge that allows it to shape events that advance its plans and objectives. For example, smuggling arms to terrorists in Syria allows CIA officers to gather intelligence on military and criminal activity in the region. Other times, the intelligence potential involves knowing things that allow CIA officers to influence masses of people psychologically as a means of managing political and social movements at home and, like ISIS, abroad. The second criterion of a covert action program is plausible deniability. In 1975, during Senate hearings into CIA assassination plots against foreign leaders, plausible denial was defined by the CIA's Deputy Director of Operations as the use of circumlocution and euphemism in discussions where precise definitions would expose covert actions and bring them to an end. Legalized double standards fall into this category, as does the entire range of government disinformation and propaganda. A standard covert action program is buried in layers of cover stories. As Winston Churchill and later Joe Pesci famously said, it's a mystery wrapped in a riddle inside an enigma. Churchill also said that in wartime truth is so precious that she should always be attended by a bodyguard of lies. As I've explained elsewhere, CIA operations are often disguised as civic action programs designed to help people, like the vaccination program in Pakistan that led to the assassination of Osama bin Laden, or the CIA's Phoenix program in Vietnam, which advertised itself as protecting the people from terrorism. Covert actions directed against the American people also meet these two criteria. They advance the government's unstated plans and can be plausibly denied. They are largely psychological, although accidental deaths have been known to occur. They occur in the realm of consciousness and are simultaneously abstract and determinant. The government wages psi war against the American public in various ways for various purposes. The CIA plants deceptive articles in foreign newspapers, like the recent Panama Papers leak. Domestic media are notified and dutifully report the stories. Such disinformation, or black propaganda, when the stories are false, creates false perceptions that generate public support for military actions or economic sanctions against foreign governments the U.S. government wishes to subvert. Other times, it assures Americans that abusive regimes like Israel, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia are worthy of massive tax-funded aid programs. In either case, language is the key to creating perceptions and assumptions that justify immoral or illegal policies the American public would otherwise repudiate as state terrorism. Through language that deceives, intimidates, and coerces, the U.S. government's covert action programs are ultimately designed to terrorize Americans, to make them feel inferior, infantile, and powerless. This is the shadow side of the propaganda that makes them feel exceptional, of their vicarious enjoyment of being number one. They are also made to feel victimized, and the resulting confusion makes them governable in detrimental ways they would not choose if they knew the truth. 
The CIA, of course, is not the only branch of government that engages in disinformation. It happens across the board. What is important is to be able to recognize the modus operandi, and in particular, the language used to conceal bad intent. What is not said is often more telling than what is said. The war on Iraq is the premier example. Needing a pretext to launch a war of aggression to seize Iraq's oil and destabilize the region on behalf of Israel, the Bush regime launched a disinformation campaign to convince Americans that Iraq posed an existential threat. To this end, it planted false stories, such as the one that Iraq possessed a stockpile of yellow cake uranium that would result in an imminent mushroom cloud in America. The Bush administration's mushroom cloud descriptor terrorized the public, as did a New York Times article by Chris Hedges citing claims by defectors that Iraq was training terrorists to attack America. The defectors were fabricating, of course, on behalf of their CIA masters, just as there was no yellow cake being made into nuclear weapons for use against America. What actually happened was that a group of corrupt officials used the covert mechanisms of government to conduct a massive war of aggression, the ultimate form of terrorism, for personal gain, while throwing the world into chaos and the American public into debt and confusion. And even when the public does intermittently discern and understand that it was fooled, the social and bureaucratic systems put in place since World War II guarantee that the public is powerless to resist or effect any meaningful change. This is no secret, especially since 9-11. The invisible hands guiding our official rulers boast about their ability to shape perceptions of reality. Ron Suskind reported about this problem in a 17 October 2004 article for the New York Times magazine titled Faith, Certainty, and the Presidency of George W. Bush. In the article, Suskind quoted Bush political advisor Karl Rove as saying, We are an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. And while you are studying that reality, judiciously as you will, we'll act again creating other new realities, which you can study too. And that's how things will sort out. We're history's actors, and you, all of you, will be left to just study what we do. This imperial arrogance has been the nation's driving force since 1945, when America emerged unscathed from the ashes of World War II as the world's only superpower. Since then, those who secretly rule the U.S. have ruthlessly used the nation's military might and economic clout to punish foreign nations that impede its plans for global hegemony. They have succeeded in this business venture by waging the greatest covert operation ever, one that has thoroughly conditioned the American public to believe it is a perpetual victim of foreign powers, when in fact it is victimized by its unnamed rulers with their own secret interests. The plan for world hegemony is rooted in language. The anti-communist discourse put in place after World War II evolved through the collapse of the Soviet Union and the rise of Islamic fundamentalism into the current discourse of terrorism, the new bête noire. Anyone operating outside the realm of pseudo-critique could discern this sea change in stated policy after the terror attacks of 11 September 2001. It was explicitly articulated in the days after 9-11. Republican Party stalwart Kenneth W. Starr, who served as President Bill Clinton's impeachment inquisitor, said the danger of terrorism required deference to the judgments of the political branches with respect to matters of national security. In other words, national security, which had been nonpartisan, would henceforth be controlled by the ultra-conservative business branch of American politics. According to Richard Thornburg, who served as Attorney General under Presidents Reagan and George W. H. Bush, America should also henceforth stop abiding by the law. Thornburg said that due process sometimes strangles us. When it comes to counterterrorism, the former attorney general said, legally admissible evidence may not be the be-all and end-all. It is no coincidence that when Thornburg and Starr made these carefully choreographed pronouncements, government officials had already drafted administrative detention laws aimed at Americans while establishing the torture chamber at Guantanamo. In the wake of 9-11, America's reactionary ultra-clique claimed ownership of the national security apparatus, 
which it used to impose its ideology on the American people. Anyone who did not adopt their doctrine was considered an enemy of the state. This is time for the old motto, kill them all, let God sort them out, purported terrorism expert Michael Ledeen asserted. The entire political world will understand it and applaud it, and it will give us a chance to prevail. This is where the symbolic meaning of words prevails. By the political world, Ledeen meant those who really understand the deep underside of how the whole war process works. The owners of the burgeoning terrorism business, the secret rulers and capitalist looters who've been manipulating American political and social movements since its inception. Taken together, Starr, Thornburg, and Ledeen's rhetoric is emblematic of the false perceptions that Americans traditionally embrace about their victimhood and exceptionalism. The rhetoric of the ultras paved the way for the reorganization of American society to fight an eternal, one-size-fits-whatever war on terror, which in turn was used to justify disastrous neo-colonial wars against Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, and Syria. And it was all a big lie designed to enrich a few protected individuals. It doesn't matter that an American is more likely to be killed by a bee sting than a terrorist attack. It doesn't matter that, in comparison, 30,000 people die every year in automobile accidents. They climb into their SUVs and hurtle down the highway at 80 miles per hour, heedless of the danger. But it's terrorism they fear. A survey conducted in December 2015 found that about 79% of respondents believe a terrorist attack is somewhat likely or very likely in the next few months. Around 19% of respondents said they believe terrorism is the most important national issue, up from 4% last month. This irrational fear is both the instigator and result of the war on terror, the greatest covert operation ever devised, in which America's secret rulers manipulate the information industry to enrich themselves and enslave the nation's citizens while cutting a swath of righteous savagery around the world. Which begs the question, who are these secret rulers? The National Security Establishment Through their control of the media, political and bureaucratic systems, America's secret rulers engage in terrorism abroad and at home for economic purposes. This foreign domestic symmetry was articulated by Marx and Engels, when they demonstrated how capitalists wage imperial wars abroad for the exact same reasons they create systems to oppress labor at home. The objective is to maximize profits and concentrate wealth and political power in fewer and fewer hands. The global war on terror and its domestic homeland security counterpart are flip sides of the same counterfeit coin. They are the capitalist ideology applied to foreign and domestic security policy. And like the capitalist system it serves, an unstated national security policy is consolidated in fewer and fewer ideologically correct hands as the empire expands and its contradictions become more apparent. This consolidation of power is antithetical to democratic institutions, and results not in greater security for American citizens, but in the loss of legal protections like due process. The consolidation of national security policy also means the deterioration of the two-party electoral system. In theory, America's two major political parties represent opposing ideologies. Democrats are pro-labor, but divided into a socialist left, which wishes to smash the big banks, and the compatible left of Hillary Clinton, which is aligned to Goldman Sachs, Israel, and the imperial war machine. Joe Biden's evolution illustrates how a labor boss was co-opted but continues to serve as a spectacular representation of what he no longer is. If one believes Biden's rhetoric, the Democratic Party elite seek to end income inequality and racial injustice and to enfranchise minorities rather than subvert Ukraine, take over its government and civic institutions, and steal its wealth. The Republican Party is openly racist, militant, and business-oriented. Trump's populist appeal seemed like a departure from Reagan elitism, but that was a result of shifting demographics, not establishment policies. 
The Republican base voted for Trump because of his outspoken racism. Trump didn't use code words like the party leadership. Either party may control the government for a period of time, but in theory, their open and honest dialectic resolves their ideological conflicts and pulls them inexorably to the center, thus creating the democracy that benefits everyone. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, the state endures and in times of crisis prevails without debate. Leaders in both political parties champion the state's preeminence. They rally round the flag and claim to do what's best for the country. The problem is that with the war on terror, America is constantly in crisis. When the state is revealed, sometimes accidentally, more often by the state itself for propaganda purposes, to have created the crisis, it is more important than ever for elected politicians to affirm that the state transcends politics and represents the nation's enduring interests. That's why, during the campaign, Clinton studiously avoided her role in destroying Iraq, Libya, and Syria, and instead presented herself as a dispassionate bureaucrat who understands the intricacies of the system and can make the tough decisions as the first female chair of what can be understood as the National Phoenix Committee. In Europe, the state is acknowledged as industry and is comprised of the people with the largest financial stake in any particular nation. Given their wealth and influence, these industrial elites, like the ancient nobility, are understood to have the experience and independence to engage in politics. Industry is ownership. It excludes wage earners, immigrants, refugees, and disenfranchised minorities. In America, the state is referred to as the establishment, as defined in the American Heritage Dictionary, an establishment, with a capital E, is an exclusive group of powerful people who rule a government or society by means of private agreements and decisions. The establishment owns, equips, and operates the instruments of state, and conspires to use them to its advantage to keep wages low and maximize profits. The CIA is the organized crime branch of this criminal conspiracy to rule a government or society by means of private agreement and decisions. The state's private commercial interests are protected by its military, judicial, law enforcement, intelligence, and security services, a.k.a. the National Security Establishment. We are taught that the bureaucrats and technocrats who administer these services are nonpartisan and dedicated solely to protecting all the citizens of the United States. Ensconced in top management jobs in the private and public sectors, these apparatchiks claim they can only serve the sacred trust by placing themselves above the law. Cops, as everyone knows, do not follow the law, they enforce it. The state's terrorism, the needless destruction of Iraq, Libya, and Syria, and before them Vietnam and dozens of other nations, is based upon the premise that its national security establishment is above politics. But that's just a cover story for the greatest covert operation ever. Here's how it works. Members of each party's hierarchy cultivate ideologically qualified candidates to run for public office. When elected, these officials appoint members of their party to top management jobs in the various bureaucracies. But when it comes to national security, no actual leftists are allowed. This is the determinant factor in the War on Terror. After generations of propaganda, from the Red Terror through the loyalty oaths of the McCarthy era, up until the eternal present of the War on Terror, being a leftist automatically disqualifies a candidate from serving in the national security establishment, which is dedicated to capitalism. Since 9-11, the commitment to fight Islamic terrorism and absolve America of any hint of engaging in terrorism is as stringent a requirement as anti-communism. No one who writes a book like this one will ever belong. One cannot belong if one understands and disapproves of the reality that the state conducts terrorism as its unstated policy against working people at home as well as foreign nations sitting on coveted natural resources. One cannot seek to hold office while denying the existence of an anthropomorphic God, America's righteousness, or the prevailing assumptions about the blessings of capitalism. 
for these myths describe the philosophical and psychological context in which the state's illegal operations are possible. They are the ultimate cover story, embodied in and embraced by the true believer. Conversely, the state's covert operations can only be discerned and understood by transcending these beliefs and assumptions. Transcending these self-destructive beliefs and assumptions is the most difficult challenge facing Americans. It is also the first step in an objective analysis of the components of the national security establishment. Such an analysis is not easily achieved, however, for the national security establishment is not accountable to the citizenry. One cannot make a citizen's arrest of a CIA officer, an FBI agent, or a cop for criminal activity, let alone a corporate executive or American president. Apart from the deliberately confusing pseudo-critiques that define the spectacle in which we flounder, the national security establishment has built a labyrinth of thoroughly anti-democratic moats around itself. Just as Rove, Starr, Thornburg, and Ledeen advocated, precisely to keep inquiring citizens out of its dirty business. They've destroyed as much evidence as possible. The military is the most obvious example, barricaded on bases at home and around the world, and fortified with its own judicial system. The military is divided into an upper class of highly indoctrinated officers who do not fraternize with the lower ranks. Officers are trained to send the lower ranks into battle to be maimed and killed. The lower ranks are trained to obey without question, and when they lose limbs and die, they are glorified as heroes who died for their country, not to advance the interests of the likes of Dick Cheney and Halliburton, what we loosely identify today as the 1%. The U.S. military machine is the world's biggest consumer of energy and its biggest polluter. It manages the foreign policy mechanisms of the government for self-serving purposes, gobbling up the nation's tax dollars in order to maintain a global protection racket that exists solely to keep shipping lanes open so American businesses can exploit foreign markets. Dominated by fascists, the military is the pillar of the state and is never said to be connected to business or politics. And that illusion is the establishment's greatest achievement. Unlike the military, the CIA operates undercover, provoking conflicts in Russia and China, in nations surrounding them, and in Muslim nations surrounding Israel, so the military has a pretext to intervene. Military intervention and intimidation assure that the military's corporate sponsors control the resources the military needs to maintain the empire. The FBI, as noted, has no legal mandate or ideological inclination to interfere in the CIA's illegal actions. Its lane is to infiltrate Muslim groups in America and sometimes prevent and other times provoke terror incidents here, while blurring the lanes between organized crime and the establishment. Based on the Phoenix program model developed in Vietnam and perfected in Latin America, the Department of Homeland Security, which is totally dependent on the war on terror, coordinates the lower-tier members of the national security establishment for the purpose of suppressing dissent in America. It does so through implicit violence. Top bureaucrats and technocrats like Nelson Brickham, who created the Phoenix program, coordinate the systems of repression from within invisible intelligence and operations centers, like the National Security Council, in league with trusted senators and congressmen, as well as representatives of big business, the media, and academia. The bureaucrats and technocrats organize the chains of command to focus power in certain areas for specific goals. The primary goal is to assure that the CIA enjoys plausible deniability in its criminal pursuit of the establishment's unstated policies. It's a shell game that allows elected representatives to claim they didn't know. The system is structured so that true power flows off the organizational charts presented to the public. All evidence leading back to the establishment is concealed, and no one is ever held accountable. To be invited into the national security establishment and to rise to a position to organize and manage American society, one must be to the manner born. Make millions of dollars like Trump, 
or submit to years of indoctrination calibrated to a series of increasingly restrictive security clearances designed to reject anyone who can't be ideologically assimilated. Endlessly proving one has embraced doctrine on various issues, Israel, Islam, terrorism, black lives, Mexican immigrants, etc., is the drawbridge an individual like Hillary Clinton must cross to enter the self-regulating national security establishment. The capacity to recite doctrine and engage in massive war crimes is what enables a person to rise to a position of authority within the ruling cult of death. The national security establishment's stated job is to defend the nation from foreign and domestic enemies, while expanding its economic and military influence abroad and preserving its freedoms at home. Its unstated job, conducted clandestinely, is to keep the lower classes from exerting any political control, publicly or privately, that might possibly result in the just and equitable redistribution of the establishment's wealth. It is to this unstated end that the ruling cult of death covertly engages in massive terrorism against the people it pretends to protect. Capitalism and State Terrorism the disenfranchised have no voice in making policy in America. Wolf Blitzer avoids acknowledging them and their viewpoints as assiduously as he stigmatizes Palestinians. They are Galliano's nobodies. They are not quoted in the New York Times. They have no access and cannot change conventions or alter basic assumptions about America, all of which are perpetuated in well-designed symbolic ways. But when the establishment exerts its overarching influence on government, the media does not define it as politics. It is the neutral, nonpartisan status quo. As with the financial crisis of 2008, big bankers were said to be too big to fail. They were credited with creating jobs and dutifully accommodated with trillion-dollar bailouts paid for by workers losing pension funds and furloughs. No questions asked, no need for Trump to release his tax returns, or Clinton to release her speeches to Goldman Sachs. Politicians representing liberal causes must accommodate the establishment and keep the system afloat in times of state-manufactured crises, such as the invasion of Iraq in 2003. If they don't, they are labeled un-American, which is how ownership is equated with national security. It has been this way since the wealthy landowners and merchants who organized the American Revolution raised and paid for armies out of their pockets. The Founding Fathers wrote the Constitution to preserve the prerogatives they purchased. That is why the media never identifies, let alone exposes or even investigates, wealthy individuals who benefit from tax breaks and offshore tax havens. The rich are never said to play the business card the way blacks are said to play the race card. According to conventional American assumptions, capitalism is not based on political power, but on ideologically neutral profits and the economic growth that provides for the common good. And even when the scandal of tax breaks and tax havens affects some unscrupulous politician or industrialist, there is no legal penalty imposed on the offender. Obscene wealth is not illegal or increasingly immoral. As part of the greatest covert operation ever, the national security establishment's unstated job is to preserve the systems that ensure inequality and obscene wealth in the face of needless poverty and suffering. Similar to the class divisions in the military, which is held aloft as the model of free American society, the lower classes cannot be allowed to enjoy the same degree of privilege and security as the upper classes. Workers are forced to live from paycheck to paycheck, on minimum wages, in perpetual fear of losing their jobs, homes, and medical benefits. The rich are not said to be sadistic for enjoying their lavish lifestyles, while the poor are paralyzed by the fear that their children will be condemned to the hopelessness of eternal indebtedness or, if they're a despised minority or immigrant, to rot in prison. The rich could easily share their wealth and power and relieve the suffering of the poor, but they don't, because instilling terror in the poor keeps them politically suppressed. Some of the lower classes have given up hope entirely. 
Some cling to rainmakers like Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, and others are content to live in the fantasy world of potential and limitless commodities. In either case, voter turnout in the land of the free is kept around 54 percent, whether through complacency, curtailment of voter lists, incarceration, or the lack of candidates who inspire hope of change. Feelings of alienation and desperation, on the one hand, and beliefs in popular myths, on the other, are so pervasive that political disenfranchisement has become the reality Karl Rove chortled about above. Terrorism as Business as Usual State-sponsored terrorism, colonization abroad and repression at home, is the establishment's primary means of extracting profits and maintaining ownership. It has been this way since slave owner and serial rapist Thomas Jefferson declared, All men are created equal, except Africans, women, and, as he wrote in the Declaration of Independence, the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Not surprisingly, Jefferson and his co-conspirators soon came to own all the Indians' land. The Founding Fathers built the nation on stolen land and the free labor of African slaves. Likewise, the prospect of free land propelled settlers from sea to shining sea, culminating in the Horatio Alger myth of the exceptional American pulling himself up by his bootstraps. The greatest covert operation ever symbolically transforms these traditional values into the myth of the great exceptional American. It does so through the telling, retelling, and selling of its cover story, the John Wayne Cowboys and Indians movie morphing into good American snipers fighting bad Muslim terrorists. The purpose of the story is not just to create and glorify American heroes. It is intended to make you afraid of not embracing the story. This is the terrorism part. As every security company knows, the fear of surveillance is as effective as surveillance itself. They have only to suggest that the burglar is waiting to break into your house to sell you an ADT system. Likewise, fear of massive Internet surveillance suppresses people from expressing their true feelings. There is no fear of Big Brother watching you unless you believe that he is watching. Once they make you afraid which, as I've explained in this book, is achieved through an endless series of CIA provocations abroad, which in turn enables an endless series of FBI, DHS, and police provocations at home, they sell you the things that make you feel safe. Suggestion and salesmanship are all it takes. Trump's wall will protect you from Mexican rapists and drug-crazed black teenagers, and Hillary's regime change wars will protect you from demons like Saddam and Gaddafi and Assad. Forget that her regime change wars created ISIS. She has proved she's capable of killing Muslims, and she will again. She'll be glad to slay the demons she creates for you. Selling the great American myth is as easy as selling the war on Iraq or candidate Clinton or Pepsi-Cola. It's the same bill of goods in every case. The promise of something better. It is capitalism. Capitalism tells us to be optimistic, to believe in a brighter future through things you can buy. The orgiastic future can be yours for no money down. It tells you to forget that Clinton sent your jobs overseas so her corporate sponsors could pay lower wages. If you vote for her, she'll bring those jobs home and you'll have more money to buy more things. Forget that your austerity is her prosperity. Vote for Hillary. The Bill of Goods I've explained the CIA's role in the process, but I want to explain why the process exists. The greatest covert operation ever is illustrated by the sweetheart scam in which the Pentagon bribed the billionaire owners of a dozen professional football teams with up to $1 million each of your federal taxpayer money to glorify their city's hometown heroes who serve in the military and wage the war on terror. You are taught to believe the war on terror is waged by people like you, for you. But the greatest covert operation ever, a.k.a. the war on terror, is a business enterprise that exploits people like you, especially if you are poor. Telling the Homeric cover story not only enables this criminal enterprise, it is indistinguishable from it. 
It is the immensely profitable icing on the cake of the world's greatest weapon of mass destruction ever. It disenfranchises workers and then channels them into an army that is all too happy to brutalize entire nations. In return, they are glorified at football games. Go team! Number one! Selling the story of the American hero is a profitable business, not just for the Pentagon and its business partners in network news. It is a boondoggle for the National Security Establishment's strategic intelligence network of corrupted Hollywood and TV production companies that shape our spectacular dreams. Advertising executives, public relations experts, spooks and generals, TV news and movie producers, and politicians read from the same script. They conduct surveys and map out demographics. Like highly indoctrinated Phoenix coordinators motivated to meet sales quotas, they target selected groups of consumers and sell them commodities that reinforce the myths they believe about themselves. Trump the billionaire sold himself as an anti-establishment agent of change to a precariat convinced by Fox News that immigrants and minorities were stealing their jobs. Clinton labeled that message, as well as its messenger and its audience, as deplorable. But her political supporters at MSNBC also skew the reality of our common predicament in order to deliver messages and commodities that its target audience of liberals want. The messages may seem different, but they are both selling a bill of goods. That's capitalism. Whether it's Tucker Carlson at Fox News or Chris Matthews at MSNBC, the person delivering the news is a salesman making a pitch. They cut to a commercial break, and you are sold a product that appeals to your demographic. While the Republican Party and Democratic Party elites keep the lower classes at each other's throats, they are sharing drinks at the country club. It's a game for them. It's fun. When they get together, like the Clintons and Trumps do occasionally at high-society charity events, they laugh at the working classes, which are locked out. The people they exploit have no alternatives. There is no third way. The Clintons and Trumps and the talking heads at Fox News and MSNBC think the Green Party exists to mow their lawns for pennies. Every minute of every day, through the national security mechanisms outlined in this book, the oligarchs that own America and through it seek to own the world symbolically transform themselves from murderous beasts into a force for good that protects us from them. They call it America. But what does that word represent? A shining city on a hill above a fruited plain? Or a segregated oligarchy with a murderous dark side? The answer is obvious. You are the victim of a massive criminal enterprise, and the key to its success is its ability to keep its crimes and corruption secret. The secret rulers have made it illegal to blow the whistle on what they are up to. There is no freedom of speech or public right to know. The billionaire owners of professional football teams and the talking heads they and their network news partners hire to shape the story and sell their merchandise are appalled when a black player like Colin Kaepernick kneels during the national anthem. They try to make the spectators feel that such behavior is disrespectful of America. They try to make the spectators feel like they should not sympathize with the endless series of black kids shot dead by a cop for selling cigarettes outside grocery stores. They reinforce their message, like a candidate running for office, by wrapping themselves and their product, a football game, with the trappings of militarism and law enforcement. It doesn't matter that the top cops have an accommodation with the bosses of organized crime, or that the CIA runs the world's illicit arms for drug business, or that the Pentagon illegally invades and destroys foreign nations so corporations can steal everything the people in those nations own. It doesn't matter that the corporate crime bosses get away with savaging your environment for profit. As Guy Debord said, the Mafia is not an outsider in this world. It is perfectly at home. Indeed, in the integrated spectacle, it stands as the model of all advanced commercial enterprises. You'll never hear a media button man like Wolf Blitzer speak honestly about Palestinians as outlawed victims of oppression in their homeland. You'll never hear him criticize Remax for selling and renting homes on stolen Palestinian land. 
Criticizing Israel, like criticizing America, is not in the script. It's a story told in a foreign language, if at all. You'll never hear Blitzer portray America's financial policies as state-sponsored terrorism designed to prevent people from making a decent living so they have no choice but to become soldiers or cops. You won't hear this because state-sponsored censorship, especially in regard to the CIA's illegal deeds, is indistinguishable from state-sponsored terrorism. Only the selective style of terrorism employed by the poor and dispossessed non-state actor is ever portrayed as terrorism. The state's systematic and extra-legal terrorism is simply regarded as business as usual, which it is. Wolf Blitzer is free to say that America has no political prisoners because the war on drugs provides profits as well as security for elites like him. Disenfranchising and imprisoning blacks is good business that helps keep wages low for all workers. It's not a problem. It's a business. Women earn less than men, and the minimum wage is kept below poverty levels, we are told, for reasons that have nothing to do with politics. And that is true. It is business as usual. The establishment and its security chiefs know what they are doing. It is worth repeating, as Johann Galtung said, that the legal criminality of the social system and its institutions, of government and of individuals at the interpersonal level, is tacit violence. Structural violence is a structure of exploitation and social injustice. Politics and business are said to be mutually exclusive, and that big lie enables the greatest covert operation ever. Business people manipulate political and social movements, including terrorists and counter-terrorists, through instruments like the CIA so they can make more money. The police keep resistant poor and black neighborhoods in lockdown. The FBI manipulates lost, insecure, and even intellectually disabled individuals into attempting acts of terrorism, which they then jump in to prevent. The CIA conducts false flag operations all over the world to enhance public fear of terrorists, even as they arm and train them in Syria, Iraq, and elsewhere to overthrow elected governments. Having been implemented covertly over decades, the War on Terror defines the contours of America's legally criminal social structure, which, in the name of protecting the people from terrorism, steals from the poor and gives to the rich. Underlying the structural violence of state-sponsored terrorism is an ever-expanding national security establishment comprised of nearly a million cadres, all of whom profit from the structural violence they maintain. At the lower tier, cops and soldiers get to be heroes. The oligarchs get to laugh. In the middle, at Homeland Security, they get jobs. Emanating from the super-secret CIA, which informs every other government bureaucracy, this criminal enterprise corrupts every social and political movement in America, forming consumers of myths and commodities into a moat of true believers that surrounds the establishment elite that oppresses them. It's a perfect system, stabilized by manufactured crises du jour and ineluctably heading in a predictable direction. In the next national emergency, the next financial meltdown or environmental catastrophe, cadres will be mobilized, shout slogans, and appeal to our traditional values or diversity. Their managers will review reports about the suspicious activities of terrorist surrogates. The definition of a terrorist will be expanded to include people deemed dangerous to the public order, at which point the non-believers will be arrested on criminal charges for political offenses like protesting climate change. It's not hard to imagine a few of the most highly motivated cadres grabbing ropes and forming lynch mobs and going after those who refused to stand for the national anthem. Only 5% of the people need to be organized in this fashion to install a fascist dictator in the United States. That is the ultimate objective of the greatest covert operation ever, the one in which the oligarchs steal everything you own. The 5% who resist will be subject to compromise and discredit operations, like the letter the FBI sent to Martin Luther King, Jr., encouraging him to commit suicide. Forged documents, like the ones the Bush regime used to justify the illegal invasion of Iraq, will become indistinguishable from real ones. 
Did the Russians hack the DNC? Or was it a disgruntled DNC cadre? You'll never know. False rumors will proliferate and ruin the reputation of anyone who refuses to comply. People will become more terrified than ever. They will grab their precious guns and start shooting. Midnight arrests and disappearances into administrative detention centers will become commonplace. Amid the confusion, the CIA will activate assassination units within the front organizations it has placed around the country and plant plastic explosives in school buses, not as training exercises, but as provocations to call in the militarized police. Property values will plummet, blood will run in the streets, and 10,000 Trumps and Clintons, safely ensconced in their pre-secure Israeli-style Bantustans, will buy everything on the cheap. This is the Phoenix future, the ultimate goal of the greatest covert operation ever. This concludes the reading of The CIA as Organized Crime, How Illegal Operations Corrupt America and the World. Copyright 2017 by Douglas Valentine. This book was read by Stefan Rudnicki. This unabridged audiobook was recorded by arrangement with the licensor Clarity Press, Inc., and was produced in 2017 by Blackstone Audio, Inc. and Skyboat Media, Inc., which hold the copyright. Neither this recording nor any portion of it may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authorization from Blackstone Audio, Inc. If you would like to obtain a monthly update telling you about new releases, call 1-800-SAY-BOOK. That's 1-800-729-2665. For a complete listing of our titles, visit our website at www.downpour.com. Thank you.